Okay, now we're gonna start covering uh, the Kairos dungeon. Uh, you can access it from the very top uh, left menu, uh, and it's in the very right corner. Basically, Kairos dungeon consists of uh, seven, well, seven of these uh, fields, but I will group six of these uh, together because they're very similar in terms of strategy as well as uh, just overall what they provide. And I'll leave Secret Dungeon for last because it's a little bit more complicated and I'll have to explain it in a more detail. So for uh, Kairos Dungeon, uh, the six of these dungeons, so Hall of Magic and then Hall of each element, uh, their main goal is to provide you with essences and essences are used for awakening your units. So if I go to the awaken screen, go to any unit that hasn't been fully awakened, as you can see, uh, you do need uh, essence of magic in most cases. Uh, you do need essence of uh, whichever element monster you're using in pretty much all cases as well. And some breath of life. And the further you go, the more essences you need for it. So keep that in mind that and this is of course a nat 4. A nat 5 will need even more pieces. So uh, you will need to find these a lot in the beginning. Uh, but later on... Uh, it will fall off a bit and personally as you can see i have like uh, almost 10,000 of the magic essence and uh, several thousand of different ones so at first it will be a bit difficult but later on uh, the essences will pile up however since you do get three entries i do recommend going into the dungeon every day still so uh, now I'm gonna cover uh, these dungeons one by one. Of course, as always, I'm gonna only be taking the uh, highest level and for this its highest level is 10. For Hall of Magic, uh, the strategy is pretty simple. Uh, the boss uh, specializes in two debuffs, so he will constantly apply attack down and defense down. This means uh, that uh, you can either just uh, go in with a strong team and try to beat it uh, through all of those debuffs or if you are struggling uh, you can go for, for in a different round and try to cleanse those debuffs uh, this will of course matter especially if you are on a weaker side and cannot one shot a dungeon so the regular team i use here is really not that good but just because i overpower the dungeon that much it really doesn't matter uh, personally i used uh, similar teams to this i believe so uh, Helia to set up a defense break on the boss. Uh, Naomi is there for the uh, nuking the boss. So I'll quickly run her up and show you how it works uh, for my team. And Bastet is there to just uh, buff up uh, the team for attack buff. So we'll quickly change into a run. Uh, you'll see what's uh, the run all about. It's pretty simple. I'll probably be in like 20 seconds or something. And yeah as long as uh, Helia uses the correct skill, yeah. So, as you can see, uh, he will start shooting several different attacks. So, for wow, okay. Um, maybe I should go in with a weaker team because he didn't even shoot a single attack. You know what? Yeah, I'll go uh, with... <laughs> but yeah, as you can see, when you're a bit progressed into the game, uh, the dungeon really isn't that difficult. I'll quickly go into the dungeon uh, with a weak team, so something like this, and I'll bring a healer, for example. That should allow me some time to explain at least. Uh, so yeah, if you are looking to counter this dungeon early on, uh, you may need either immunity, so prevent the debuffs from being uh, stacked on you, or you may need to go for a different route, like a... Uh, what is called a cleanser so for example Lolo is a decent cleanser yeah so as you can see he will shoot several different attacks uh, those attacks will either do knockback attack by or defense break uh, they don't really do a lot of damage especially if you have some defense buff this main attack will keep shooting attack breaks and after this attack he will launch the sword of an ultimate ability I'll actually stop attacking just to show it yeah, this ability, this one does a lot of damage, so if you're not prepared to uh, survive it, do make sure to uh, dodge it through uh, the little leftover spaces uh, next to them. But if you can survive it, and you should be able to survive it as long as you don't have that many debuffs and uh, you have a attack buff, 
oh, not attack buff, a defense buff. Uh, this attack won't be that deadly, and you should be able to beat, uh, beat these dungeons pretty easily. So, the main thing to remember for this dungeon are uh, cleansing the defense break. The attack break is whatever, because attack break doesn't uh, lower your sustainability. Uh, I think the defense break is the main uh, debuff that you have to cleanse for this dungeon. Once that is cleansed, even if you take a little bit longer, you will be able to beat this dungeon pretty easily. So yeah, and another route is going full nuke and even early on, I think you will have uh, the ability to build a full nuke team, which could uh, technically just completely destroy this dungeon, even without them using that many abilities for them. Okay, now the Hall of Fire, I think uh, this one will be probably the easiest one to explain because it's really straightforward. The boss has one single uh, sort of win condition and that's placing a bomb. So uh, naturally, uh, when you attack the boss, he will sometimes put up a bomb on some of your units and that bomb is always deadly, so keep that in mind. You shouldn't try to survive because I think it does like several thousand damage and or rather several hundreds of thousand damage basically it's been designed to uh, insta kill any unit that places the bomb on and uh, the way to counter it is either of course by nuking it really fast before the bomb can either be placed or explode or uh, the other option is to just cleanse the bomb or have immunity to prevent the bomb and uh, since this is the bomb is only a single debuff uh, you will have an extremely easy time cleansing it if it does uh, get put on you uh, and some units that can cleanse so uh, there is a special unit that specializes in bomb removal however it's a net 5 so you most likely not be building her at first uh, you can find any uh, unit that removes general debuffs so even stuff like Lulu as mentioned earlier uh, is an amazing unit for it uh, there is the water epicium priest who can cleanse the debuff uh, for other easier to obtain options, uh, Annabelle if you have picked her in the selective summon, uh, however if you have not, don't stress it because there are other options that are way cheaper. So you just find a unit that uh, has a, uh, what's it called, a cleanse of a benef not beneficial, a harmful effect and simply bring to it. Or uh, you can go with a full damage team and uh, do it that way. For this, I'll once again bring a Lulu just to show you the uh, cleansing of the bomb. And instead of nuking it at first, I'll try to show you the abilities that he does. The bomb that is placed will last around 10 to 15 seconds if I'm not wrong. So yeah, I'm gonna save up the skills. Uh, some of the skills as you will see, like the knockback one that just happened, uh, will be the same. Uh, there you see, there is a bomb on me and there is a little counter uh, counting the bomb duration. So it's placed on both Lolo and me, and if this boss uh, uses the attack uh, that covers like the whole field, uh, that bomb will be detonated. But as you can see, if I use Lolo, I simply cleanse the bomb, and yeah, it's pretty simple. The bomb actually, I overestimated the bomb damage. Uh, I may have mixed up with a different game where the bomb is always deadly, right? Because here it seems like he did only 50% of my HP or something. So yeah, even easier than I expected. And you can actually survive it, it looks like. And yeah, the dungeon is pretty easy. Uh, you get fire essences and some gold. Just like with any other essence dungeon. And we'll jump into the next one. Okay, and the Hall of Water. I personally think that this one is probably the hardest uh, essence dungeon of all the... Uh, six regular dungeons, so all of the elements and the magic one. This is because uh, you either need to go very safe into it uh, without doing that much damage, or uh, the damage you do has to be uh, built uh, very perfectly. And this means that the damage dealers that you use will have to have uh, as high crit rate as possible because the Hall of Water a boss uh, it has a passive where if uh, if he receives a non-critical attack, he will reflect a portion of that damage and if you do uh, attack with a lot of um, non-critical attacks on the boss, uh, 
their damage dealers will die pretty fast especially if they do a lot of damage and have pretty low hp so this is sort of a counter um, to a lot of even stronger people's teams because the more damage you do the more damage you will be reflected and that means you will die a bit faster so one way to do it is to bring a lot of healing and a lot of consistent healing or you can even bring the shields uh, another thing is to bring a unit that has very high crit rates so for example my cat uh, currently has 96 percent crit rate, so he's also attacking uh the water boss so he will get a 10 percent crit boost just because of the element so the cat will not receive uh, any uh, what's it called reflect damage and should be able to breed pretty easily but i'll go with the safe team just to showcase uh, on how it works and yeah basic strategy either go for the healers or go for full crit build uh, in the beginning you will probably have an easier time going with a lot of healers and i know i did it as well but for example my summoner as you can see uh, he has very low crit rate so he will get uh, some damage reflected to him but since i have uh, a lot of shields a lot of healing uh, that will not be deadly but my cat as you can see it's not taking any damage uh, yeah my summoner he's built very tanky uh, and he's still taking like half of his hp for some attacks which is a bit scary if you're using a summoner that's more specialized in damage like orbia so if you do not have a perfect orbia with 100% crit rate you might actually end up uh, going very low very fast so be careful for that luckily for Kino and Cleave uh, that will usually not be a problem but for Orbia users uh, you could face some danger in the Hall of Water so make sure to bring some safety or make sure that you bring either a max crit rate uh, team or even uh, go for an option like a crit rate uh, buff which you can find from several units I would say well, my choice of crit rate uh, buff is the Dark 4 star unit Crowa, but uh, he is pretty rare, so you may not have him. As you can see, you can find all units that give crit rate up. Some of them will get uh, crit only themselves, so keep that in mind. I think the water, uh, uh, water uh, what's it called, Werewolf gives decent crit rate as well as healing, so he's a decent option. Uh, apart from that, uh, yeah, this is the one I use, uh, he gives level 2 crit rate to your whole team, but uh, I think just for the whole of water, since you'll not be farming it that much in the future, uh, you shouldn't really try to focus too much on the team specifically for it, just go for a safer option and use whatever works at that time, and later on you will naturally just get units that uh, sort of work for it okay the hall of wind uh, this is another one uh, of the dungeons that are very annoying and that you will not be able to beat unless you bring a specific counter to it so just like the hall of water uh, this one will require some uh, managing before you can actually attempt it and the main culprit of a uh, hall of what or rather hall of wind being hard is the fact that the boss uh, does apply invincibility to himself throughout the battle and that invincibility uh, will not be uh, removed by your units uh, basically by just attacking so you do need to bring a specific unit that can either remove invincibility or remove a beneficial effect in general uh, luckily uh, those are pretty easily available and you can actually find that it, there is a unit that removes invincibility and you actually get that unit completely for free so uh the water uh, gore can uh remove invincibility but you can also just go for any uh, unit that removes a beneficial effect and that will be more than enough so stuff like uh endogami so the wind and water endogami uh, i think what other unit i would recommend going for three stars because some four stars are just a little bit too expensive to build unless you already built them and yeah, I'm not even gonna cover 5 stars because you're not gonna build a specific 5 star for just one dungeon. Uh, the other way to beat it is actually the way I prefer to beat it and it's actually an even easier to acquire uh, when you are free to play in my opinion. And that's using a unit uh, Karambit. So this guy has a specific uh, passive on all his abilities and that is that he ignores the target mitigation effects 
This means that uh, his attacks, all of his attacks, go uh, through all of the shields, through all of the invincibilities, through all of the defense buffs, stuff like that. So even if the boss has invincibility permanently up, he will still do damage. Of course, your other units will not be doing damage, but his damage alone will allow you to beat the dungeon in just a few seconds. Uh, you can get him from the monster story if you go to the fourth page and you complete the story. At the very last mission, you will receive the full monster, and once awakened, uh, he will be a very good option for it. So I will showcase it with that, because that's my preferred way to do it, and I feel like it's the most easiest way uh, early on. So, as usual, I'll just change the damage dealer, I'll bring a regular buffer, bring a healer. Uh, those are not needed, I really don't need a healer in this team. Actually, I'll just take him out, why not? Uh, and yeah, I'll do a showcase run real quick. You will see that uh, the invincibility will be applied in like 5 seconds from the start of the battle. Or rather when I start attacking him. And uh, that will not be the move, but uh, current bit will still be doing damage and invincibility is coming real soon. There we go. And as you can see, uh, my units are not doing damage and I can even walk around and see that I am not the one doing damage, but current bit, he simply slices through all of that invincibility and can do more than enough damage uh, to the boss. And yeah, real quickly, pretty much uh, that's the way I counter it. Uh, it will be a little bit slower because it's only one damage dealer doing uh, all of the damage. But what you can do is uh, do a little bit setup for him. So for example, give him a lot of attack buff, give him a defense break or damage take him up. On the boss, uh, you can give him a uh, attack speed buff so he can attack even faster and clear the dungeon that way. Uh, there are many ways to buff him up, but I feel like using Karambit for this dungeon is probably the easiest way uh, to do it by far and without overthinking it too much. Okay, and the Hall of Fly. This is probably one of the easiest dungeons in the essence of uh, the Kairos uh, dungeon. So. The strategy behind this is that the boss, while he does not have that many debuffs he can apply, other than the occasional knockback from his first skill, uh, he can destroy your HP permanently. This means that uh, when he attacks your unit, uh, if he does damage to your HP rather than to a shield, uh, he, your HP will be permanently destroyed by a bit. And what destroyed HP is, is basically... Uh, the boss will take away like 5% uh, of your maximum HP. This means that uh, if you can see that uh, in this case scenario, Mike Lee, for example, has his full HP bar. This means he has 100% HP. Uh, what destroy HP does, it just takes a little bit of a chunk from his total HP. Meaning that if he took away 5%, uh, the maximum HP I could be at, it would be 95% now. And of course, don't worry, that will happen only in that specific run. And once you exit the run, uh, you will be back to 100%. But for that specific run, uh, your HP will drop uh, permanently. And that destroyed HP cannot be recovered in any way from the boss. So uh, be careful of that. But uh, after doing some testing, I went in with the summoner alone. I've waited for two minutes. I've tried to soak all of his attacks and... My HP was destroyed by like 60 to 70 percent and it still didn't do uh, an attack that insta killed me so uh, safe to say you have like up to two minutes easily to beat this dungeon and two minutes is way more than enough time to beat any dungeon at any level so yeah just to showcase I'll go without any shields this time because uh, shields will prevent you from getting your HP destroyed because uh, hitting a shield does not count as hitting uh, the raw HP bar, and if the boss does not hit the raw HP bar, your HP will not be destroyed. Uh, for this case, I'll go into uh, without a shield, but the basic uh, way to counter it is to just bring an ability that can either uh, give shields or give invincibility. So, uh, for example, Chloe can give invincibility with her third skill. Invincibility, of course, means that uh, the boss cannot do any damage at all, not even uh, try to break through the shield. But yeah, don't overthink the Hall of Light too much. Uh, trust me when I say this, uh, that I never ever had any trouble with it, even when I first started the game. And 
Uh, I didn't even really notice the destroyed HP taking any effect on me, so yeah. As you can see, my column did, and uh, my cliff lost like, uh, I would say, somewhat in the 5% bar. Now he's around 10%. Combit is losing more HP because he is squishier than my uh, cliff, so he will lose a bit more HP. But as you can see, that HP destruction is really not that important because the boss simply doesn't do much damage apart from the destroyed HP. And yeah, as you can see, my combit is already down by like 60% of his max HP. Well, this deadly attack will kill him because uh, oh, he actually yeah, he did kill his team. But yeah, even then, as you can see, the part that uh, causes the destroyed HP really doesn't matter too much. Uh, what killed him was the strong attack that all of the uh, Hall of... Uh, not, not Hall of Fire, yeah, Hall of Essences, I guess, do. And it's not exclusive to the Light One. And as you can see, uh, I beat the Light One with just a single unit. And it only took uh, almost a minute to do so. Okay, and a uh, Hall of Dark, just like the Hall of Light, uh, this dungeon is extremely easy and one of the easier ones in the Kairos dungeon overall. Uh, the main uh, strategy behind this dungeon is the boss applies uh, a damage over time called Bleed, so if you are early on, uh, you can try to counter it with a, either a cleanser of general debuffs or a cleanser that specializes in cleansing uh, damage over time or damage... Uh, caused by bleed so you can find it in the other effect tab and if you just search up uh, the more powerful effect this will show you the general uh, cleansers that you have so for example uh, the water how will be a good option for this dungeon uh, what else uh, a water epicion priest if you do have her uh, anavel if you summon her in the selective summon and a bunch of other units really are uh, Another option is to go for a uh, cleanser that specializes in the moving uh, damage over time. So one easily obtainable option is the Light Howl. Uh, you can get him from Secret Dungeons, which I will cover right after Hall of Dark. Uh, other options include uh, stuff like the Fireheart, who can cleanse uh, a debuff sometimes. He will not have a weak lens, but he can still do it. Of course, all of the general cleansers are listed because they can remove damage over time as well. So yeah, uh, third option, uh, you can go for a unit that removes specifically bleed, but uh, even those are very scarce. I think the Daha will be one of those that only the most bleed, but yeah, you will just have a easier time with going with a general cleanser or honestly just straight up sustaining through all of that uh, bleed nonsense uh, it will definitely not be difficult to beat and i will go without a healer i'll just show you what happens when you go with an attack buffer and a damage dealer and you will see that the dungeon really isn't that difficult i don't have any defense break on me uh, so i will not be able to do that much damage and the damage will pretty much be just current bit uh slicing through with his uh basic attacks and you will see that the bleed the boss does really will not impact the run that much. So my cleave has a level 1 bleed right now, but that bleed is not doing any damage because I have a shield on and uh, damage over time will absorb uh, all of the shield damage as well. So as you can see, I got applied level 3 bleed, but with a shield, with my Bastet's shield at least, uh, since it's pretty strong, that bleed will take like... Probably six to seven seconds to even go through the shield, and by the time he got even close to breaking the shield, uh, the dungeon was already over. And yeah, don't overstress it. Uh, try to go with damage. If you see that you're lacking damage, uh, go for a regular cleanser like Lulu or Shushu, a Water Epic and Priest, and stuff like that, and you will have a really easy time with this dungeon. Okay, and a quick introduction to how secret dungeons work. So uh, currently, these are the six monsters that are available for you. Uh, they might change in the future. However, the same rotation has been going for two months right now or something like that. So I'm not sure how often they plan on changing it. Uh, not all of these units are good, but uh, they do have some decent use in a lot of dungeons for some of them. So for example, the uh, Light Howl is an amazing healer for some of these dungeons, especially in PvE. I even saw some 
uh, people use her in PvP and having some success, so keep that in mind. Uh, Light Amazon is a good damage uh, for uh, solo dungeons, however, you do get her for free, so uh, this will basically be just additional skill ups and book entries for her. Uh, as for the Dark Ones, uh, I would say the Dark Howl is by far the best option from these, and she is very similar to Karambit in a way that she, her attacks also ignore all beneficial effects, meaning that uh, she will deal raw damage regardless if the enemy has uh, stuff like shield, defense buffs, uh, or what else is there, uh, invincibility, stuff like that, uh, she will do damage all through those, and even if the enemy is running heavy buff team, uh, you will be able to do damage to it. As for the other two, I know the Lizardman is completely useless. Uh, the Dark Penguin does have a defense break that can hit all enemies on the field, so he could have some use, but uh, I personally haven't used him and I didn't find any use for him yet, so yeah. I'm not gonna jump too much into uh, what each unit is useful for. I already made a video on that, so you can look back on it if you feel like. And yeah, uh, so for how the circuit dungeon works, uh, there are two ways to enter them. So first of all, uh, you can open the secret dungeon yourself and you can see the open uh, button in the bottom uh, right corner. I am not gonna open it myself because I already have farmed enough of these 6 units that I can summon them and skill them up quite a bit. But basically, once you click the open button, you will receive a random dungeon from these 6 and it will appear in the uh, menu that you open right here. So, say I opened a Dark Owl dungeon, uh, if I click on the Dark Owl, uh, you will see the number will be uh, changed to 1. Uh, meaning that you have a dungeon open and the dungeon will last for 24 hours and by entering here uh, you will see that uh, it will be shown as you have a dungeon and you can enter it when you end uh, you know what uh, just for showcase purposes right why not why not let's do it uh, so yeah uh, light the hull right uh, this shows my secret dungeon it will last for 24 hours and what I can do is Enter the dungeon, uh, you will be probably placed into the, uh, uh, what's it called, pre-party menu I suppose, uh, pre-party lobby. Uh, there are several options to do the secret dungeon, so first of all you can go solo, but for some dungeons, especially the light how it will be a little harder to beat. So uh, several options include inviting people that you uh, want personally. So either from your friends list, guild list, or the recent summaries that you play with. Another option is to go for open recruiting. So the crew chat will uh, post a message in the uh, system right here. So it will be visible to every single player on the server and anyone uh, will be able to join by just simply clicking on the dungeon here. Another option is to go for a guild chat uh, recruitment and this will only post a uh, what's it called, a request in the guild chat, I'm not gonna show my guild chat right now, just to protect their uh, chat privacy I suppose, I don't wanna dox whatever they are talking about, uh, but yeah, uh, keep in mind that if you do post in the guild chat, uh, people from the public lobby can still join, it will not be shown in the system, but once uh, you shared it in the guild, they will be able to enter the secret dungeon menu, and if they click on the hull, they will see your dungeon, so even if you, uh, share the message through the guild uh, a lot of cases uh, people from the public will fill your lobby so uh, if you're really intending to uh, raid with specific guildies i would recommend just using the fla uh, flat out the invite option instead of opening it but for now uh, i'm gonna do i'm gonna share it with the guild chat I'm gonna, uh, nah, I'm not gonna write anything, but you can write a message that you want as well as set a level for the summoner that you want uh, to only allow. So this could be a decent way to make sure that the users are joining you are uh, pretty strong and will actually contribute to the raid quite a bit. So for example, I'll set my level to like 55 so that not too many weak people join because this dungeon is considerably uh, harder than the rest of them. I'll pop my regular uh, secret dungeon team in so let's set it to that uh, now we just wait for people uh, looks like two of my guild is already joined and we can go in 
And uh, I will showcase uh, the dungeon run uh, later on while I do the friend option. I won't bother you with it right now. But yeah, we'll quickly uh, finish up the dungeon and I'll be talking about uh, defeated dungeons uh, in a second as well. Okay, and we beat the dungeon, as, as you can see, uh, the two uh, guildies that helped me, they received 120 breath of life, as well as one uh, light health piece, however, it's not shown here, because friend devotes only show one uh, devote at a time, and for me, because I cleared all four floors, uh, I got 10 uh, pieces of the light howl, and you need 20 to summon a unit, so to get a full unit, you will need to open two dungeons in total. And basically, uh, quickly going over how secret dungeons were, can be obtained. So, first of all, as for friendship uh, support, you can do it 10 times a week. And I will cover it uh, in a second, I think. Uh, but yeah, you can do it 10 times a week. At uh, the first 5, you get Breath of Lives and Monster Pieces. Uh, for the other 5, you get only Breath of Lives. So, uh, make sure to do those 10 uh, weekly. And you can do them by simply just checking each screen uh, every like a minute or so and as you can see there is another uh, dungeon that I can enter it would be around 5 so I would get 120 breath of lives and uh, a light amazon piece and for the next 5 supports it would only be breath of lives so make sure to do those because breath of lives are a bit annoying to get and now uh, quickly gonna go over how you can obtain the secret dungeon energy which I just used to open the dungeon so you need 100 to open it and there are currently two ways to obtain the secret energy. Uh, so first of all, it's in the Trial of Ascension shop. And you can buy uh, one energy for 500 tokens. And uh, this is an insanely bad exchange range. And you should never do it ever under any circumstance. Even if you have a gun pointed at your head. Because uh, that exchange rate is so horrible. I don't even know why it exists in the game. 
Uh, the second option is through the DP request. So you will need to use some uh, heal orders. And I know that it's a bit annoying, especially if you want to open a secret dungeon every day, you will burn like 20 to 22 or something tickets every day on it. Uh, but yeah, uh, starting with Florence Continent, I, I think it's not available here, yep. So uh, you can get 4 uh, secret energy pieces from the Florence Continent and 5 uh, from the Rokorama Continent. And uh, these only cost a uh, 1, uh, what they're called, Rakhil Order to enter. Are they the heal order? Yep. So uh, you will need around 20 to like 22 Rahil orders to get 100 energy because it doesn't always drop 5 from here. Sometimes it drops 4 and on average I've seen like I use like 22, maybe sometimes 23 Rahil orders to get uh, 100 secret energy. And once you do this, uh, you will have over 100 energy and you can head to Kairos dungeon and uh, simply open a dungeon you cannot open a dungeon faster than uh, the first one expires so you after opening one you will need to wait 24 hours before you can open another one and you will see your total energy right there at the top so yeah uh, i don't recommend overdoing the secret dungeons uh, try to get uh, enough uh, monster pieces to unlock every single unit but don't go too hard on the skill ups because i feel like uh you're better off using those Rahil orders on uh, saving up on Path of Toad or Essence Dungeon tickets for events. Uh, because those units, while they are, some of them are good, uh, they will definitely not be so useful that uh, it would be worth sacrificing over other units. So for example, uh, my Dark Oracle, she's at level 11 Awakening. I still prefer using Karambit over her, but she is a good replacement for him. She will deal less damage, but uh, even then she is a very solid option. I'd say Light Howl is by far the best, uh, the best unit from the Secret Dungeon so far, and I he went as far as fully maxing him out. Uh, so yeah, don't overdo him, but make sure to do Secret Dungeons, especially if you do not own all of the monsters yet. Once you do own them, uh, it will be up to you to decide whether it's worth uh, pursuing further skill ups and further book effects for them. And yeah, I think that's about it for the secret dungeons and we'll jump into the next thing. Now jumping into the path of growth, uh, you can access it right here on the left side of the screen. And this is one of the two main dungeons uh, together with Kairos where you will be getting various different materials for uh, mostly transcendence, uh, runes, uh, stuff like crafting materials, uh, starter equipment before you can obtain it from raids or if you just need to uh, get a specific equipment uh, because well, the max level of that equipment won't be too high. So yeah, uh, Path of Growth is very versatile in what you can do and once you enter it you will actually notice three different areas. Uh, usually the main one you do is the middle one, Path of Adventure, however it is by far the hardest one of the three. So uh, I'll quickly uh, cover the Path of Training and Subjugation first, and uh, for Path of Adventure we'll actually dive deeper into each dungeon and strategies behind each dungeon. So starting with Path of Training, uh, it consists, consists of three dungeons and uh, they have 15 levels each. Uh, the, sh the entries you find here are shared across a uh, path of growth, so if you enter, for example, the dungeon two times here, uh, you will end up uh, losing two entries and can only enter another dungeon for path of growth, for example, four times. And the same thing with refreshes, uh, once we refresh the entries, they will be shared across uh, all three of these, uh, what do you call them, maps, I suppose, or areas. And uh, yeah, so they refresh daily, you get six daily, and you can do four refreshes for crystals at a cost of 50, 100, and then two for 200, and they will refresh only three entries, not six, so keep that in mind. And you can refresh additional entries uh, using these uh, path of growth tickets, but as already mentioned, or I uh, will mention in the future, uh, I think at all uh, mentioned in the either the backpack review or the everything to do with events uh, you should not be using your path of growth and essence dungeon tickets unless there is an event specifically for it because you can get a lot of rewards using them so i would uh 
consider saving most of them uh, you can of course you can use them in edge cases if you really need the material but uh, usually it's best to save your tickets until an event comes on so for path of training uh, there are three different dungeons they don't vary that much and they are really really easy actually uh, when you see level 50 uh, power requirements of 300 do not be scared because uh, I think I started autoing them and I was like 220,000 power so I even not only did I not have a bonus uh, I also had a penalty for it so if you, you can see if you have like somewhere around 230 uh, you will get a penalty of 25% more damage taken and 25% uh, less damage dealt so even then uh, I was pretty easily able to uh, clear it because they don't really have dangerous skills they are really just big blobs as as satirical as that sounds they are really literally just big blobs uh, they might be a little tanky if you're going without a bonus but they really won't be able to kill you that easily especially if you have some sort of protection uh, like a Bastet shield or just a, a little bit of healing or debuffs. So yeah, uh, as for the con, oh, not the content, uh, the drops that you get from them. Uh, I will only be covering level 15 for these. So both Path of Training and Subjugation because those are really easy to get into. And I don't think they are really worth doing unless you can do the max level. Uh, so for level 15, uh, you will be getting uh, the normal XP potions and premium XP potions. Uh, you also have a chance to get unknown scrolls. However, keep in mind that these are not the fixed amounts and you may get in most cases a bit lower. Uh, also, you can get monster pieces uh, for it. Uh, these are not full monsters. You will only get uh, like one to three, maybe four monster pieces. Also, uh, don't get baited by the nap 5 because uh, I heard the nap 5 uh, piece drop rate from these dungeons are extremely low and as you can see, uh, the wind one is actually uh, where one of the most important units that I've talked about uh, is. So the wind armor is pretty much like the top damage dealer in the game and he is available here. So a lot of people do try to farm it. However, keep in mind that a bit like probably two to three hundred uh, of these runs and spoiler alert i haven't received a single vampire piece so definitely do not get baited by the uh net five drop rate of this uh the net three uh, pieces will drop quite frequently i think i get uh like three pieces every few runs but for the net fives uh if you are going for the net five solely uh do not do this dungeon because you will be extremely disappointed I'm not sure about the nap 4 day, but uh, you will get plenty of nap 4s as time goes on. And also from this dungeon you are able to get 5 and 4 star rainbow mons. Uh, these little crafting materials, uh, a decent chunk of gold actually, you will usually get like 12, 20 to 30k gold from this dungeon. So it's a good dungeon to do uh, during events where you get boosted gold drops. And uh, the most important probably the world from this dungeon is the energy of transcendence piece. Uh, you can get the red ones from uh, all three colors, all three elements basically. And uh, these ones will be probably the second hardest uh, to obtain I feel like. Or maybe even the hardest. Decide. It sort of uh, depends on what you're farming early on. Uh, so yeah, these uh, transcendence pieces will be needed for summoner transcendence that will be covered in the summon all about summoner uh, portion of the video. Uh, but for that, uh, that's pretty much about it. I will enter into one fight with them just to showcase on how it works. I will, well actually I don't think I will need to even speed it up because it will definitely not be that difficult show you that the dungeon isn't difficult at all i will actually go in and uh, show you a run without uh, getting the uh, power bonus so i'm at the slightly harder where no changes are made to the difficulty of the uh, dungeon and i'm only using my summoner as well as a uh, one at five that is completely free from the monster story and i will do an example run without any uh talking about it and right after I'll talk a bit about other dungeons as well as the drops from them.
So yeah, there we go. Uh, definitely nothing too difficult. You even have two extra units to bring more than I brought. And if you do manage to get the bonus, uh, that will be even better. It looks like we did get uh, three Lizardman pieces, which is amazing. And uh, we did get a lot of gold as well as a lot of XP potions, but that's uh, because I do have the summoner pass and it does double the rewards of the first six uh, path of gold runs. So the real rewards would be uh, two times lower. That means around 20.5k gold and probably one or two pieces as well as only 25 potions. So as far as path of training goes, that's about it. And we'll jump into subjugation next. Okay, now let's quickly look over uh, another part of Path of Growth and, and it's the last uh, area that you can see here and it's the Subjugation. Uh, this one consists of five uh, different dungeons, uh, one for each element, so you can see Water, Fire, Wind, a Light and Dark one. Uh, they have different drops and uh, the most important thing here are uh, these uh, little crafting items that drop uh, from each boss. So this uh, the Ruins Ruler, for example, drop the Scroll Ruler's Dib. Uh, the uh, Maze Designer will drop uh, these Maze Designer's Belts. Uh, the reason you do a uh, Subjugation will mostly be for these. However, the gear you get can also help you out a little bit in the early game. So, uh, the, the maximum gear you can get is uh, of Hero tier. So, this is one tier below Legendary or one tier below the best... Uh, tier that you can get and it will drop five star uh zero awakening uh, weapons uh armor shields accessories stuff like that well not armor rather shield if you're a different class it will not be a shield it will be a different it will act as a shield but it will just have a different animation and texture of it i think for orbia it's like a little trinklet and for Akina, it's another item, but they're basically the same for all classes and they function the same. Uh, the drop you get is completely random and you are guaranteed to drop at least one uh, summoner item from each run. Uh, the chance to drop uh, the other items is of course random. The only thing you're guaranteed is a weapon, uh, some gold and some subjugation tokens. And these three items are completely RNG, but... Uh, for uh, harmony pieces, they do drop quite often, I would say. On average, it's a little bit less uh, for uh, one drop per one run. This does not mean that it will drop one every run. It means that it might not drop uh, a piece for two runs, then drop like three pieces in a single run. Then you might get like one, two, or maybe zero even if you're really unlucky for five runs. But on average, I've calculated that the drop rate is around a little bit below one drop per run. And uh, apart from getting the summoner gear, uh, I'd say this is the main source of decent gear for early game. But as soon as you can get into uh, the Elite Foggy Prison uh, raid, uh, this gear will no longer be relevant. So as soon as you are able to do this raid consistently, uh, that gear will sort of slowly phase out, so you can uh, build a full set with it. But keep in mind that uh, it will not last long, so don't go too hard on powering all of it up. And uh, the second thing about uh, this subjugation dungeon are these subjugation tokens. Uh, tokens uh, are used to buy a specific uh, item. Basically, they do... Uh, give you ability to purchase the same items however uh, you can purchase a specific a grade of items so you can go three four or five star weapons you can even go as far as uh, purchasing a weapon with a little bit stronger stats this means it will have a one level awakening to the star so the maximum you can get is five stars plus one awakened star uh, even then, uh, this weapon is not that strong compared to the stuff you get from Elite Raids, so also don't overspend it. Uh, instead, I would say that once you have a decent set, uh, save all of these uh, Subjugation tokens, because uh, these Subjugation weapons uh, will commonly be used for upgrading your blacksmithing skills, and you will need a lot of them. Uh, they will be used to craft various uh, weapons that are needed for uh, blacksmith promotion and 
I would say on top of the weapons that I already have, I spent like 15,000 uh, subjugation tokens on just buying the weapons that I needed uh, for crafting. So instead of crafting the weapons, uh, you are able to just trade up buy the weapon you need. So uh, for example, I may need a grassland dublant or like a five star weapon or a four star weapon for crafting. It depends on the exact recipe you're looking for. Uh, you can also uh, craft weapons for each of the regions so make sure that uh, the weapon you need for the crafting is of the correct region you can identify them by the name so it will say that uh, you need to craft an ice crystal upgraded weapon or a forest dawn upgraded weapon so i'll pick based on that and i think uh, awakened uh like weapons with awakened stars will not work for crafting so make sure to pick uh, the exact weapon that uh, you see is required and yeah, uh, you can also buy some yarn balls using these tokens, but uh, the price is very high compared to the other ways you can acquire them. So I wouldn't recommend spending on this and instead saving them up. And yeah, uh, in the end, uh, these dungeons are pretty easy. They have very low power limits. As you can see, max level is only 193,000 power. I would say as a dungeon, they are a tiny bit harder than the path of training, but in terms of mechanics at least. Uh, but even then, you shouldn't have too much trouble dealing with them. I know this one caught me a bit of guard because I believe he steals your buffs. So be careful of that one every time. And just to showcase, I'll also enter a battle with one of them. Uh, just like before, I'll use uh, only one unit just for the showcase. Of course, since this is an extremely easy dungeon, I do hit the power limit even with one unit. But okay, and here is a run uh the previous one crashed my app so there is another run for you basically it's pretty similar you just sort of nuke the boss uh it's a bit annoying because i think this one might still yeah as you can see he stole my defense buff and my shield but even then it's not too difficult and especially because uh the current bit or the fire unit that's helping me he has the ability to actually go through those all of those buffs and just deal raw damage ignoring all of the buffs so it makes it even easier and yeah definitely you shouldn't be able uh, you shouldn't uh, have any trouble uh dealing with the dungeon as i can see because i have the summoner pass i do get uh double the rewards so my gold was doubled my subjugation doubles uh, i got two items and i actually got two summoner uh, equipment most of the time you will get a uh, blue tier equipment but uh, there is a chance to get a uh, hero tiers or the purple tier equipment as well however for, uh, i wouldn't recommend relying on just the runs for uh, getting crafting materials you will probably have an easier time just saving up tokens and buying the correct ones that are needed and yeah uh, that's about it for subjugation and now we'll jump into uh the hardest part of path of growth so it's the path of uh adventure okay and now the big thing the path of adventure uh this is probably the area where you will be spending most of your time as far as path of growth goes uh and this is uh the main place to acquire runes uh before other methods uh however those methods are quite hard compared to the uh, effort it takes to farm these rune dungeons and uh, those methods are usually uh, mostly used for getting random runes so farming uh, runes here will allow you to choose uh, a specific set to get so there are five dungeons in total and each of them give uh, you a choice of two different runes so uh queen spider nest will give you energy and endurance uh what's it called forgotten air shrine will give you guard and fatal runes you can look over the runes and what uh, they do in the uh rune menu on your inventory uh, but yeah uh, to cut it short basically this is where you farm your runes uh, some crafting materials that are needed for outfits as well as uh, these purple transcendent pieces so yeah for path of growth or rather path of adventure i won't go too much into detail on what runes do because i will cover that in the specific rune section uh, instead, I will uh, guide you through strategies on how to do all five of these dungeons and what units will be beneficial in them. So let's start it uh, from the first one and as the Queen Spider's Nest. So she is a water element. This means that 
wind element units will have an advantage here and the main goal uh, with uh, the queen spider's nest is to uh, basically kill her either fast enough uh, before she can do little damage to you or uh, you have to manage uh, the poison that she applies because uh, what this boss will do is uh, consistently spawn uh, these little spiderlings uh, during her run uh, which can distract you a bit uh, but also uh, she will consistently uh, give you a poison effect or a poison debuff whatever you want to call it and that poison effect will take a lot of damage and when she uses her uh, the sort of a special attack uh, she will do more damage based on how many dots you have so if you manage to uh, cleanse those dots in time uh, you will not have a very hard time doing it so for a more advanced team i personally use something like this uh, However, this team is uh, oriented into heavy nuking the boss, meaning that if you fail the nuke, uh, you'll probably lose the run. Uh, so for more starter, uh, I guess, teams, I would recommend going uh, for a safer option and going with some cleansing. So for example, uh, one good cleanser is either the light or the water howl. Uh, the water howl is decent, however the light howl will be a little bit uh, stronger in this specific dungeon because it specializes, well, the water one uh, will cleanse one debuff of any kind, uh, the light one will cleanse all uh, damage over time and will do additional healing as well as immunity if uh, she cleanses uh, the damage over time, so she will be a little better and she will be a safe option regardless of what other units you pick, so... For example, of course I'll do an example run for all of these dungeons and I'm gonna give her a regular HP set which I use for healers. I will for example put up a uh, attack buffer and defense uh, breaker and I'll put uh, the wind cat as a damage dealer and well I know my runes are a little bit stronger and you will have weaker ones. I just wanna show you that uh, the light how can basically carry you through this dungeon by simply cleansing the dots in time and yeah here's the run i hope i actually do not kill the boss uh, before but yeah as you can see uh the light how applied immunity uh and basically with immunity this boss cannot apply any debuffs to you and in turn it will not do any damage at all as you can see my damage is pretty slow uh compared to speedruns so yeah, I had two dots and it already wiped half of my HP, but uh, the light how simply cleansed all of them, healed me up a lot, gave me immunity, and this run was uh, easily cleared. So yeah, uh, as far as Queen Spider goes, that's about the strategy, and we'll jump into other dungeons in just a second. Okay, and the second dungeon uh, that I'll be discussing is the Forgotten Elf Shrine. Uh, for this one, the main goal here is to basically either uh, consistently apply attack down on the uh, boss or uh, an even better strategy is to actually consistently remove the attack buff uh, that the boss has uh, every few seconds this boss will cleanse all of the debuffs and will uh, apply attack buff or defense buff to himself and for level 15 dungeon uh, that attack buff and debuff will apply in increments of three this means that uh, whenever a buff is applied, it will start at level 3. And if it's not strafed by the time it gets another buff, it will go to level 6, level 9, and level 10 eventually. So yeah, uh, the general strategy with this is to consistently either have attack debuff on him so he doesn't do a lot of damage. Or uh, another strategy is to uh, consistently strip the attack buff because with attack buff, uh, his attacks are extremely deadly. But uh, without attack buff, he really do can't do much. And the good thing about that is if you do hit a special unit that I'll mention in a second, uh, even without any skills, uh, he will make this dungeon a complete breeze. And by the time you are able to, let's say, do like level 6 of any other dungeon, you should probably do like level 10 or 11 of this dungeon. So, uh, yeah. In general, uh, you can search several monsters that uh, can consistently remove attack buff through the search skill option you go to other effects and the move attack up uh, it also helps if you remove death up but 
defense is only a uh, defensive stat and as long as you have attack up uh, you will be the dungeon although it will be a little slower on compared to if you remove both of the buffs but for attack buff uh, removal uh, here are the two easiest obtainable units that will perform the best so for the by far the easiest unit to obtain it will be the fire fairy which is a three star uh, you will have a lot of skill ups for her even from the monster story you will summon a lot of fairy dupes so you can skill her pretty easily and uh her second skill actually has the ability to uh, strip attack up and if it strips attack up it will actually replace it with uh attack down for 20 seconds and it can do it pretty consistently however uh it will cost you a lot of cooldown or mana so she's not the fastest unit to do this dungeon the good thing about her is she can also strip a defense uh, buff that the boss applies so it will help you do faster runs uh but here is another unit that you can get and it is by far i would say this unit was specifically released for this dungeon uh, he's sort of useless everywhere else except this specific dungeon and it's the water glitch it's a nat 4 but uh, his skill set uh, you will see in a second it was specifically built for the dungeon so his base crack is whatever uh his second skill this is the main uh the main reason why he's amazing uh, this attack attacks multiple times and has a very high chance to remove attack up and remove defense up and once removed it will actually replace it with attack down and defense down so uh, this attack single-handedly can go from a uh, level 10 uh, attack buff and debuff uh, down to level 1 attack defense attack and defense uh, breaks so just with this skill alone and wait till you see his passive which actually uh combines it perfectly with the skill so the third skill is really not that important i'm not gonna pay much attention to it he just gets some attack buff on himself but in that team you'll usually have attack buff already so it's not that important now this is the money maker passive uh, as i like to call it and first of all he's immune to all cc so the boss will not uh, be able to stun him in any way and second of all uh you can see that the passive is split into two parts however since the boss uh level 15 boss starts with a level 3 uh, buffs you can jump straight to the bottom part of the passive and as you can see decreases cooldown of deadly touch by 40 percent every basic attack that he does and deadly attack deadly touch rather is the attack that actually has uh, a strip and a attack well the defense uh, buff strip and the attack buff strip and in a run that i will do in just a second you will see how amazing this unit is uh you do not need any uh skill ups on him unlike all of the other units in this game this is probably the single exception for a unit where uh you do not need any skill ups just because his passive is that amazing as long as you have passive activated this means that as long as you have him awakened to level five uh, he will have the passive and he will be able to completely annihilate the boss the the main thing for him is he does need a lot of attack speed because uh the more attack speed you have the higher chance uh not the higher chance but the faster he will cycle this passive and the faster he cycles his passive the faster he will cycle this skill and as you can see uh the cooldown is 24 seconds but in the run that you see uh in the second that skill will probably be able to be used like every two to three seconds so let me build a team really quickly uh, we're gonna bring the lich and we're gonna bring another damage dealer i'm gonna give the lich some attack speed rune and yeah he has it's not the highest attack speed this is definitely easily achievable this is one of my worst sets uh he has 183 attack speed and 47 accuracy for that strip and uh, we'll go into a run hopefully not crash I'm gonna also switch to water because I do like uh, the cleave's ability to debuff and as you can see uh, check the lich's uh, second skill it has been used it has been used again and it has been used again but like uh, the cycling of the skill look at that uh, it has been used again and it's almost ready used again used again uh, remember that skill had 24 percent or rather 24 second cooldown it's being used every one to two seconds and the boss pretty much 
uh, gets his attack buffed and defense buffs thrift every few seconds. As you can see, the attack buff appeared and it's instantly gone. Uh, can we get another buff? Yep, level 6 attack and it's... No, it, it missed the strip. I do have low accuracy on him, so make sure you get uh, some attack speed and some accuracy. And yeah, uh, this dungeon will become a breeze uh, with the Water Lich. If you do not have the Water Lich, go for either uh, the uh, Fire Fairy or any other unit that can deal with uh, strips. Okie dokie. So for this guy, uh, I would say this is one of the easier uh, Path of Adventure dungeons uh, to clear because the buffs uh, he applies to himself aren't too dangerous and uh, the way to counter him is pretty easy so this guy will uh, periodically apply crit damage up and crit uh, rate up buffs to himself when he uses some skills uh, but the main thing you need to know about this bot is that uh, your goal is to basically prevent him from getting a buff uh, called uh, damage taken down and the way you prevent that from happening is by applying a damage over time effect on him. Uh, there are a total of 5 damage over times currently in the game. So uh, let me quickly show you all of them. So if you go to the harmful effect. Uh, so yeah, there is a burn bleed caused by poison and electric shock. So uh, you can uh, search for all of the monsters that have it. And quite a few monsters have a uh, damage over time effect. So you shouldn't have too much trouble applying it i personally don't even bring a special monster just for uh that debuff because uh cliff uh, has a damage over time effect i believe orbia has uh, at least uh, a few elements i think fire and dark will give a damage over time effect and for kina her first skill has damage over time effects on all three of the main elements i believe so uh, you can apply a damage over time pretty easily with your summoner alone and in most cases you will not even need a specific uh, unit for it however if you don't feel confident in that or you just want to make the run a bit easier you can apply it and as for the teams themselves uh, the general strategy is to go with a fire heavy team uh, you, I do bring Bastet for a buff but I do bring Bastet to pretty much any uh, dungeon because uh, well Bastet is just Bastet and she's really OP in a lot of content uh, for this, I will bring Bulldozer because uh, he is fire element and he's an at 3, so this is sort of an obtainable option for you. And yeah, just gonna quickly do a run. You will see that this dungeon is pretty easy. Uh, if you notice that uh, the boss gets a damage taken down effect as soon as a bleed is applied from my third skill, uh, that effect will disappear. So we'll see if that it's possible to notice it. Yeah, so you see, there he had a level 10 damage taken down effect, and as soon as I applied bleed, and bleed is the very first effect that's visible, the bleed is damage over time, and you get it from uh, Cliff's third skill. Uh, basically, once that effect is on, the boss will not get a damage taken down effect anymore, but when that bleed expires, he will get it again, so you do need to consistently get it. However, if you have high level skills, uh, that bleed will be more than enough to actually fully kill the boss in most cases. And yeah, uh, this is pretty easy. There isn't too many mechanics behind this particular dungeon. And let's move on to the uh, next one. So yeah, as you can saw in that uh, two minutes video, yes, it took me two minutes uh, to beat uh, the dungeon without any uh, strippers or that sort. So it is doable. It will be annoying if you don't bring a special team for it. It will be extremely easy for Orbia users because Wind Orbia of course ignores uh, the death denial that uh, Shurekli has, but if you're playing uh, Cleef or in some cases even Kina, you will struggle a bit and I do recommend bringing either Death Denial or a Stripper of some sort. Uh, you will also need a heal block because uh, if you do not deal enough damage in a short amount of time, uh, he will heal a lot. Uh, the good thing is the, uh, a very easily obtainable unit, actually, no, you actually get it for free completely. 
is probably the SSS tier pick in this dungeon and that's gonna be it. So first of all, uh, his second skill will allow uh, your other uh, units as well as your summoner to cycle their skills a lot. And uh, his third skill, not only does it heal according to max HP, it also cleanses electric shock and applies mana regen up. Uh, this means that at level 1 uh, your mana will regen 50 times faster and it can stack to multiple levels. Uh, allowing to cycle even more heal and whenever he cleanses uh, every time you get a level one applied effect and yeah that will stack up a lot and as you can see i did it with a team that is that does not have any net fives uh you can of course use net fives to make it way easier i simply don't have any uh, units built for this dungeon because uh personally i don't farm this dungeon at all uh I think the two times I found this dungeon, uh, both of them were for a video, so uh, yeah. The basic strategy is to, uh, let me enter the Path of Adventure actually page. Yeah, so this guy, for this guy, a basic strategy is cleanse the electric shock or cleanse uh, the damage over time with any ability that you have. Uh, try to nuke him fast uh, and have a heal block as well as either a strip or a death denial effect on board and with those uh, you can make this dungeon very easy without them uh, you are bound to suffer for around a two minutes per round so yeah uh, let's jump into the last dungeon okay and lava cave or the boss uh, that's called borbo uh, in my opinion this is probably either the easiest or the second easiest uh, dungeon in the game uh, not because uh, the boss itself is easy, but because the units you use in this are uh, most of them freely obtainable and uh, he's pretty easy to counter in my opinion. So the main strategy behind this guy is whenever he attacks you, you must have uh, beneficial effects on you. If he attacks you and your unit does not have beneficial effects on him, uh, he will actually buff up himself. So whenever you enter his dungeon i recommend having some sort of buff uh, with you that way uh if he attacks you and all of your units have beneficial effects he'll pretty much be powerless uh, the second thing about this boss is that he takes less damage from skill attacks and more damage from basic attacks so units with high attack speed uh, will benefit a bit more and let me just quickly uh sell one of the runes and i'll show you uh how you can do this pretty easily okay and uh, let's jump into the dungeon i already have a team sort of in mind so the first thing very easily obtainable unit from the monster story and it's completely free to play is the current bit uh, because his damage scales very well with attack speed he will be a perfect pick here uh, second thing uh, you do need beneficial effects so i will take bastet because her third skill will be able to uh, cycle pretty easily as well as she's water element so she will take less damage uh, from the boss itself and for the third unit i don't even know you know what let's actually try it without any units let's just go uh, with two units just to see whether we're able to be the bad way and we'll see how it goes also keep an eye on the buffs that he applies if you see that he applies uh, any unit that does not get uh buffs prior to his attack it will apply beneficial effects i will actually buff before it so oh actually you see my cliff does not have any beneficial effects uh, luckily he did get some right before the boss attacked so the boss is left with no beneficial effects out of now and my bastet should be able to permanently keep buffs on everyone uh, except that I turned her first skill off and that might cause me trouble. When you use Bastet in Solding Slot, I do recommend, yeah, you see, uh, my Cleave had no beneficial effects for a second and the boss got three buffs instantly. So that was my mistake, but that was uh, bad settings from the previous round. And the dungeon was pretty easy even with only two units. So yeah, the general strategy behind Path of Adventure is pretty much that. Uh, I hope I shed some light on at least the four uh, dungeons excluding Shurekli. That one, since I don't farm, uh, I can't really advise on the best units to use. Uh, but knowing the general strategy, you should be able to build a decent team for it. So uh, keep that in mind that Konamiya is a good option. The Wind Magic uh, 
what's it called, uh, the Wind Mystic, which is a good option for heal block as well as uh, damage since she's Wind Element. Uh, and yeah, uh, the other units you can decide based on your Conan Monster box or whatever you have available. And yeah, let's jump into the next thing. Okay, now we're gonna get into party dungeons. Uh, so first I'll uh, go over uh, the middle one and it's called Rupture. Uh, I'll, read, uh, I'll leave a uh, raid and seal uh, after this because those are a little bit harder to explain as there are uh, way more difficult mechanics behind them. Uh, so for Rupture, uh, there are currently two different Rupture dungeons. Uh, this was recently changed that only one of them is uh, available per day and they uh, cycle every two days. So one day you will see the story at Sky Island. Uh, the second day you will see, uh, I believe it's called Sunken Ruins and they will constantly slip. And on Sunday, I believe all of them, or rather both of them will be available and you will be able to uh, get double the reward because both of these dungeons will give you regular reward as well as support rewards. So uh, there are a total of four uh, levels for Distorted Sky Ruins and the rewards change quite a bit as you can see. Uh, the main uh, rewards you're going here for is the gold and the sky stones. So at level 1 it's around 47k uh, gold and 4000 sky stones. At level 4 it's around 75k gold and 7000 sky stones. Usually it's a little bit less. You get around like uh, 60 to 70k gold and around like 6 to 6.5k sky stones. Uh, sometimes you will also get either the uh, uh, energy pieces or a full uh, energy as well as a few of these items uh, but those are purely RNG. Uh, the only guaranteed reward you are getting is gold and sky stones. So first of all I will show you an example run of it. Uh, no actually before I show you the example run I'll give you the uh, summoner power that's uh, required for it and that is I believe yeah, 233,800 power is needed for this dungeon uh, to get the bonus uh, effect, so less damage taken and more damage dealt. And right now I'm gonna give you an example run, uh, without any commentary I might speed it up a little bit, just so you understand how the dungeon works at all. And after it I'll uh, cover some details about the dungeon in a follow up, uh, in a follow up right after this uh, regular run. So let's create a party, wait for people, and uh, we'll join in. I'll probably speed up the waiting process and I may run the regular dungeon on regular speed. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna fight, not gonna fight, but we're gonna cover uh, the actual fight of the Star Sky Island. So I went at level 4, but that's usually what I farm because uh, by now that dungeon is pretty easy. I think it has like a 200 something thousand power limit, so you should be able to get into it pretty fast. Uh, one thing I want to note is that for each level of these, uh, you will need to complete them three times manually and only after that you are able to order the dungeon. So yeah, it will be a bit annoying because manually these dungeons uh, is uh, super time consuming. They take like four minutes and really you don't need to manually that much because the uh, waves are pretty easy. But yeah, this is basically the people we went in. I uh, tried to go for quite a bit of uh, AoE damage if possible. Uh, if you see that uh, you might struggle with sustain, uh, do make sure to take a healer with you. You don't need that much heals, but something to top you off. So I can see uh, this person brought an Anvil for some healing. Uh, he brought Iona. I didn't bring a healer, but I know that my uh, Bastet is more than enough to keep uh, both of my damage dealers at pretty much full health since uh, no mobs in that uh, fight will break through the shield and yeah we'll quickly explain on how it works at all okay so first of all uh, when you spawn you'll have like a 10 second timer before uh, the fight starts you can see that there are three waves in total so first two waves will be regular mobs and the third one will be the boss uh, you don't need the map really uh, you can turn that off i don't know if i did but uh, we'll keep it at that for now. Basically, the goal of this dungeon is you see this uh, level 16 magic stone and it currently has 100% HP. Uh, the magic stone is this uh, big rock in the middle and the goal of the dungeon is to uh, pass all three rounds uh, without this magic stone uh, dropping down to zero HP. 
if the drop if it drops uh, to zero HP, uh, you have lost the run and you'll have to do it once again. Uh, the way uh, the stone gets destroyed is uh, through the sides of the arena. Uh, you'll see that in just a second. Uh, there will be multiple portals open. There will be like six or seven portals, something like that. Uh, and through those portals, uh, mobs will regularly uh, be coming in and pretty decent amount of mobs, like uh, in chunks of five, probably like two, three waves in chunks of five are uh, constantly coming in every like 10 seconds. Uh, so uh, there will be a lot of mobs that you have to beat. That's why I personally recommend bringing some AoE damage. I have my Ifrit with AoE skills. I have uh, my own uh, Cleave with some AoE skills. So it's usually enough. Uh, another thing is Karambit is amazing in this dungeon because uh, he can uh, pass through those uh, beneficial effects that the boss will have and you won't even... Uh, because if you don't have a single unit that uh, does damage through uh, beneficial effects, you will have to manual the dungeon a bit at the end. If you do have at least one uh, monster that uh, ignores beneficial effects in any team so it doesn't have to be you it can be either one of your allies or you can be it as well so stuff like iron Mist, stuff like uh dark cowgirl and other units that ignore all beneficial effects uh, that will allow you to beat this dungeon completely order and yeah uh so uh there will be portals uh this is the stone that you have to protect at the start of the round you will also see these little buffs and if you feel like uh, you can walk over them uh, in the first 10 seconds and you will receive not not just you but your whole party will receive a buff that you've walked over so for example uh, this one i'm not sure if it heals or gives continuous recovery so don't quote me on that uh, this one will give defense buff uh, there is one that gives like attack power or something like that usually you don't need these if you got uh, stronger people i'm not sure if any of us even picked it out because i think all of us were on order no we did we did we did so as you can see he picked it up and everyone uh received uh this long lasting defense buff and after a few seconds uh you can see these small portals appearing already but i think i'll uh sort of whoa whoa whoa, whoa. we don't want any sound yeah, uh, I just turned around here just to show how it looks like. So there will be uh, a lot of portals and they will spawn in random rotations. As you can see, there's three, four, for the first one, was that like four or five portals? And basically mobs will start uh, constantly spawning from them. Uh, they will be walking towards uh, the stone. However, if you are the closer target compared to the stone, they will actually be targeting you. So as long as you have some people in between, somewhere in between, uh, the uh, portal and the stone uh, they will target you and will not focus the stone as you can see that uh, little mob did walk towards the stone so we started losing some hp but uh, since there are three rounds and the last round is uh, purely the boss who usually doesn't hit the stone and hits you instead uh, you can get away with losing like 40 to 45 percent hp for each wave and even then uh, win pretty successfully so yeah uh, i won't look over the whole dungeon i think um by the way these little things uh, when you see these and you have a little bit of a weaker party do focus them because uh, they do 10 percent of uh, the magic stones hp if they hit it so uh, they will come close and they will start charging and basically they'll like drop like a bomb on the ground and will do damage it so uh if you're trying to do it manually if you have a weaker party uh, these guys will be the ones to focus on but we have a stronger party so we just order and we have more than enough uh firepower to kill it and yeah uh, let's wait to the around one yeah so wave one ends uh then the second wave will come once again you will have the ability to uh regroup a bit uh, new portals will be opened and uh what you'll notice now is as you can see there we go um i think it happens when the boss starts one second there you go uh buff effect will activate on the creatures find the artifact and destroy it uh, this is especially important if you are on the weaker side so if you are a stronger player or doing uh, the party with stronger players uh, this will not matter much but uh, if you're on the weaker side uh, these buffs that the enemies have 
uh, will uh, prevent uh, you from doing a lot of damage and sometimes they get offensive buffs as well so they can in turn do more damage to you and uh, to get rid of this uh, buff effect you will have to uh, destroy uh, these little altar thingies and I'm not sure if I will go into vision of them the bad thing about it is that uh, when you're on order uh, you usually focus the monsters and you will only focus the altars if uh, there are no monsters on the field so keep that in mind and if you're playing manually it's a good thing to uh, destroy these altars uh, before fighting the monsters so I'll see if I can find any Oh, that's perfect, that's perfect, it was standing right next to me. So yeah, uh, these are little altar thingies, and basically these are the towers that are giving uh, the buffs to enemy creatures, and once you destroy them, uh, all of the enemies that are currently on the field or will spawn soon uh, will no longer have that buff, so it will help uh, to speed up the run per se, but it's really not required. And as you can see, luckily uh, the buff was pretty close to me and uh, when I'm on auto, I quickly destroyed it. They don't take that much damage to destroy and all of the, yeah, you can see the artifact has been removed and the buffs will no longer happen. And basically, that's the general gist of the dungeon. Uh, you just try to protect this uh, main stone against the monsters. Uh, the first two waves are pretty easy, but you do need a lot of damage. And once the third wave comes, well, let's skip to it and where is it there you go uh the third wave so we beat this one real quick and the third wave gets announced uh on the third wave these little uh, power-ups will once again drop so if you want to prepare for boss a little better you can pick them up and you have again a 10 second preparation timer and let's quickly wait it out, as you can see we picked up the defense buff and the boss will appear, there will be multiple portals but the boss will only appear out of one of them so we'll have to locate it where he appears, I don't think he appears in this one yeah, uh, so the big boss, as you can see, uh, if there was no one in around this area he would have targeted the uh, stone but since uh, this player was closer to the boss than the uh, boss was to the effect stone the boss tied the targeting him and the boss will be easy at first but after a few seconds as you can see he gets a buffed artifact uh, he gets some buffs after a while uh, those buffs will become even stronger and the problem with those is yeah you can see these altars appear again and there are more altars i think there are like three or four when the boss spawns uh yeah it looks like we didn't get that phase here but because we just did a lot of damage in a very quick amount of time uh, after a few seconds, uh, if the buffs are not removed, uh, this boss will receive a pink invincibility effect and that means uh, that uh, it's an invincibility buff, meaning that uh, the boss can receive zero damage no matter the source of damage that is. And uh, since it's pink, so uh, similar to this effect, like damage taken up, uh, Basically, pink effects cannot be removed uh, by you or by any monsters. Uh, those can only be, be the food removed by certain game mechanics. And in this case, uh, the game mechanic that requires you to remove the invincibility is these uh, little artifacts. Once they are destroyed, the invincibility gets removed. And once again, all of your monsters are able to do damage. But even if he does get invincibility, if you have at least one unit that ignores it, you can still do damage through it, so if the boss had invincibility here, all of us would be hitting, uh, pretty much none of us would be actually doing damage except for current bit, uh, but my current bit is built on a lot of attack, a lot of attack speed, and even then, uh, he alone could uh, go through these 37% HP in like 10 seconds. And uh, one more thing to note uh, during the boss stage is, you cannot take too long, so don't bring like full support team, like three healers, three shielders, stuff like that. Because uh, if you take some time, I'm not sure of the exact amount of time, maybe half a minute or a minute or something. Uh, during that time, if you haven't killed the boss in a certain amount of time, uh, these portals will start spawning those uh, Pakala thingies, those little flying bubbles, what they call these guys. 
they will start spawning and they will go towards the uh, area and explode there for 10% of the HP. So yeah, that is another way you could lose if you take a little bit too long on the dungeon. So make sure to actually kill uh, the boss in a decent amount of time. I mean, depending on the server you join, uh, people will get the hang of it pretty fast. If you're joining a new server, there are no plays. It will be a bit difficult in the beginning, but uh, later on, as people build better teams, they understand the game better, you will have a way easier time dealing with that. And yeah, uh, once the dungeon is over, uh, the boss dies and you receive the rewards. Uh, these rewards are pretty constant, they fluctuate a bit, but uh, they are pretty consistent for the most part. So we will be getting around 60 to 70 thousand gold, like six to seven thousand sky stones, of course this is for level 4 only, and you'll get some additional stuff, so uh, you might get uh, these transcendence pieces, you might get a full energy of uh, various transcendence colors, uh, some rune pieces, uh, a crafting material is pretty there, but looks like I got lucky for this one, uh, don't be scared, the, all of the rewards you see here, it's not. It's like not all of them rewards, it's usually the most uh, premium item that the person got, so uh, not counting these, looks like both of them got uh, one green transcendence piece as their main reward. And yeah, uh, after this you are able to do the support run, which will reward you with 20,000 gold, and for the support run, uh, if you're having trouble with the level 4, I recommend to just go level 1, because for support runs it doesn't matter which level you do, as long as you beat uh, the support again, You'll just be able to, uh, you'll see that it should say support run available or something like that. If you click on the quick join or create party, you will show, it will show you the available reward and that reward will be 20,000 gold regardless of the level you choose. This is the same for both the Soda Sky Island and the Sunken Ruins or Rupture, whatever it's called, I don't remember. And yeah, uh, for the fight, that's about it, and uh, let's move on to the next one. And uh, similar to the story Sky Island, now I'll cover the Sunken Ruins, which is another type of rupture, and I'll explain how the fight works and what you do to succeed. So these are the people uh, we're going in with, like uh, 300,000, 350,000, pretty regular for this uh, state of the game. And yeah, uh, the teams you bring into this, uh, I would say, don't really matter. Uh, bring whatever the strongest units you have. If you're struggling with healing, do bring some healing. And because the mobs, they aren't difficult. Uh, it would be beneficial if you bring a lot of AoE damage because uh, there will be even more mobs compared to the destroyed Sky Island. There might be like 50 mobs stacked on top of you, and with an AoE attack you will be able to deal with them faster, so that's why I bring my uh, Amamir. Uh, and yeah, we'll go into the run. I'd say mechanically wise, uh, this one is a bit more easier uh, than the story of Sky Island, like there's less managing. The bad thing about this dungeon is uh, you have to do it manually, or sort of semi-manually, because Odo simply doesn't work on it. I don't know why AI doesn't pick it up, but yeah, it is what it is. In this dungeon, uh, you will spawn in this room and you'll have to hit the door uh, once uh, the game tells you that uh, you should do that. So in a second, it will show you. Yeah, destroy the gate. Uh, you can go on auto, but you will have to manually hit the gate, otherwise uh, you will not start attacking it. And after you destroy the door, uh, there will be these a few long ass rooms and uh, mobs will spawn in each of these like windows, so once you pass this cloud, uh, the first wave of mobs will spawn, then once you pass these clouds, another wave of mobs will spawn. Uh, so you can fight them one by one like this, so for example you can just fight, uh, all three of you can fight five of these, it will be easier. Uh, if you're running with uh, stronger power people, uh, you should do the skipping strategy and what that refers to is uh, actually just ignoring these mobs and going to the very end of the floor. Uh, and what this does is actually, uh, while you will be taking a few hits, uh, if you go right here, uh, this forces all of the uh, monsters to spawn at once. And once there, uh, if all of three of you went to the very end of the room, uh, that way uh, you will be able to deal with all of the mobs a bit faster as long as you have AoE abilities. So you can see that's exactly what I did, I used all of my dashes and everything like that. Once here you can just uh, 
put your game on order and a deal with these mobs and you can see all of the three of us went here and we really didn't have much trouble dealing with them like you see they all already died and now the last wave spawns which only happens after the first three die and after this wave dies uh, you the game once again tells you to uh, hit the door because the next stage has opened this exact same thing will happen in the next floor uh, once again you just have to beat the mobs the mobs will be a little bit different compared to the first one but not any more difficult than the previous one once again right here you run to the very end if you want to speed up your runs because if you don't if you don't run to the end and someone does uh what will end up happening is a few people will be hiding right here and half of the mobs will be attacking you while the other half will be attacking them uh if the mobs uh, that you are fighting will not die fast enough uh, your teammates will have to walk back they'll have to help you kill the mobs and then they'll have to walk here and yes people really don't want to waste time in this dungeon because this dungeon isn't hard and uh it also isn't really that fun so people just do it for the rewards and they want to pass it as soon as possible so yeah uh quickly dealing with this there will be a bit more mobs as you can see and yeah once you're dealt once again you hit the door now the third stage here will be uh different uh, there will be a total of four of these rooms uh, the third one is a trap room and uh, there will be spikes on the sides as well as at the entrance uh, there will be these fire uh totems that should have fire and fire does do quite a bit of damage so be careful if you're squishy uh, and then there will be these wind turbines let me walk a bit further so you can see and they'll show you the charge that they're doing. So uh, basically the middle one will shoot and the two side ones will shoot and they'll uh, alternate like that. Uh, the fires will shoot uh, all at once. And the, I don't know, do they change placement? I'm not even sure. Uh, but yeah, uh, spikes do some damage, but don't be worried about getting hit by those. They're, they do like 15% HP or something like that. And they don't appear that often. So uh, try to dodge these instead of the spikes. And... Uh, this is a bit annoying, especially if you are if you are on a higher ping because uh, you in your side you may see that you're standing right here, yet you will be pushed back. And once you get pushed back once, it's very hard to recover unless uh, you're starting from scratch. Because when you're pushed back, you're losing time on the animation. Uh, during the animation charge, uh, that pushback already pushed you, and uh, you're wasting like half of the charge time to just. Uh, get up after the push and yeah it's very annoying uh, the easiest way to do it is to just wait for the middle one to uh, blow then uh, when the side ones are charging uh, go to there uh, go to any side after uh, those side ones move and uh, simply all, use all three of your dashes to just go to either side uh, if you do not have three dashes you will have to do a little bit more maneuvering but it's pretty easy and the, the only the good thing about this is oh, actually i'll just show you quickly how i do it so yeah just wait for the middle one wait for the side ones and do three dashes and basically i would say it's probably the easiest way uh, the good thing about this dungeon is only one of you really need to pass the trap uh doesn't matter if uh two of you get stuck because uh, there is this little bubble and if you if the someone who passes uses this bubble for like i think the animation is like three to five seconds uh, they will be able to disable all of the traps and the rest of you will be able to pass without any trouble. If all three of you pass, don't bother uh, activating this bottle because you can just uh, go straight for the door. I know that my people, no, <laughs> not my, my people, uh, yeah, my teammates were pretty good enough and uh, they did pass it looks like. So we just went straight for it and the fourth phase this is probably the hardest one and probably the one where you will receive the most damage uh, so in this phase uh, similar to the previous ones mobs will spawn as you walk uh, further uh, then these uh, little uh, zones will spawn and after like a few seconds of charging you will see that they'll shoot this attack uh, this attack does do quite a bit of damage if i don't have a shield it hits me for like half my hp so I do recommend getting either shields or heals if you're a bit on the squishier side. And you'll see these two totems. And the goal of this room is to, for two of you, to use these totems uh, and unlock the next room. 
if you just fight the mobs, even if you notice that the mobs have all mobs have uh, been defeated, the next one will not open unless you do this. And how you do this is just one of you stands on uh, one side, the other uh, will stand on the other side. The third person can just hunt the mobs while you're doing it. And you just simply walk to here, uh, you will click a button uh, that says uh, to use it. So if you're playing on PC, I think the button is F. And yeah, basically you're just uh, doing this little animation thingy while you're cleaning the tower. It doesn't have to be done at the same time. You can do this one and then do that one separately. You, the same person can do two of them, but uh, if you want a faster run, you can uh, do them at once. And once both of these devices have been activated, just don't pay attention to what's happening in battle while you're doing this. Uh, just make sure to get shield up or heal up or stuff like that. And once of, once of these have been activated, you can start hitting the door again. And behind this door, there will be a final boss. I think it's called Gigas. Uh, they are a bit annoying because they are uh, tanky and they do like to buff a defense buff on themselves. And I think they also do very annoying knockback. So yeah, the boss isn't hard, it's just annoying. But yeah, the, the fight was pretty easy for us. I mean, it's not really rocket science by this point. Plenty of debuffs and yeah. The rewards will be the same as uh, the story of Sky Island. So gold, sky stones, uh, transcendence materials. This one looks like I got lucky. I got some pieces and the full energy. Uh, some rune enhancement shards. And yeah, uh, this is pretty much it. For the support run, uh, once again, you can do another one to get 20,000 gold. I personally only do the Storted Sky Island uh, support runs because these support runs, uh, for the 20,000 gold, I just don't have the time and patience to do a manual run. I try to keep all of my runs on order. But yeah, uh, this pretty much covers the Rupture dungeons and we'll go... Uh, Okay, and after you clear the first run of the day for uh, either dungeon, so either the Destroy the Sky Island or the Sunken Ruins, uh, you have the ability to uh, do a support run. Uh, you can do as many support runs as you want, uh, however, you will only get support rewards for one of the uh, runs you do in the day. So after you are done with the support run, uh, you get the 20,000 gold. And uh, you can do, as it says here, unlimited battle support. However, uh, you will not be getting any more rewards. So it's only useful if you are trying to do the missions uh, because those will count, especially the missions where you have to do uh, support uh, sunken ruins or destroy island 15 or 30 times. Uh, those will count and you can uh, bang them all out in a day. However, for the rewards, uh, you have the ability to get one support run and it will give you 20,000 gold for it. Uh, this is a fixed amount, so you will not get lower than 20k gold for this. Uh, and uh, the same reward applies to both the Sword of Sky Island as well as Sunken Ruins when it's uh, on in that day. Uh, on Sundays, when both of the dungeons are available, you can do uh, regular runs for both dungeons as well as support runs for both dungeons. That means you can do 20k uh, gold from one dungeon for support as well as another 20k gold for uh, supporting the other dungeon that appears on the same day. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna address the uh, probably the hardest, not uh, not the hardest, maybe the uh, most exclusive dungeon in the game, and that is Seal. Uh, in general, this dungeon is uh, very different from all of the other raids because, uh, first of all, the way you do damage in this is very different. Uh, that means you will need very different units built for it. You may already have some units uh, that you regularly use that will work here, but for the most part, uh, there is a good chance that you will need two to three new units uh, that you never used or never built because uh, those units have unique skills uh, for this dungeon. Uh, quickly addressing, uh, you can do Ruin Temple two times per day and after those entries are used up, not, not per day, uh, per week. And after these two entries are used up, uh, you get the ability to do three support runs uh, per week, I believe. Uh, the first two will give you a rune uh, as a support award, a legendary rune, I believe. And uh, the third support run will give you uh, 10 coins. I personally don't do the support runs because uh, the rewards you get for those support runs uh, compared to the effort of uh, 
finding a party and first of all running the dungeon is a bit too much for me uh, but if you use the uh, cheat strategy that I will uh, explain in a bit uh, you can uh, do those support runs pretty really easily uh, the main rewards you get from here are the uh, bladed wing sets and you can get either uh, 5 star 0 awakened gear, uh, 5 star 2 awakened gear or 5 star 4 uh, awakened gear and the way you get a uh, gear here is determined by a uh, complete RNG uh, after the run uh, there will be a little dice roll and you can get a number from uh, 0 to 99 or is it 100 I'm not sure even uh, it's somewhere in that page like it's either 0 to 100 or 1 to 100 I believe or maybe 1 to 99 I'm not sure of the exact uh, minimum maximum number but it's in that range and uh, the number you get will determine the reward that you receive so for uh, numbers that are like 0 to somewhere in the 70s uh, you will only get uh, crafting materials and there are a lot of crafting materials so even those are super useful here uh, and of course you will always get coins but you will get less than this you'll usually get like 50 to maybe 120 or somewhere like that uh, for numbers 70 to around 90 you will get uh, either a 5 star gear or a 5 star 2 awakened gear and uh, for uh, numbers at 90 plus uh, or somewhere around there you will get a 5 star 4 awakened gear and yeah uh, this gear of course can be purchased here but we'll talk about that in just a second uh, the general uh, strategy behind this dungeon is this boss is immune to every single debuff except damage over time. This means that uh, the only five debuffs that will work on him uh, are the damage over times that are uh, here. So uh, he will only be damaged by burn, uh, bleed, frostbite, poison and electric shock. No other debuff can be applied on him at all. Uh, he's immune to everything else. And uh, based on that, you will need to build a team uh, which basically uh, consists of a few monsters that uh, do these damage over time effects as well as if you're running with uh, someone who hasn't uh, made a specific team you may need a support unit as well uh, luckily uh, there are quite a few units that have a uh, good damage over time effects and quite a few of them are pretty easily obtainable so uh, i personally uh, run a team like this let me show you real quickly uh, there you go. Uh, I of course have power, just some of my units are now unruined. I run Windcleave because he has uh, Electric Shock on his second skill. Uh, I run Fire Pixie. Uh, I run her in non Soul Sling slot, I just never bothered to change it. Uh, the Fire Pixie has the ability to uh, both give you a burn on the boss as well as actually explode the burn. That means uh, that let's say you have a level 10 burn on the boss. Uh, explode and burn basically uh, does that damage over time effect instantaneously meaning that uh, if the burn if the level 10 burn ticked like 0.1% uh, HP every uh, let's say 10 uh, every second for like 20 seconds in total over 20 seconds that would be 2% of the boss's max HP however with explode burn uh, you basically use that skill uh, all of the burn on the boss disappears and he instantly takes two uh, percent of the damage and uh, the two other units i run are both the fire and the wind ifrit and that's because uh, the fire ifrit has a chance to apply burn on his basic skill and uh, several levels of burn on his second skill or rather the third skill and the wind one actually has an amazing unique ability and I do recommend having at least uh, one or two uh, wind ifrits in your team if you have the ability to do so. Uh, because first of all, uh, he does apply some electric shock on his first skill I believe, yep, on his first charge skill. Uh, his basic attack, uh, look at this, it increases damage over time duration by 2%, not 2%, 2 seconds. Uh, this means that uh, if the original damage over time effect may only last like 10 to 20 seconds with this you can expand that effect up to like minutes several minutes so uh this will really help out in doing that consistent damage instead of just relying on uh, charge skills alone there are a lot of other units that are amazing in this dungeon i won't cover all of them but 
Uh, at least I'll try to address some of the more popular DM4 star ones. So for burn, uh, I believe the fire cargo has some use, however, I haven't seen her much. Uh, other units in blue, uh, include the fire pixie, the light pixie, which actually uh, applies burn and the revives, so it's sort of a safer option for the viven. Uh, for net fives, I know that Dika is a decent one, uh, Smoke is an amazing uh, unit here. Of course, the Sarian is really good. Uh, yeah, so for burns, that's about it. Uh, then if you look into bleed, actually no, bleed is sort of a rare effect, so not a lot of you do it. Uh, one good unit for this dungeon in general is a uh, seal. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, you use seal for seal, yeah. Uh, she has a third skill that applies bleed and poison, and these two are by far the rarest uh, damage over time effects. So uh, if you do have a seal, it will help your team immensely. Uh, some other units for frostbite. Uh, I know that the water refrit is a very good one. Uh, this guy both applies frostbite as well as a skill that explodes frostbite. So similar to the fire pixie, he can explode all frostbite effects. Uh, the water cowgirl is an amazing unit for frostbite. I know he does some frostbite, although I haven't tested him much. Uh, then for uh, poison. Uh, also, I'm not mentioning this, but keep in mind that all summoners do have uh, damage over time effects as well. So. Uh, I'll look over those in just a second. So yeah, for poison, uh, I know that the best option is the fire uh, lich. Uh, I think he has both poison and maybe... No, he doesn't have explode poison. No, no. Uh, so yeah, uh, the fire lich is an amazing unit. Uh, I haven't really looked into the net 3 options. And uh, there is a unit that... Uh, this one, yeah. He both applies poison and he has the ability to explode poison. So... For poison explosion, this is your guy, and I think he's the only guy that can do it. Yeah, as you can see, he's the only. Although he is a net five that is light and dark, so that will be a little hard to acquire. And lastly, for electric shock, there are a lot of options. So the wind effect will be the most popular one. There is the uh, wind cowgirl, and a lot of uh, summoners have the electric shock, so you will find an easier time there. For summoners, uh, if you're using Cleave, you have a few options, so you can go either for the Wind one or the Fire one. Uh, the Wind one has uh, Electric Shock on the second skill, and I found that this is a bit more uh, useful than the Fire one. Uh, however, Fire is good if you do need some self-sustain, because that third skill does uh, give you some continuous uh, degeneration. For Fire, you have uh, this third skill, which gives uh, level 1 bleed yep level one bleed uh in some cases this will be better than the wind one especially if you have a lot of units that can already max out electric shock as uh the bleed effect is a bit more there so uh if you do not have a lot of bleed effects you could end up using this and just use something like a wind if it to constantly expand uh not not expand extend uh those damage over time effects and with that, you even have the ability to continuously attack the boss and stack that bleed to level 10. And the more unique uh, damage over time effects that you get at once, uh, the faster the boss will die. And try to get at least like three unique different uh, damage over time effects because if you don't, uh, the boss will take a lot of time to kill. And in a case where he accidentally uh, starts attacking you, if you're doing the cheat strat, uh, those attacks will hurt a lot because he gains a lot of power uh, by the last 5 minutes and trust me, I used a full tank teams, uh, I used my Cleave when he was full HP at like the water element I think usually or the fire element maybe. And yeah, with 62,000 HP, 4,000 defense, he quite literally one shot me even with Bastet's shield sometimes. So yeah, don't wait around for that and do try to nuke him with as many damage all time effects as possible. And now for the dungeon, uh, there are two different strategies. I will only showcase one, but I will uh, link a video in the description or in the comments. I'm not sure where I'm going to put those yet. Uh, of the more detailed seal guide that I've made. Uh, that video will explain you all of the attacks as well as how uh, how those attacks work, what to do during those attacks and uh, basically just how to dodge them in general. 
so you know uh, which attacks do what and that way even if you fail a run or you see that you're close to failing or something like that you can still pull through and uh, get that victory for the team uh, in this showcase i will only show you the what's so called a cheat strat uh, keep in mind that if you're watching this uh, video uh, several months from now the cheat strat may have been patched but for now it still works and it has worked for at least like a few months already, so uh, I'm not sure if it's getting patched at all. It is a bit difficult to pull out, but uh, once you do, and if you have a good uh, leader for uh, that cheese strat run, you will manage to do it very easily, and you will even manage to do it with people who have uh, insane penalties, because uh, even if you go uh, with like a very hard penalty, or an insane penalty, let's say, there is a chance you will be able to beat it as long as you have good units and second of all uh, the runner will be uh, running perfectly and will not uh, cause the boss to turn on you at any point and yeah that cheat strategy will be showcased in a second and yeah basically uh, the general gist of this dungeon is do damage over time, so dodge attacks if the boss attacks you and uh, try to choose which strategy to do uh, the boss with. So the harder one will be uh, to do it regularly, meaning that you have to dodge all of his attacks. You have to constantly attack with all of your members. There is a cheese stretch where uh, one person can take aggro from the uh, boss and simply leave him around the arena while the other five uh, attack. And usually at like 10% of HP left uh, that runner will turn and you will have to dodge a few attacks but by then uh, the victory is pretty much guaranteed even if something goes wrong for a few people and yeah uh, let's jump into the run and I'll try to comment a bit about the run itself okay so this is the support run we did not support run uh, the seal run we did yesterday with my girl so shout out to all those people uh, on the top left corner uh, we have uh, a person who will be uh, running as a runner and uh, first of all, let me quickly address there will be some people who may not have perfect teams for the dungeon but that's completely okay and as long as all of you know what you're doing and you have some, uh, some damage over time effects even if it takes a bit longer you will be able to beat it pretty easily as you can see I'm running the Wind Cleave, uh, my Fire Pixie and both Ifrits and yeah we'll see how it goes so first of all when you enter you will enter with six people so basically you and five others and uh this is a huge arena and the boss will always be in the middle now uh, this is where you choose which strategy you do so if you are doing a regular run all of you will start attacking the boss right away and simply try to dodge all of his attacks if you are doing a cheat strat uh what you'll need to do is let the person who will be the runner uh go and aggro the boss uh, while all five of you stay away and if a boss uh, goes to a certain side so for example if he moves to here uh, everyone should move uh, to the opposite side so that the boss doesn't uh, catch aggro and ruin the run so yeah you can see uh, the person goes aggro the boss he goes away from us so that uh, the boss will move towards there and yeah we're basically trying to see uh, the boss will do his charge attack and we all try to move towards the different side and now the person right here uh, they have aggroed uh, the boss meaning that the boss will constantly chase him as long as he keeps uh, a perfect distance from the boss uh, it's very hard to manage uh, the perfect distance because if you go a little bit too close uh, the boss will uh, do a charge attack and you will have to wait like 15 seconds for all of the animations to finish and even then, uh, you're not guaranteed that uh, the boss will attack the same target. Uh, if you go too far, uh, so for example, if the boss was here and the person was already here, uh, the way boss moves uh, will sort of ruin the run because uh, your goal is to bring him around the very edge for the whole run. So basically just run in a circle around the edge. If you go too far, uh, the boss, instead of going around the edge, he will just go through the middle. And that way, when the boss is uh, close to the middle, uh, if the runner is not extremely fast, uh, he will keep running here, but the boss will just cut uh, on a smaller circle and basically may just come too close to the runner and charge his attack. So 
I think it happened like once or twice in this run, but overall it was a pretty clean run. So when you see that the boss is chasing uh, the person, you can start attacking him. Uh, but in case uh, the charge attack happens and you're doing the cheese strat, I do recommend uh, on backing out. So same way as uh, you backed out on before starting. So yeah, as you can see, uh, we got a bit too close and uh, the boss did his basic attack. There is a chance that he will not charge any uh, charge attack and will keep chasing, so that's the good scenario. Uh, but uh, there is a chance that he will do a charge attack, so in those cases you should uh, let the runner get close to where the boss will uh, end up after his charge. And everyone should uh, fall back a bit so that the boss doesn't pick up aggro on the runner. And yeah, as you can see, we just stayed a bit uh, further away from the boss. It looks like uh, one person went, but uh, their uh, units didn't aggro the boss, so that's a good thing. And yeah, uh, basically at this point, we're just uh, running like this. We have several bur uh, damage over time effects, so I personally have... Uh, Three, no, two units that do burn and two units that do uh, electric shock. And uh, I think someone has a use. Let's look what people have. So uh, there is a uh, dark lich which provides poison. Uh, I'm not seeing the f uh, who's doing freeze. Uh, I think uh, this uh, Lumini Guildy. I think the Water Kina does have a Frostbite on her first charge skill and I know that uh, Fire Orbia has Burn on one of her skills. For Orbius, I usually recommend going for the Dark Element because I think it does have Poison and Poison is way more there to come by uh, than Burn, so uh, it will just allow you to do more damage uh, in a lower amount of time. But yeah, other than that, uh, the run is pretty self-explanatory, you are just uh, chasing the boss and uh, trying to do as much damage as possible. Uh, also, this is why I'm saying that you do not need a high power if you're doing a cheese strat because uh, as you can see, no one is getting hit here. Uh, all you need to do is to just chase the boss and hit him with attacks. If you do not have uh, any damage or time effects or if you're like missing a spot for a damage uh, dealer, uh, you can always bring a unit that builds movement speed. That way you're buffing uh, the, the, the attacks of your other teammates and uh, other teammates can do more damage uh, that way. Uh, you can also bring attack speed unit because uh, usually people who are running uh, Ifrits, so all three Ifrits are amazing here. Uh, people who are running uh, stuff like, what else is there? Uh, just basically whichever unit uh, has uh, damage over time on their basic ability, uh, that way uh, they will be able to attack more often and more damage over time to will land. So uh, stuff are like both, no, all three Ifrits, so the fire and water one apply uh, damage over time effects and the wind one can extend them. Uh, there is a dark unit that does poison, I kind of forgot a thing, is it the dark lizard man? Uh, I know I checked yesterday, but basically I won't go too much into detail about all the monsters, uh, I do recommend just going into the uh, monster book, uh, selecting the effect and you can check which units are good there. So yeah, and uh, this one pretty much goes for like a few uh, more minutes and we're just constantly chasing him and I think will he turn at the end of the last few percent? Yeah, it looks like at, when there are a few percent left. Uh, the runner turned to receive the wards, but by then uh, the boss will be uh, pretty much dead from uh, the remaining damage over time effects. And the runner should turn because if the runner does not do any damage, they will not receive any rewards. So uh, do uh, let the runner turn when there is like 10% or less, so he could do a little bit of damage on the boss and receive the rewards. And yeah, once the dungeon is done, uh, you will uh, drop these dice and Basically, it will show you uh, the score everyone got. I got super lucky and got a 92, meaning that I will get like one of the highest tier rewards. And you will be able to see all of the rewards uh, in just a second. So you can see the rewards uh, others got. So this person, uh, he used up all of his uh, regular runs and support runs, so he didn't get any. Uh, these two people uh, used their support runs, so they got legendary 5 star runes. 
uh, the person who rolled 15 uh, didn't get a summoner item, so it shows that they got coins, but it has to show that everyone who has normal runs got points, it's just not shown there. And it looks like me and Zoe got uh, 5 star 2 awakening items. And the total items you get are uh, a summoner item if the score is high enough. Uh, you will get some sort of a material uh, for crafting, you will get seal coins and you will always get this box. Uh, it's a shame I didn't record uh, the items of the box, but basically you can get either... Uh, you will, you will get uh, upgrade materials for either your summoner or your runes, so stuff like uh, gems, stuff like books, uh, stuff like uh, engraved stones or those effect stones, whatever they're called. Usually the tier of those items will be pretty low, I think uh, you can get somewhere from the green tier to the purple tier. I know I got a purple item once, but most of the time it's just blue ones, so don't expect too much from there, it's just a nice bonus I suppose. And yeah, so for the seal run, for the cheese strat, uh, that's about it. Uh, if you want to learn the attacks and how to do the boss uh, using a normal run, so basically dodging all of those attacks, you can check the video that's linked uh, either in the description or in the comments. I, I don't know where I'll put each one because uh, I know that the description has a character limit and I do plan on making timestamps for everything in this video, so if I do end up putting timestamps there, there might not be space for the video, but yeah. Uh, check either the co pin comment or the description, and yeah, let's move uh, to the last thing about it. Okay, and it's finally time to tackle uh, one of the most important uh, content in this game, at least as far as PvE goes, uh, and it's the party raids. Uh, the reason why it's important is because uh, this is the place where you get uh, the best uh, gear for your summoner that's available in the game. Uh, so starting with uh, Elite Foggy Prison, I will cover these two in a second, I just want to explain them about the raids overall. Uh, starting with Elite Foggy Prison, uh, you will be able to acquire 5 star uh, legendary equipment and even though uh, the raids that go further do have uh, higher awakening levels on the gear, uh, even Elite Foggy Prison weapons can be turned uh, to a similar uh, strength as any other uh, Elite Dungeon weapons, as you can see. Uh, it will cost a bit more to craft, of course, but uh, it is worth it. So the Elite Foggy Prison uh, weapons that you get here uh, will be basically these uh, little uh, small icon of the Foggy Prison weapon. And using upgrades uh, in the blacksmithing profession, uh, you are able to upgrade it uh, to 5 star 1 awakening, 5 star 2 awakening, 5 star 3 awakening. And finally jump into the uh, the good tier, what I like to call it, uh, the 6 star weapons. Uh, you will need of course the previous weapon from the chain. And uh, the last upgrade is the 6 star level 2 awakening weapon. And that's actually the maximum awakening that you can get on any weapon currently. And as you can see, each dungeon does have a variant of a uh, 6 star 2 awakening weapon available for it. Some are a bit easier to craft, some are a bit more expensive to craft, but basically uh, they are all pretty good. Uh, some of them have uh, more specialized buffs, so like some of them may be uh, more geared towards PvP, some of them may be geared more towards uh, enhancing your skills. So. If you want to check uh, the exact bonus, you can head over to the blacksmithing tab, choose a weapon and select uh, each weapon. And in blue letters, you will see uh, the special effect that each uh, weapon has. So, for example, a maximally upgraded uh, soul death weapon from Froggy Prison will uh, enhance the skill level of a random attribute research by 2, as long as it's not a max level. And uh, the, if it, the weapon is light or dark element, uh, it will also either decrease or uh, increase the damage uh, you do in the... Or rather, uh, decrease the damage you take for the light element and increase the damage you do for the dark element. And those are usually present on every weapon, only the first skill usually changes. So for attribute, this means that uh, the two levels that would be increased would be these ones. So for example, if the weapon was fire, uh, I would have a level 7 fire attribute, but 
uh, be, if you have that weapon equipped, it would basically act as a level 9 uh, weapon with uh, a level 9 fire research basically. So uh, as long as it's not marked, once you have those marked, uh, the uh, weapon will basically lose its effect. So uh, definitely don't make sure to uh, max your element research accordingly to the weapon you have to not overstand your skill points. And as you can see, you can check all of the bonuses for each weapon uh, which comes from each dungeon. You can see which dungeon it comes from on the left side of the menu. Uh, usually, uh, the more PvP focused ones will be the Elite Marsh weapons because uh, these usually include uh, various buffs for Arena and Roll Arena like receiving more damage or taking less damage, stuff like that. Uh, the second best will probably be the seal weapons because these are uh, increase your monster stats and once all of your uh, skills are maximized, uh, these earlier weapons will become a little bit worse. I would say they, are, they will still be very, very usable and I personally don't plan on discarding any of them either. Uh, Mainly because, first of all, the seal weapons are extremely uh, expensive and you will need multiple weeks uh, to even get close to uh, getting the maxed ones. Uh, they definitely won't come in a few days. I'd say if you are not refreshing any entries, you will probably be able to afford this weapon like every two or three months just from the free stuff that you get. So keep that in mind that uh these some of these are expensive uh the earlier dungeon versions are definitely not as expensive as you can see i have a uh, multiple uh, weapons from uh i believe it's uh what's it called the meters dungeon which we will review in a second so i have three of those uh some of them are still five star uh, a lot of my accessories are from foggy prison for example i think this one this one and this one all come from foggy prison so uh the earlier elite dungeons do still have a lot of use uh but the further you go the easier it will be upgrade and the stats will get better on them so in general uh, i'm gonna cover all of the raids that you see here so first of all starting with elite hill and butterfly tomb these are a tiny bit different from the elite raids uh when you queue up for this raid uh you will actually not uh, even go to a lobby as with any elite raid it will simply match you with uh, two random users that uh, join the raid as well. If the game does not find any other people within 60 seconds, uh, it will jump uh, you into a raid by yourself or only with one other person who was queuing up at the time. Uh, but just because these raids are extremely easy, you should not be worried about uh, going solo. This one you should be able to solo regardless and I'll make an example. Uh, for the dungeon and how it works. The butterfly tomb you might have some uh, trouble if you are just starting out but by the time you complete the story you should probably have a strong enough monsters where you can uh, solo the butterfly tomb as well. But as long as you get at least a few people uh, with you you definitely will not have any trouble if you see a person who is like level 60 or above enter a dungeon with you. Uh, trust me. Well, well that was great timing. Okay, why can you not match me? Yeah, so if you see like someone who is higher level at like level 60 or above, trust me, you will be able to complete the dungeon in probably seconds. Uh, the bad thing about these two dungeons is that the rewards you get aren't that great. Uh, the equipment you get from here, you will definitely not use ever. So you can insta sell it whenever you get it. Uh, the equipment from the butterfly tomb uh, is four star equipment. so. For that one, I would say you will use it for like the first few days of your gameplay. Uh, but well, as you can see, uh, we have a level 16 guy, so he won't really do damage. But if you want to see the damage I do, uh, yeah, the rage just dies in two seconds. It's really not a problem. Uh, and the gear you get from the butterfly tomb uh, will not be used that much. I would say you can use it for like the first two, three days, but after that, uh, you should be able to move into farming the Path of Growth in the Subjugation. So, uh, Path of Growth, as soon as you unlock it, Subjugation. Choose one of the dungeons, it doesn't matter which one, just see which element uh, you have monsters uh, that can counter the dungeon monsters. For example, if you have a lot of good wind units, 
uh, progress in the Ruins Ruler. If you have a lot of good fire units, choose the Nightcaller and try to progress uh, to level 10 as soon as possible because here you will be getting a uh, 5 star equipment and it will easily out uh, face the 4 star equipment you get from the uh, Farfalla raids or like this little butterfly room. The, the monster is called Farfalla. Uh, the, the main thing you really want to get from these raids are the breath of flies, the few that you get, as well as if you see this little gift icon, every four times you complete the raid, you will be able to claim a mystical scroll. So this is pretty much the main reward you are playing uh, these subjugations for, not not subjugation, these are uh, lower level raids for. And yeah, now we'll jump into the elite raids. I'll give uh, some strategies as well as examples of how the runs look and how to pretty much complete each run uh, pretty easily. Okay, so for Foggy Prison, uh, by now this raid isn't that difficult for me, so I will sort of go semi auto into it. I will just pick a pretty good unit for it, but I won't really strategize too much on my end. However, I will explain the strategy that you need to do in the dungeon. Uh, so in this raid, uh, you will actually see two bosses instead of one and they are sort of counterparts to each other and uh, the main strategy behind this dungeon that if one of them uh, dies, the second one will basically become a stronger version of himself and will be a little bit difficult to deal with. Uh, however, there is a workaround this and what you can do is actually kill them both sort of uh, equally and for example if you kill one and leave the other boss at like 5% HP uh, whenever he merges with the previous boss uh, you will quickly be able to just finish him up in a few seconds and that way you do not have to deal with the buffed phase from each of them. Uh, the bosses themselves are called uh, Vita and Tao Usually the strategy is to kill Vita first because uh, one of the bosses attacks a skill with attack speed and the other one scales with defense I believe. So uh, Vita is the more dangerous one, at least it's considered the more dangerous one uh, when you're beginning the game. So I would recommend uh, killing Vita first. Uh, the Vita will be standing on the left side when you enter the dungeon so uh, it is recommended to go through the left side path uh, towards it. Uh, so yeah, the usual strategy when you have good people in your team is to kill one of them as fast as possible and finish off the second one because people who are a bit more advanced in the game, uh, they usually don't take that much damage from these bosses even if they are merged already. Uh, if you are having trouble uh, or you have a weaker party, I do recommend uh, trying to split the damage equally between them so you have an easier time finishing off uh, one of the bosses later on. Uh, but yeah, the bosses will use a lot of AoE attacks, uh, they do have strips, they do have defense breaks, uh, they do have a lot of stuns, so keep that in mind. There will be a special attack uh, that you have to dodge. Uh, I'm not sure if I will be able to showcase it here because uh, I don't know how good the party will be. But uh, if I do find it, uh, I'll quickly explain it here right now, but if I do find it, I'll comment on it later on as well. Uh, after some time, if you do not kill them fast enough, uh, all of your, so basically you, your mobs, as well as all of your teammates will be pushed, pushed uh, towards the center. And uh, both of the bosses will engage with a sort of a, a line, a cylinder, hard to say. The sort of area where they will uh, do a long dash and whenever you see that dash uh, the best thing you have to do is to actually just uh, dash out of it because if you do stay in the dash uh, the damage they do is quite significant and uh, even especially with weaker units there is a very good chance that you will get completely wiped so yeah let's jump into a run and we'll see how it goes i'll talk about the rewards later on as well so first, let me quickly set up a good team. Uh, I usually like to bring shields into this. I don't go too hard on the damage because uh, first of all, since there are two bosses, it will be hard to uh, sort of buff everyone at once as we do have to walk a lot as well as some people might attack a different boss. 
Uh, that depends on how they see the dungeon and how they prefer to do it. So I'll turn these two off. And yeah, uh, as you can see, two bosses. Uh, the left one is Vita and the right one is Tau. So uh, I usually just like to select this guy. Uh, we get teleported into the dungeon the moment uh, one of the people go in. And basically, you're trying to hit them. I'll actually turn on the targeting screen so you can see the HP of both of them. I usually go uh, order into it, but for content, I will go manual and explain as we go. I think we enter with a bit of a uh, weaker party, so... Well, not maybe weaker, but uh, we just have a pretty bad setup for it. So, I think we will have a chance to see those uh, special attacks. Yeah, there we go, uh, as you can see. Yeah, uh, I got... Wow, the timing was so bad. Yeah, so we got uh, completely destroyed by the attack, basically. And as you can see, even with my stronger units, uh, the damage that some of my monsters receive is significant from that charge. So I do recommend dodging it. Also, you might see that I personally did not take any healers into this team. Uh, but for you, I do recommend it. Uh, for me, I found that my Bastet is already high enough level where she can sustain the whole damage with just a shield but i know that even when i was like 350,000 power i did struggle uh with there we go that's another charged attack unfortunately my units got stunned so they did get hit and as you can see uh remember my bastet is sitting at like 75,000 hp and uh pretty much all of her hp got completely destroyed so yeah this attack is instinctively scary even if you are uh, further into the game so yeah we're just gonna finish this one uh, uh, looks like we split the damage pretty evenly so the last boss will be a little easier to deal with uh, however i will focus on this one if possible as i do not want to actually no it looks like we're focusing on it it's also a good thing to just follow your teammates sometimes because uh you may not have a certain buff, for example, or you may not have a certain debuff, like a defense break, for example. It looks like we're sort of doing this buff perfectly, like the perfect uh, beginning strategy. So yeah, as you can see, uh, now the boss merged, but uh, we sort of timed it perfectly and we left uh, the other boss at 5% HP. Uh, now this boss becomes stronger, but because he's extremely low HP, we instantly finish it and yeah. That's about it for the dungeon. Uh, for the rewards, as you can see, I got support rewards. So the support rewards include 20 tokens. Uh, the item is optional, but most of the time you will get at least one support item from this. Uh, the regular rewards include all of the rewards that you can see uh, in the raid menu right here. So you will get one of the items. You will not get two or more. You will never get two or more. So you will get uh, one of the... Uh, summoner items and one item is guaranteed always uh, you will get a decent chunk of coins i would say somewhere between 50 to maybe 120 or something like that uh, you will get usually quite a few vita hound horn shards and the rest of the crafting materials are pretty rare but usually you will get at least one in like three weekly runs that you get the support rewards as you can see uh, i already claimed but it will be Usually the Vita Town Horn Shard, uh, the 20 coins are guaranteed. Sometimes you can actually get a full weapon as well, so doing support runs is advised as, as long as you have enough time to complete all the other daily stuff with it. And the coins will be spent in the uh, Foggy Prison uh, coin shop, which I will cover at the end of the raid segment. So yeah, for Foggy Prison, that is about it and we'll move on. Okay, and now uh, we'll talk about the Elite White Shadow Castle. Uh, personally, this is my favorite dungeon to do because uh, it really does involve that much strategy. And as long as you can do a lot of damage, it actually becomes easier than if it was if you do not do enough damage. Because there is sort of a cheat code uh, to skip one of the most hardest phases for this dungeon. Uh, and if you do have enough damage, you will skip it and the dungeon will become that much easier. So the general strategy behind this dungeon is once you enter the dungeon, there will be a boss uh, sitting at the end of a staircase basically. And uh, you together with two other party members will have to, uh, well, 
I think that's pretty self-explanatory that I just get the boss down to zero. There will only be one boss, no longer two bosses like in the Foggy Prison. And uh, the main culprit of this dungeon being hard is the, uh, first of all, the attacks he does. So uh, I would recommend getting familiar with the attacks and how they work, because if you do not, not only will you be screwing yourself over, uh, your teammates will have a very difficult time killing the boss, especially this is especially important for people who are playing Cleave because in some cases uh, if you do bad attack placement from the boss you actually have a chance to not be able to attack the boss at all and that will screw over the run a lot. This doesn't mean you will lose but you will uh, have to deal with a more difficult phase as well as just waste more time for everyone. So. First thing you should do, uh, learn the attack patterns that I will explain in a second when we are in a run. Uh, the second thing you have to note is uh, the boss will usually uh, have a fixed attack pattern and I will quickly go over the pattern once we are in the run as well. Uh, the main uh, sort of sub attack that he has is he will place a, an arm of his into the ground and uh, your goal is to kill that arm in around 15 seconds or so. If you do not that kill that uh, arm, you will basically lose the run because he will do an ultimate attack which does an uh, insane amount of damage and I think it might, it could wipe even my team by this point. So uh, yeah, I don't recommend uh, getting wiped that eye arm or uh, the best thing that you actually do can do is just not getting that arm summoned at all by doing enough damage. But uh, it's hard to say whether you will be able to achieve that. So to enter this dungeon, uh, I forgot to mention this with the fog in prism. But uh, in general, uh, when you are going into these harder dungeons like elite, uh, elite raids, uh, seal, and stuff like that, do try to hit the power limit uh, required for the dungeon. Because if you do not, uh, there is a very good chance that if first of all, if you're not the leader, uh, you will simply be kicked. Uh, if you are the leader, you will have a very hard time finding the battles because no one wants to raid with a person who is clearly at a disadvantage. So for Foggy Prison, uh, the power limit is 225,000 power. Uh, for uh, the Elite Shadow Castle, uh, the limit is around 290, I think. Yeah, 290,000 power. Don't be scared by this number. It's not that hard to hit once you get... Uh, uh, some familiar with how uh, summoner power works. So yeah, for this dungeon, uh, we'll go in and I'll try to explain a bit more about how all of the attacks work. So as you can see, uh, if you join with that, if you get lower enough, uh, what's it called, uh, power, you actually get a penalty. Not only it's neutral, but you actually get a penalty. So no hate towards this person but uh, you are simply not ready for this dungeon not the way that is intended to be beaten at least so we'll wait for two more people and uh, while we wait i'll quickly explain what's needed for the dungeon so for here uh, the most important thing is to first uh, get attack buff so we currently don't have attack buffer yet and it looks like yeah uh, we have shannon for attack buff so we have that covered and the second most important thing is to get defense buff or rather defense break or uh, damage taken up. Not or, but end damage taken up. But you could technically work without damage taken up. Uh, however, it will help you with the damage a lot. So now uh, you will see that the boss will do two of these circle attacks. I don't know. Okay, so yeah. See, the problem exactly what I was speaking about. Uh, the person doesn't know how to uh, manage boss's attacks and he screws over us because now the boss's attacks cover the whole pretty much attacking field and we have we don't have a good ability to uh, manage boss's attacks. Yeah, so this is a bad example of how to do things. Uh, if you don't feel confident in, yeah, this is a loss just because the person simply doesn't know how to manage attacks. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame, but it's a good example of what not to do. Uh, you saw those circle attacks that the boss shoots. Uh, if you do not know how to deal with those attacks, I would recommend letting a person enter first. And if you see that the person is higher power or just has better monsters, they will usually know how to deal with these uh, circle attacks. 
to explain it better i'll actually enter into a raid myself and first of all i will not beat the raid but i will explain how to manage these attacks uh, for you okay so i'm gonna explain how the attacks work uh I'm gonna enter solo, I don't intend to win this run, I just wanna uh, show you how the first phase works. So once you enter the dungeon, uh, there will be a line uh, that when you cross it, uh, the dungeon will start. So let's quickly go over here, I will turn these off so they don't distract me. Okay, and uh, once you cross this line, uh, the dungeon will officially start. Uh, but the boss will not start attacking you just yet. Uh, the boss will start attacking you once you cross uh, this little line that I'm pointing at right here. And the first person that crosses the line will be the one that's bit getting targeted by the little circle attacks. Uh, if you are uh, not confident in managing those circle attacks, I would recommend letting someone go first. But after this, watching this video, you will understand that managing those are really simple and you should definitely not be scared to do so. Okay, so when I uh, cross that line, uh, the boss will start uh, shooting uh, two circle attacks. So he will shoot one and he will shoot the second one a few seconds later. Then uh, he will do four attacks in this order. So first of all, he will choose one of the sides and he will launch an attack that uh, spans across the whole arena basically uh, into a certain width. Uh, then uh, he will switch to the other side and so for example, if he shoots the first uh, sort of uh, cylinder here, it will cover like half of the arena. Then uh, he will uh, shoot another one right here, uh, another one next to it, and the last one by the edge. So let's go in and I'll explain it a bit further. So uh, once you cross this line, uh, he shoots first attack, you should avoid these at all time. He shoots the second one and once he shot uh, both of these, he will shoot uh, this attack. I don't know how to call it actually. And he will shoot one there, he will shoot the further one there. Oh, it's actually just two attacks, I, I, I thought for some reason it was three. And if you do not do enough damage, he will shoot a circle attack here, and then he will plant an arm into the uh, one side of the arena, and it will be the opposite side of where he shot that a big attack. Here's what both the circles and those uh, little cylinders do. So for the circles, whenever you are staying in the circle, every second you stay in there, you will receive a, a think level 2 bleed effect for each time uh, it takes. So do not stand in there. However, uh, if you do not stand there and monsters do end up in there, it's not the worst thing. However, it's still not recommended. Uh, if you as a summoner stand in that circle, every time you receive bleed, you will also be losing mana. So. You will lose one mana every time you stand in there, every tick, so it's like every half a second or every second you will start losing mana, so you will not be able to use any abilities with your soul link unit, so I do not recommend standing there. As for those wide, uh, I don't know what they call it, cylinder attacks, uh, every time you stand, similar to uh, how bleed works, every second around or something like that, you stand in those. Uh, you will receive a level 2 attack buff break and level 2 defense break so not only will that increase the damage uh, the enemy deals uh, it will also significantly decrease the damage you deal uh, meaning that you will have a way harder time beating the dungeon and if you're going for that uh, no arm run uh, you will also have a very difficult time uh, doing the dungeon fast so Let's hope uh, for the second time we are able to find a good party. Um, I'm not gonna uh, raid with anyone who doesn't meet the power limit, so I will search for a different one. And yeah, just honestly, like if you do not meet the power limit, I do not recommend going into the public parties at least. You can try with friends, but keep in mind the public including me of course uh the public is pretty harsh as far as these uh power limits go and we will usually just uh remove you from the party if you do not need it uh for the team of course i currently have uh, two damage dealers and a sort of premium raid buffer you can call so we're still missing attack buff and defense break for it 
So we're gonna wait. Uh, I will speed this up if uh, it takes quite a long time to find the party and I'll get back to you once the raid starts. There we go and we have a good team. It looks like we have a tag buff. We have multiple defense breakers and uh, I hope we have uh, people who will either let me manage the circles or know how to manage them themselves. I'll try to go in the front so I could take care of the circles myself. Okay, so uh, basically with the circles when it starts attacking you want to get them uh, away from the boss because for cliff users this will be extremely difficult to deal with otherwise. For uh, ranged uh, summoners it will be a little easier but it's still annoying to deal with especially if it's too close to the boss. And as you can see by the time uh, the boss was ready to shoot his arm we did enough damage uh, and we actually completely skipped uh, the arm phase. When you skip the arm phase as you can see the boss is extremely easy because you simply just unload all of your abilities on it and do uh, damage to kill it. Uh, the damage needed uh, to skip the arm phase is by the time he finishes his first uh, cycle of attacks. So uh, this includes uh, the first two circles, uh, then those three cylinders that he shoots and uh, the preparation for the arm. If by that time you deal around 30% uh, of his total HP as damage, uh, he will actually completely skip the arm phase and you will have a way way easier time dealing uh, with the rest of the uh, run. If you do not manage it, do not worry, uh, because the arm is still pretty doable and uh, for a lot of weaker folks you will be uh, having to do the arm phase eventually because you might just not have the damage yet. Uh, however, it's nothing to be feared of uh, as long as all of you uh, start attacking the arm as soon as it appears and have uh, good buffs as well as debuffs and most importantly defense break uh, to allow a lot of damage on that arm, uh, you will be pretty successfully. And once you hit the arm uh, down, uh, you simply go back to attacking the boss and pretty much that's how you win the run. However, keep in mind that if you do a lower amount of damage, after you beat the arm, uh, the boss will start repeating the same attack patterns uh, as he did at first. So he will start shooting those uh, extremely deadly circles that drain your mana and this time he will also start targeting different people. So he might shoot one at you, he might shoot one at uh, another person after it. He will not target the same person usually, so be careful of that. And whenever you see that the boss is shooting circles at you, I do recommend going dashing back away from the boss so that if he shoots follow-up circles, uh, he does not land a lot of them next to the boss because after he does, uh, you will have a hard time managing uh, the damage on the boss and the run will simply take a bit too long. And yeah, I think that's a pretty good cover as far as White Shadow Castle goes. If you do have any questions about it, you can even check a special video that I've done on White Shadow Castle release. I'm not sure if I mentioned more or less details for this one. I did want to make it fresh because uh, a lot has uh, changed as far as how we do dungeons. So that automation might be outdated, but you can check it out. And yeah, uh, we'll move to the next raid right now. Okay, and now we're getting into a bit of a harder dungeons. Uh, these will require quite a bit of strategizing compared to the previous two, so uh, listen carefully. In this guide, I will only be explaining the basic strategy behind this run. Uh, I already did a more detailed overview of it uh, in a separate video where I explain every single phase, how it works. Well, I'll touch on phases here as well, but uh, for stuff like attacks and how they work, what they do, uh, well, I have already made a video on that, so check the description or the comments, I'm not, I'm not sure where I'm linking all of those videos, uh, so you will see a more detailed uh, Boiling Waterfall guide. But for the general idea for this raid, uh, first of all to enter uh, with power, with the power bonus you will need 350,600 uh, power. And for this raid, uh, the general idea is uh, there will be a little dragon in the middle and your goal is to kill that dragon to 0 HP, but he will be doing several different phases uh, and you will need to manage those phases pretty well. So uh, the general strategy behind the teams that you need to bring is 
first of all, uh, you will need quite a bit of damage because very similarly to the previous uh, raid, so the, uh, what's it called, uh, White Shadow Castle, uh, there will be a DPS check and uh, if you do not do uh, a specified amount of damage in a short period of time, I think it's like 15 or 20 seconds, uh, the boss will use an ultimate attack and completely wipe everyone, so that means you must uh, have some damage in your team. I usually go for a bit of a safer team because for this dungeon I have trouble uh, with uh, teammates and their buffs usually, so I go for something like this. I go uh, a buffer for shields and attack buff, a crowa as my uh, OP support unit, and uh, this guy for damage, and trust me, uh, if you have decent damage dealers, uh, you can bring one damage dealer each and you will be able to pretty easily pass uh, the damage uh, phase that is required uh, every once in a while. Uh, as long as you have uh, attack bar cover your team and a defense break on your team, it will definitely not be uh, troublesome. The basic idea behind this dungeon is, uh, first of all, you will need attack bar for the damage buff. Uh, you will need uh, quite a few damage dealers, so I would say three minimum, so one each, or you can go one person goes full support and another person goes like two or three damage. Uh, however you manage to do it, uh, do it like that. If you're in solo queue, I recommend having uh, one damage dealer and uh, at least one uh, support option. I personally run two support options, but uh, both of my supports are sort of geared towards the offensive side. Uh, because she uh, buffs up attack, uh, he buffs up attack speed and crit rate, and he also gets an effect where he increases uh, crit damage taken. So yeah, quickly gonna go over how the boss works. Uh, so first of all, when you enter the dungeon, uh, you know what? Uh, let's just jump into the game actually, and I'll explain it there better. There we go, so this is the run we did a few days ago with a few of my guildies, so shout out to these beautiful people. Uh, the general idea behind the team is you do want to bring uh, at least an attack buff or two. You want at least three damage targets, I have said. So as you can see, uh, we have uh, two attack buff buffers, so two bastards. Uh, we have more than enough uh, damage layers, so I got a current bit. Uh, so we got her summoner. Also, I would say count Orbias as damage dealers because they're usually uh, built mostly for damage. So. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So yeah, like we have more than enough damage. Uh, do bring some healing. So right here we brought one heal. I think in this run I had a bit of trouble with healing, but even then it's sort of beatable. So don't worry if you're playing with weaker players or anything like that, or if your teams aren't perfect, uh, you will probably still manage. Uh, the example will probably not be the best because I did struggle with healing, but so like it will not show you a perfect run, but yeah, you will need some healing and basically we can go into this. Oh, one thing, uh, for this dungeon it's extremely important to have uh, defense breaks readily available because uh, when the boss enters that uh, phase where you have to do damage, he cleanses all of the debuffs, uh, meaning that you will have to quickly apply the defense break, at least the defense break on him, and uh, that way you'll be able to do uh, a lot of damage in that phase. So let's jump into the run. And yeah, once the run starts, all of you will be spawned here. And uh, the dungeon will officially start when you cross this line. So once you can see, uh, once one of them enters, uh, the fire will start. With this phase, uh, the very first phase, uh, I'm gonna stop it right here. The boss will shoot out these permanent lasting uh, fire circles. It looks like I don't see many in my vision apart from one right here in the corner. Uh, these circles will be forever on fire until the dungeon ends and you should avoid them at any uh, cost. And basically, uh, if you see that there is a circle being shot either at you or behind you, uh, you should dodge because uh, as you can see right here, when the boss does that attack, you will get uh, this thing called uh, fear. I think it's fear. Uh, meaning that even if you control your summoner, uh, you will uh, involuntarily be running away from the boss. And if the circle is uh, launched behind you, you will get into the circle, attack will hit you, and yeah, you'll need uh, quite a bit of healing to recover from that. 
luckily there wasn't one right here, so as I said, I won't explain too much on what each attack does. I'll just skip to the first phase that's important, so uh, you have a phase where you do a little bit of damage and uh, the boss, first of all, uh, the boss will raise, uh, like will fly up. Uh, you will see this circle, uh, do not be worried because this circle pretty much does no damage. Uh, what it does is it gives you heal blocks, so if you have a healer that can cleanse uh, debuffs, uh, you will have an easy time. If you have a healer that does not, like Konamiya in our case, uh, I do recommend trying to dodge the circle, however it will be pretty hard, I usually just get hit by it, and a lot of stronger people will usually just get hit by it. Uh, I mean, that heal block will uh, expire, and yeah, right here, as you saw, uh, the boss had plenty of debuffs, and uh, that's, uh, this is where his first uh, damage phase starts, and during the damage phase, he cleanses all of the debuffs, and right here, oh wow, like, we're so OP that we didn't even have, yeah, so he started the phase, and in half a second, we managed to kill it, uh, but yeah, maybe the second one will be shown. Uh, so yeah, this phase, we managed to kill it in half a second, so you didn't even see it. But after you kill uh, through that phase, uh, the boss will drop on the ground and you will have a few seconds to do uh, damage to him. After that, uh, the boss will fly up and this is where the minion phase starts. So uh, you see these three uh, little altars. So there's one there, one on the right side, one on the left side. Uh, the general strategy is to you have to protect at least two of them uh, to successfully finish the run. So uh, if you are capable of managing a one by yourself, uh, do split up one person into each altar. If uh, you are running with weaker players, or maybe you are the weaker player, uh, you will need to uh, split up a bit differently. So uh, you will need to let one player clear one altar and other two players can focus on another and just let the third one die. You will still pass the run as long as you uh, defeat all of the minions that are coming at it. And yeah, uh, your goal is to protect these altars. Uh, minions will start spawning in the middle and they will slowly start walking towards it. Once they're next to it, they will start attacking the altar and your goal is to basically prevent uh, damage from being taken because once the altar is defeated, uh, you lost one, and if you lose two, you will instantly lose the run. So yeah, for this one, uh, we of course, uh, we already all know how to manage the dungeon, so uh, we just simply go for uh, one altar each. Uh, the strategy on how to kill them is, uh, those minions will have a huge shield, and you have to either CC them, I think I already talked about this, I mean, I'm making this review like a few days after I talked about the gems in general, so I don't even remember what I talked about then. Uh, but yeah, uh, for the dungeon, you will uh, have a few ways to do it. So first of all, probably the most uh, easiest way is by just applying CC effects to the minions. So provokes, stuns, knockups, freeze, uh, whatever, whatever. And the second way is to use units that ignore uh, beneficial effects. This is how I do it. I put my team with uh, one healer and two units that ignore those effects and I don't even bother about uh, using those CC effects. My wind cleave does have two CC effects so it helps but usually most da my damage dealers will just simply be able to pass through them and as you can see uh, once the shield is down uh, the monsters will have uh, regular HP with the shield, they will have this huge shield, and you will see that if I manage to apply a single CC to any of the next ones, uh, I will manage to kill it. But even then, like Unbitten Cassie manages to just go through that. It looks like I'm not applying much CC, but also my team isn't built for CC. So yeah, I'll try to catch when I manage to get CC, if I manage to get it at all. Yeah, I did. It looks like my, my Cassie and Kambi just carried. So yeah, uh, once all three of you are protected the tower, or if one tower dies, at least two towers. So it looks like that tower is safe, this tower is safe. I'm not sure if that tower remains safe. Yeah, it looks like I'm just waiting. Oh uh, yeah, that tower died, but even then, if the tower dies uh, and all of the minions have been cleared, uh, the player who lost the tower can simply just quickly uh, hide under the shield 
and you must hide under the shield for this attack because the attack will kill if you're not so yeah oh yeah i remember this we just uh had a little oopsie but basically she just came over uh to this shield and we all protect from the attack and then uh, the boss will land, if there is an altar broken, he'll usually not even land in the middle, he'll go next to the altar, I, I don't know why, uh, but yeah, that happens, and basically he'll start repeating attacks, this is that heal block attack from previously, uh, he will have another phase where he, yeah, there we go, that's a better setup, uh, this phase, uh, so basically in this phase, this is sort of, he gains a shield that is similar to how uh, white shadow castle worked and the shield reduces damage by 99 percent and if you do enough damage the shield will drop uh, this time at least we're able to showcase it yeah you will see this timer because previously we beat it instantly so you couldn't even see it uh, but yeah if you beat uh the boss phase during this time i think we'll be pretty fast if i'm wrong or maybe we just lost some dps i'm not sure but yeah uh we dealt it in a half, half of the time and after that, the boss drops and the phase is pretty much a repeat until the boss is dead. And yeah, what you need to know is that if you get these burn effects, uh, your goal is to cleanse them as fast as possible because they cannot be cleansed with harmful effect in a mobile. Instead, they can only be cleansed once you get to full HP. And uh, yeah, if you stack a lot of them, uh, you will notice that if you're at like four or five stacks and there are no healers, uh, even units like Bastet will, uh, with her shields, will not be able to keep up and you will eventually lose that unit, which you can divide in the minion phase or just whatever. So yeah, be careful of the fires. If you see that you're stacking like level 2 or 3, try to back out, try to uh, manage your team a bit, uh, stay closer to the teammates, especially those who have healing. And if you are a teammate with the sole healer in your team, Please, I'm begging you, uh, spam that heal. Doesn't matter what other skill the unit has, spam the heal because uh, you will not have uh, any indication that uh, your allies' uh, units are low. And if you let uh, stuff like this happen, if you do not bring enough healing, and uh, yeah, so like you can see that uh, the problem with this, of course, is if you have the party menu turned on you will see the hp of the summoners but you will not see the hp of the units so even if you had that party menu open you would see the uh, that i am at full hp and you think like whoa that's cool uh looks like you're healthy but yeah my my units especially my cover is suffering here and i don't know if he survives this probably not uh, he survived like at the last seconds because of the shield as you can see the shield popped and he lost all of his hp in like what three seconds yeah so level 5 burn, 3 seconds goes to your full HP bar. So yeah, I think that about covers the dungeon. Uh, I don't think we need to show the rewards here, but yeah, uh, it was a support run as well. Uh, so yeah, we'll jump into the next one now. And now it's time to cover the hardest trade that's currently available in the game, and that is the Elite Twisted Marsh. This is the raid where you get a lot of your items if you're extremely focused on PvP, especially the arena and battlefield, because uh, the gear from this uh, dungeon will give a lot of buffs to various uh, PvP aspects, so like uh, reduce damage taken, increase damage taken, stuff like that. Also, this is the only place currently where you can get uh, these uh, specific vampire and despair rooms. So I'll uh, keep that in mind. Uh, the rest of the rewards are more crafting materials, coins as always, and just 5 star 4 awakening gear. And uh, the strategy behind this dungeon is uh, there will be this uh, monster called Kalia. Uh, she will have two phases. Uh, she has this Medusa phase. I think it's Medusa phase, I don't know. Uh, and then she has the snake phase where she usually hunts a specific unit or uh, tries to hit a unit that have been petrified. And basically, there will be a few phases in this, and they will be a little bit uh, more difficult to memorize. And uh, yeah, so if you're a first time runner, you might face some trouble, first of all, understanding how it works. But if you're watching this, uh, trust me, you will be uh, way better off uh, than uh, going in blindly. And we actually had uh, one person who was doing a, a blind run from this dungeon, so. Uh, without doing uh, much waiting, I'll actually jump into a run that we have recently did as well. So yeah, 
Uh, for this dungeon, yeah, we have uh, me, a cupcakes, and the woman I who I believe was doing this dungeon for the first time. At least that he told me he was doing it. Uh, and yeah, uh, so for the team building, first of all, uh, what you need to know is in this dungeon, if you are not advanced like very, very far into the game and know exactly how to do everything on a split second decision, do not bring attack buff and do not bring a uh, crit damage up buff. So no Bastets, no Galleons, no Shannons, no nothing like that. Uh, you can bring uh, buffs that increase uh, damage from other sources apart from attack. So for example, I brought my Krova who increases attack speed and uh, crit rate. Those buffs are, are more than okay, but if you are just starting out, do not bring attack buff into this because uh, the boss can steal your uh, buffs and if he attacks you with either attack buff or crit damage buff uh, you will well die um, it happened to me and I learned it the hard way I tried with both attack buff, I tried with crit damage buff I was sitting on 80% of HP and it quite literally one shot me so uh, yeah, be careful with those uh, other than that, for the uh, team building, I uh, would recommend uh, if you're going public party, bringing a healer each. So right here you can see we have a Lulu, we have a Shushu, and we have a Anavel. Uh, well, I think uh, the Wind Healer also heals a bit, right? Uh, so yeah, you will need those healers. You will need a minimum of two, but uh, it's better to bring three because that way each of uh, you can individually heal when needed and not rely on teammates a lot. Uh, the other thing you will need is a buff stripper because uh, the boss can can and will steal off one of your buffs. Usually if you are a cliff player, uh, the Kalia will steal your buffs because she steals uh, basically the closest person to her. Uh, because both of uh, Orbia and Kina are ranged, uh, the boss will usually be stolen from me, but that also allows me to showcase you what it's like to be on the receiving end, if you know what I mean. Uh, wink wink. So yeah, the person who is uh, getting their buff stolen, I would recommend uh, running either uh, the Light Howl over the Water one, or running the, uh, what's it called? Uh, Juno, the Fire Oracle, if you manage to get there. Uh, because the person who gets their buff stolen, uh, not only you will need healing, but you will need to cleanse multiple buffs, multiple debuffs from you. Uh, there will usually be like five or six of them, because you can imagine uh, she will transfer all of the debuffs that you put on her. So if your team puts a lot of various debuffs, uh, you will need to cleanse a lot of them, and usually. Uh, there are like multiple damage over time effects who will take like 30% of your HP every second. And uh, Shushu is amazing for that because she cleanses every single damage over time effect. And if she cleanses successfully, she also gives you immunity preventing for the damage over time effects. Or uh, there is an option to use Juno who also cleanses every single harmful effect on a specific monster, allowing you to just uh, stay safer in battle. And apart from that, uh, of course, you will need some defense breaks. So we have an Argen, we have, I think, uh, she'll switch to Wind Orbia. Uh, we have Annabelle for some defense break. And a little bit of damage to make the dungeon faster because it does get uh, those uh, time buffs quite early on. And after she gets those, uh, the dungeon will get significantly harder. So yeah, uh, we'll go into the run. I think the run went pretty smoothly. So yeah. Uh, we're going to the dungeon. Basically, the first phase, I'll quickly explain on how it works. Uh, the boss will, uh, first of all, do the circle attack. So, I'll show you it right here. Yeah, she transferred some buffs to me. And we do some damage. There will be the circle attack. Uh, it will knock you back and deal a damage over time. Usually, it gives bleed effect. Uh, you can either dodge it, so you can go outside the circle and run back inside uh, right after. Or, I personally am uh, not scared of this attack really, because it doesn't do that much damage, it only does uh, some damage over time. You can just straight up uh, get hit by it, but as soon as you get hit, uh, if your monsters are on whistle, and they should be on whistle, 
uh, move a little bit so that they are not standing there and instead uh, move next to you. So as you can see, I just move a bit. All of them will regroup to me. She will shoot those uh, three times and uh, that'll be it. Right after that, once you see these little uh, arcs, either the red one or the purple one, this means she will do an attack that does 66% of your uh, HP as fixed damage, doesn't matter your defense, how, how much HP you have. For those, uh, have your healer prepared and as soon as she hits, uh, do try to heal up as soon as possible. So as you can see, I at this point I have already tried to uh, get my healing on point that I heal like the second that the attack happens. And yeah, after this, uh, you, as you can see, yeah, yeah, this is the perfect example. Uh, you will see that she stole my debuffs and she gave her debuffs to me. Look at all these debuffs. Look. Uh, the damage I get, uh, level 2 bleed, level 2 poison. Uh, I have damage taken up, defense break. Uh, it's doing a lot of damage from various sources. That's where Shushu comes in. She cleansed uh, both of those damage over time effects and gave me immunity. The defense break usually isn't a problem, so you will not have any trouble dealing with those. Uh, then these will be the snakes. I won't cover them much. You can check the detailed custom march guide uh, in the description as well, or the uh, comment. I don't know where I'll put it. Uh, your goal is to dodge uh, the snakes with the summoner, because if you get hit three times, uh, you instantly lose the run. So be careful. And going further, uh, the same thing will happen. She will do more of those. Uh, Attack, so she'll launch another attack. You have to heal instantly after. And the sex, second attack uh, will be this Forbidden Spell. During the Forbidden Spell attack, uh, all three of you will have to stack into a group as closely. Each, like, all of you have to stay as close as possible, if possible, in one stack. Uh, because she will do a huge knockback, as you can see, we're just staying in a stack. And if you get spread around too much, uh, she will only target one of your monsters, for example. Uh, that monster will usually not be a healer and you'll be getting hit for a lot of damage and most likely die. Uh, if you're all in a stack, uh, she will hit all of the monsters at once. That way you are able to follow up with the heal and uh, go to the next phase more easily. So uh, the attack went pretty smoothly here. You'll see that uh, she'll start the circle attack. Once this starts, all of you have to be in the circle. Do not go outside because the more people in the circle, the less damage you take. If you leave one person in the circle, especially if he's not a cliff player, they will die. So yeah, as you can see, all of us uh, are in the circle, basically. Once she hits you like that, uh, all of the monsters that were hit will revive and you will need to just heal up right after. And then the next phase starts. Uh, she goes back to her human form, uses a few of these circle attacks. Then the third major uh, phase will be where Kalia disappears and she goes into any of these three rooms. So you can see there's one room here, one there, and one behind me. Uh, the easy way to manage this one is to stand in a circle and have two rooms in your vision. If you see that she's not appearing in any of the two rooms, uh, you quickly go to the middle. So you can see she doesn't appear in either of those. You walk to the forward. And yeah, this will actually show you how it works if she does hit you. So yeah, she was right there, and this player will get hit. And if you get hit by it, uh, she will convert back to the snake and will do the same thing that she did previously with attacking those uh, stone targets. So basically, if she attacks you, yeah, if she attacks you, you simply stand in the circle, get hit by it. Oh, my game's lagging again. There we go. So yeah, she converts to phase. Uh, so like it's not game over if you get hit, but it will delay the run a lot. So yeah, I stand in a circle, uh, those will wake up, you heal up and start running once again. So yeah, it's a bit of an inconvenience, but it's nothing special. And yeah, uh, you basically attack as per usual, uh, wait for the second phase to appear. Uh, this will be a bit of an annoying phase, so she will start uh, launching snakes, but she will also have these uh, pulls, and these pulls will give you a slowness effect that lasts for a long time, so don't stand in them for too long because you'll have trouble dodging these snakes. And uh, she'll keep launching snakes, so basically you have to dodge uh, these snakes and not get hit by three of the, or more of them at once as well. But after this, uh, just regular phases once again. And at 25%, she 
Oh, it looks like at 27% at this time. Uh, she will first of all launch these pulls, but this time she will not uh, go for snakes and instead launch that 66% damage attack. Uh, so you have to heal right after and this is why I recommend having a healer each because as you can see that person would not be able to be healed by us. And uh, if he didn't have uh, a heal there, there is a good chance he wouldn't even make it to us because uh, first of all this entry is very blocked right here and it's hard to make it as well as the boss will use the circle attacks which will make it a bit harder to follow up right after to us. You can see we're just left standing there without the ability to do anything. And yeah, uh, once below like 30% HP, uh, she will do the same attacks pretty much like blood pool, uh, the circle attack, that 66% attack. It's just that she will do it way more often and she will instead, instead of doing it from the middle, she will start following you. So yeah, as you can see, did a circle, did another circle. So do save up mana for this one because you need it for healing. So yeah, there was a circle, there was the 66% damage, you quickly heal after, but even then you will start running out of heals if you're especially low on mana. And uh, all the way until the end, that's pretty much the same thing that happens. You can see she just hunts you, hunts you, hunts you, and that's pretty much victory. So yeah, uh, what to remember, uh, check this video first of all, and check the uh, previous uh, March video that I've done, if you want an even more detailed breakdown of all of the attacks. Uh, second of all, don't bring attack buff or the damage taken up buffs. And third of all, uh, just make sure to build your teams uh, accordingly to the uh, little guidance that I provide us, like enough heals, enough uh, strips, enough defense base and stuff like that to succeed in it. So yeah, uh, that about it. Uh, for the raids and we'll move on to the next content Okay, so now a short introduction to uh, arena. I will cover uh, challenge arena and brawl arena as well as some extras about the arena later on uh, For now, let's jump into the challenge arena and actually before we do uh, what you need to know uh, about these arenas is the difference is that challenge arena is a PvP mode. However, uh, you are fighting against uh, a computer uh, controlled enemy so these are real, real players with real monsters and real defenses however uh, they aren't the ones controlling the team it's just AI actually uh, doing all of the fighting so uh, generally of course it's easier to win in the challenge arena because uh, you do have a working brain on top of uh, just having a team fight against the team so uh, for that, you can strategize a bit more easier and have a bit of an easier time building the teams. Uh, but still, uh, it can sometimes prove to be quite difficult. So I will go over all of the aspects about uh, the arena and even some suggestions on how to fight efficiently. So yeah, we'll break down uh, all of the content in just a second. Okay, so first of all, uh, a bit about team building. So. To successfully fight an arena, uh, you will be fighting a summoner and uh, three of their monsters and you are bringing your summoner as well as up to three monsters as well. You can also of course uh, go into the battle with less amount of monsters but if you wanna win you should bring all three. Uh, for team building, uh, keep in mind that the monsters you use here will uh, stay and uh, basically even if you derune them, uh, make sure that whenever you fight an arena you uh, still have uh, monsters with all of those runes because as you can see uh, my team uh, currently has all of the runes but and yeah to compare it you can see that they're sitting at 494,000 power uh, if I derune one of them so if I uh, remove the runes keep in mind that these runes get removed and the monster stays so uh, before fighting make sure that all of your monsters do have uh, runes equipped uh, second of all keep in mind that uh, you can change uh, these units at any time because uh, if you are doing some resetting from the units, for example, if you plan on destroying them, uh, you will not be able to destroy your units if they are uh, currently uh, used in the challenge arena. And even if you're not fighting actively right now, uh, if the previous team you have used uh, contains a unit from uh, arena basically you will not be able to destroy it so before you are able to destroy a unit uh, you must first take them out uh, you 
basically remove it uh, you go out and each time you modify your team uh, in some way uh, this does not include the runes it only includes uh, changing the monsters uh, you have to uh, save it uh, by either exiting or doing one fight it also saves after you do a fight and the general strategy for arena is usually to just uh, try to nuke the enemy as fast as possible and this is a bit different from the brawl arena because uh, in here it is a controlled environment as i like to call it and uh, you have more control over who attacks who however in arena keep in mind that your units uh or rather your monsters uh will also be sort of controlled like an ai and uh, you will not be able to control who they attack like you could in a uh, regular uh, gameplay for example so as you know there is uh, this targeting and whenever uh, monsters are on whistle they are, will simply follow you whenever you go uh, but if you switched uh, to the targeting option uh, if you, they started targeting someone uh, basically you could still walk away from the enemy and they would still hit the same enemy and with this targeting option uh, whichever enemy you hit all of your units will switch to that enemy uh, this is unfortunately not uh, a case in challenge arena because uh, in challenge arena you actually do not have any targeting options and uh, your units will attack whichever unit uh, they should attack based on their uh, monster typing so uh, I'm not sure if it will come earlier from this or later on I, I hope I put it earlier on uh, all units have a certain class and based on that class uh, they also attack a certain target first so as you can see knights will attack the nearest enemy warriors will attack uh, assassins and melee enemies first so uh, whichever units you pick uh, they will attack those so keep in mind uh, when building uh, the teams to attack a certain enemy that if an enemy has uh, for example a lot of assassins you may want to uh, prioritize building more warriors rather than for say uh, archers because assassins will attack archers and uh, basically the archers will not be able to get range away from assassins in those cases you may want to go for stuff like uh, knights or warriors uh, so yeah just work out the strategy behind each type and just as a showcase i'm not gonna try to win the battle i will just go in and show you that uh there is no targeting option and the only thing you can focus is a witcher summoner so uh your summoner you can control but even uh, you can notice that if i run away uh, all of the units that are fighting will fight by themselves and even if i don't fight uh basically the ai will fight for you so in a lot of cases as long as you overpower the enemy by a lot you will win but if you don't uh, you may be uh, facing a bit of a task uh, to win it especially if your units uh, do like to focus uh, pretty stupidly so yeah uh, always make sure to pay attention to the monster typings and uh, that way you will be able to work out uh, who your monsters will attack and that will allow you to win a lot okay now for the arena list itself uh i will show you one feature in a second but uh, the arena list will refresh uh for free every 30 minutes as long as you use this refresh list button as you can see currently i uh, refreshed the last time yesterday so the timer is already up uh, once you click refresh you will get 10 new enemies in the list and if you wish to refresh sooner you will have to pay 150 crystals so i don't recommend doing it unless it's like the last hours of arena and you are really looking forward to uh, raise your rank by uh, another one in a quick amount of time and uh currently there is this amazing feature in arena uh, called the quick battle uh the quick battle is an option uh, only for some uh, fights so for example for this fight uh i do not have the battle uh quick battle option because the quick battle option only appears uh if your total uh, team power is significantly higher than uh, the enemy's total power so for example uh with a team power of like 494,000, i can quick battle enemies uh, around 350,000 power or less i found that the quick battle is an option when uh, your team has like 30 maybe 40 percent more power than the enemy or somewhere in that ballpark uh, meaning that for a 500,000 power uh team 
you will be able to uh, battle down to like 350,000. Uh, for example, if you are running 50,000, you will be quick bit battling at like 35,000 and so on and so on. So uh, it is a good way to quickly do your battles, as you can see, uh, instead of fighting. I mean, you can fight and uh, when an enemy is running only one level, one slime, you will win pretty much all of the time. But the quick battle just basically saves a lot of time. And uh, the quick battle is basically, uh, to put it in human terms, an option to quickly win the battle because the game basically recognizes that uh, your team is that much stronger than the enemy that they sort of stand no chance. Of course, there are cases where uh, you would lose if you went uh, with a regular battle instead of a quick battle, but in like 99% of cases, uh, when your power difference is that huge, uh, you can pretty much win even uh, without attacking yourself, probably just your monsters alone. So for those cases, uh, Quick battle is an option, as you can see my monster power is quite high compared to how old the server is, so I am able to uh, quick battle quite a few fights, as well as some uh, fights people are simply putting either troll defenses or uh, not full defenses, so you will have the option to do that. And now for more technical stuff about the arena, uh, I'm gonna quickly look over the three types that you see here. So the battle record will showcase uh, several things. If you have this checked, and it will be checked by default whenever you enter the battle record, uh, you will see both uh, your attacks that you've done, as well as the attacks that were done on you. And the good thing about this is that you can modify your defense team according to the attacks that you have received, because uh, whenever someone attacks you, and you see that, for example, your defense failed, it will show you what team uh, the enemies used. These are not their defense. Uh, in some cases, these are the strongest units, so they will run it in defense. Uh, but uh, basically, it shows you what units were used. That way, you are able to check what uh, units beat you and modify your defense accordingly. Uh, and for the attack logs, uh, basically, you are seeing the uh, player that you have attacked. Of course, when that happened, the rating you got from it as well as the defense team uh, you beat. Uh, usually the attack logs are not that important. You mainly want to just uncheck this and uh, check the defense log for information about the attacks as well as the option to revenge uh, the player. Uh, the good thing about revenging is if you are a bit in the lower ranks or you manage to pick up the sort of a, a streak of revenging each other uh, with a few people, you will be able to quickly use up the wings, especially if you're running uh, weak defenses and strong offenses. Uh, so uh, I will explain uh, how weak and strong defenses work in just a second after reviewing all of this. So yeah, for battle record, that's pretty much it. Uh, now the ranking stops, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You will see the top 100 players in the arena for your server. This is not globally. Uh, this is only for the specific server that you are in and you will see the defenses uh, that the person is running as well as their total rating so uh, you can scroll through this you can check what uh, the meta defenses are and for example build accordingly to it right now uh, the meta is pretty much unit this unit uh, called juno and if you have juno you pretty much uh, win the game as you can see she's like in every well, I, I wanted to say every second defense, but at this point, it looks like she's in pretty much every defense. Uh, so yeah, hopefully the meta changes because currently uh, this unit is uh, so OP that it's actually not even fun to play the game, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, uh, the meta will change. I'm, I'm certain it will change because uh, the game cannot sustain uh, for long if only three of the same units are being used and as new units come out uh, it will change significantly because otherwise uh, there would be no uh, pack sales if the units that were introduced weren't strong in the first place but yeah for rankings you can always check uh, the people who are currently in the top are uh, the defense that they are running as well as uh, another good thing about the rankings is if you're looking uh, to aim for a specific rank in the top 100, you can actually see the rating that's required because some of the rewards, uh, which we'll go over in a second, actually require not only uh, to have a specific rating, but also a specific rank. So 
even if you for example reach uh let's say uh no actually i'll give it a realistic example i think one of the ranks are uh, changes at like 4600 rating if you are for example uh 4600 and uh you do not have uh let's say top 300 right now it's only like 75 people in it but as more people uh, join the game, this will actually matter. For example, uh, let's say if you were uh, needing a certain rank for it and you had the rating, but you do not have the rank itself, uh, you would also be useful to check on the rank that is required for it. So let's say uh, if uh, a certain reward required you to be top 50, uh, you can see that the top 50 player has 4,686 rating and uh, basically to get a higher rank or to get into the top 50 you will need to hit uh, this ranking and now for the history and reward uh, tab uh, you can always check the weekly reward you are getting for the specific week right here so it'll show you the current and the next one uh, this only shows the weekly rewards it does not include the season rewards that happen every four weeks and as you can see currently it is the week four of the season uh, meaning that after this week, uh, you will actually be getting both uh, the weekly reward as well as the season reward and the season will reset. Uh, the rewards you can check right here. So for the weekly rewards, uh, you can see your current rank as well as the rewards for uh, all of the different ranks. Uh, this will show you the rating that is needed as well as the rank that's needed. So for example, even if a person reaches like 7000 rating, if they are not rank 2, they will not be Grandmaster 2 and... Yeah, so the ranks really mostly matter for the very top positions. Uh, right now in like the Master 4, Master 3, the rank isn't that impactful because there are uh, more people uh, in the ranks uh, compared to more people above the rating. So uh, the game is pretty much uh, just taking rating into account because the rating currently is a bit uh, too low for the uh, current amount of players. And yeah, for the rewards, uh, every week you will receive a certain reward that is written here. Uh, I personally, for example, go for Master 1 usually and go for this reward. Uh, and then the Season reward uh, will be the reward that you get after uh, 4 weeks. So after this week, we will be getting the Season reward. Uh, and the rank that you get for the Season reward basically only counts for the week 4. It does not take an average or anything like that. Uh, so... Basically, if you want to get a good season award, you can sort of slack uh, for the first three weeks. And as long as you finish high on the fourth week, you will get both a good uh, weekly award as well as a good uh, season award. So uh, if you are not a fan of Arena, at least try to push on the last week because that's when you get pretty much double, maybe even triple the awards, uh, however you want to uh, call it, I suppose. And you will get a decent payout from the season ending and now let's quickly jump into the uh, defense portion so uh, the defense team is basically uh, you are registering monsters that uh, others will have to fight against and in a lot of cases if you are not looking to play this competitively and instead uh, just have the ability to quickly use your challenge arena tickets uh, the best strategy is to actually set a very weak defense or what others might refer to as food defense. This means that uh, you are only bringing a summoner and one random unit with it or I'm not sure if you can, no, you cannot go without a unit. So yeah, uh, just pick whatever unit you have. Uh, it doesn't have to be awakened, ruined, evolved, anything like that. Uh, the weaker you set, uh, the easier it will be for the opponents to uh, beat you and that way your ranking will drop more and with a lower ranking you will see lower uh, rank enemies and you will be able to uh, quick battle more of them as well as quick battle them a little easier than you would uh, with higher rank defenses. Another good thing about setting food defenses is when you get attacked by lower rank people who you can, uh, for example, quick battle with your main team, is that uh, not only are you able to do uh, battles from the main list, uh, you will have a lot, and I mean a lot, of uh, the vengeance available. And you can, for example, do like 10 quick battles here. Uh, you can do like 20 uh, quick battles by just revenging, and that way you will easily clear your daily uh, wings that you get. 
So yeah, uh, for defense, uh, if you are looking to casually just farm, I recommend setting full defense for like the first four to five days. And uh, after those days, uh, whenever you feel like, and especially if you feel like uh, ranking up a little higher into the ratings, I do recommend setting the full team. So for example, I was running something like uh, this, I think the whole week and my Team power was sitting at 178 power, 178k at least. Uh, so people who are like 250k, 200 like 70k could quick battle and 250k is a pretty easy power to reach even early on. I would say probably a week or two into the game you will easily have a 250 power without even trying much. Uh, that way you can fight a lot of weak people and when the week is closing you can just set your main defense uh get a lot of power so that people could not quick battle you you will still lose as you can see i'm running full defense and i'm still losing some uh but the rate of attacks uh, that you receive will be way way less as you can see i was attacked three times today uh compared to the defense rate of the rest of the week as you can see Today is Saturday when I'm recording this, so in the past uh, 5 days I was attacked 263 times and I won of course a whole whopping of 0, that's because uh, mostly people just quick attack you if you have a weak defense. And yeah, it will slow down the attacks once you full, uh, put up a full defense, but will, will also allow you to rise in ratings a lot, because uh, daily you can attack 10 times for free, you can uh, make a recharge for 50 crystals for another 10 tickets, uh, that will basically mean 20 wins and if as you can see uh, I only got attacked 3 times and I only lose like minus 7 from attacks whereas uh, from winning I currently get like plus 13 or something like that and you will get even more if you get a win streak so uh, the win itself is 9, the win streak, uh, my win streak is currently 85 but that's mostly because I only quick battle, I pretty much never even do manual battles unless I really really wanna push at the very end of the week. And yeah, you'll have an easy time farming points if you do set the full defense. And whenever uh, you set a normal defense, you can just rise. Uh, after the week tally is over, on Monday you can set your defense back to the full defense and just farm each other with uh, the rest of the players. So yeah, I think that's about it for the whole uh, challenge arena. And now we'll jump into brawl arena. Alright, now let's cover... Uh... A different type of arena and that's brawl arena so while challenge arena is sort of pvp you're fighting against ai control teams uh, in brawl arena the battles are completely live so you are fighting a another person uh in real time uh, unfortunately uh the uh, brawl arena is currently limited to these times only and the times you see here will be local so uh, if you're in a different time zone than me, you will see different times here, but yeah, it's currently limited uh, to certain times because of a lack of players in the game. Uh, as more players come in, hopefully with the global release, this uh, restriction should be lifted, or at least uh, the times will be expanded by a lot. But yeah, uh, the Brawl Arena is basically very similar to the uh, Challenge Arena, and uh, there are a lot of similarities, so I won't... Uh, go over those, so, like very similar stuff like uh, you also pick uh, a summoner and three monsters, uh, you also uh, have certain restrictions in the game itself, for example you cannot uh, change, uh, what should we call it, you cannot change uh, the weapon uh, faster than every 30 seconds, uh, you cannot uh, ask your monsters to focus a certain uh, unit for example, so the fighting principle is pretty similar. Uh, the main difference I would say here is, well, apart from the fact that you're fighting completely live, is uh, the pick and ban phase, which I'll explain in a second in one of the examples I recorded previously. But yeah, uh, for team picks, again, uh, this is very uh, different from the challenge arena in terms of the teams you use. Uh, because in Challenge Arena, uh, while you have full control of the team that you uh, pick, so for example, uh, I see an opponent has, for example, three water or rather three fire units. Perhaps I want to go something like a uh, Bastet Galleon and like a water damage player or something like that. 
And in those cases, I will usually have a pretty easy time beating the opponent, but uh, for Live Arena, uh, that usually does not work because even if, let's say, the opponent picks like three water monsters, uh, you go with three wind monsters, uh, the enemy can, uh, as the last pick, pick, for example, a fire unit to counter your, the rest of your team. Also, uh, you cannot make a very specific combo because if, let's say, uh, your combo in the Brawl Arena was to, for example, uh, have Galleon, right, as a attack buffer and defense breaker, and let's say uh, you wanted to bring two nukers, right, and with this team you have a very good chance of uh, completely annihilating a team in like a few seconds, but in Brawl Arena that will not work usually because if you were to pick, for example, Galleon and two damage dealers, or let's say three damage dealers, if the opponent simply bans your Galleon, uh, your damage leaders are left both without the defense break, they're left without attack buff, and uh, that team sort of falls apart. So it's a very different strategy as far as monster picks goes, and you basically have to pick monsters uh, that, instead of making a good team synergy, are more of a better uh, units overall on their own. So uh, regardless of what team you use, for example, uh, this unit, uh, it decreases cooldowns by a lot, but it does not need any specific team, it just boosts uh, the whole team and your summoner uh, by itself. For example, this unit, uh, Ariel, uh, he does not need a specific team to work, he simply boosts uh, a lot of healing, he cleanses debuffs with his third skill, uh, Juno is a very popular pick, like, she does not really have a specific team uh, that people use her with, uh, she's just good overall. She has an amazing passive, she has a strip on her second skill, uh, she has cleanse on her third skill, and uh, if you combine a few of those monsters that are just good individually, and you'll see a lot of these where uh, monsters are simply good individually rather than a part of a specific setup, that's why you usually not see a lot of uh, units that give a lot of good setup stuff like Galleon, uh, stuff like specific damage dealers, for example, uh, the Wind Pioneer, who needs a perfect setup because uh, if the setup for that Pioneer is banned, uh, you will basically not have any chance and uh, that specific unit you made your team around uh, will simply be uh, no longer useful. So yeah, uh, we'll jump into the example in a second. Let me see if I there's anything else I want to... Oh, yeah, uh, before we go to the uh, fight example, uh, I want to quickly cover the arena shop for the brawl mode. So, uh, first of all, no, you know what? No, 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 not the shop, not the shop. Shop will cover in a second. Uh, the words, I want to cover the words real quickly. Uh, the rewards uh, work similarly to the arena shop, and uh, you will get weekly rewards every week uh, based on this uh, rank you finish in. Uh, these rewards uh, will be a bit more geared towards crystals for the weekly ones, and for the season rewards, uh, you, they will be more focused on points and mystical scrolls rather than crystals, which you can see. Uh, let's say I were to play Silver 3, uh, I would get uh, these weekly rewards, uh, these seasonal rewards will be more focused on Mystical Scrolls and uh, these uh, Brawl Seals instead of Crystals, you can see I get even less Crystals than the weekly reward. Uh, and yeah, for the rewards in the battle, uh, very similar to the uh, Challenge Arena, uh, you get uh, these uh, what they call Brawl Seals, so for in Challenge Arena you get Arena Coins and Brawl Seal you get uh, in Brawl Arena you get Brawl Seals and you can spend them on the shop right here, but I'll cover the shop in a second. Or maybe I even covered it, I'm not sure, I will still cover it here just so it's in one place. And you also get uh, these Brawl Seals after each uh, battle. Uh, if you lose, you get an average from like 5 to 10 in lower ranks. Uh, if you win, you get higher amounts, I think like somewhere in the 20s. Uh, so yeah, you get them regardless whether you win or lose, and you also get, of course, these battle points, which uh, give you progress towards uh, the arena pass. You do not need to buy the arena pass to get rewards, you will still get like a legendary scroll, uh, some sky stones, uh, some of these uh, heal orders, some of the better rewards at least. You can buy the premium rewards, which will allow you, uh, first of all, to get uh, the bottom uh, Road the boards. I personally don't buy it, but uh, I'd say it's one of the better purchases, especially for the Devilmon 
and the very high amount of sky stones that you get uh, and also uh, the pass will give you some more benefits so first of all uh, you can get uh, multiple multiply the votes per day for the first battles uh, you will also have the ability to refresh the arena shop a bit uh, not arena shop but the arena uh, list a bit faster so like you know that uh, the free refresh happens every 30 minutes where they pass it will be 10 minutes so you are able to use that uh, what's it called uh, use those uh, tickets faster and for e events where uh, arena tasks are present uh, you will also get double events however don't count on this too much because uh for the previous season i don't think there was a single uh event where the arena pass actually helped in any way so yeah uh now that we covered all that i'll jump into a battle example and we'll see how the battle works yeah so i realized i actually don't have any footage of any fight on my uh, computer so I'll just bring up uh, one of the videos that I recently made uh, so basically this is how uh, the brawl arena interface looks like after you enter a battle uh, you will see uh, your stats right here and the opponent right here uh, it covers a bit of the name and uh, the level of the summoner but other than that it doesn't really cover much else uh, so the way uh, these battle arenas work uh, in the first phase uh, there will be a pick and ban phase for uh, your weapon. So uh, in the first phase, uh, you ban one of the elements uh, of the one uh, weapon element that the enemy will not be able to use. Uh, so for example, I usually ban the light one for cleave, uh, but this will depend on the team that you use. So don't really go blindly into it and think about what counters your team and ban accordingly. So uh, once you uh, get the ban in, uh, after basically after you and the enemy bans, uh, you will see the bans uh, that you have received as well. So in this case, both of us banned each other's light weapons. After this, you are able to pick a weapon that you prefer to use. So keep in mind that for arena, usually light and dark will have a little bit more benefit as there are some uh, weapon passives that buff uh, damage from the dark weapons or uh, the, uh, reduce damage that you take from the light weapons. So yeah, uh, after that you pick the elephant that, uh, that you want. So I picked the dark one. I'll see the element that uh, the enemy picked. So he picked the wind one. Uh, and yeah, after this, uh, the monster uh, pick phase will start. Uh, the, you can pick a total of four monsters. Uh, but you will only be able to uh, fight with three of them and uh, the way it works is uh, one of you will get the first pick and whoever gets the first pick will uh, have a, a choice at any unit that they have after that uh, the other person will pick two picks so his first and second pick uh, then uh, the opponent for example here will pick the second and third pick uh, you pick the third and fourth pick and the opponent uh, finishes off with the fourth pick so yeah we'll skip to that phase and yeah as you can see uh we all picked uh, our four units after that uh there will be a final phase of uh banning a unit that you do not want to fight this is why i said uh unlike challenge arena uh, pulling off those uh, specific combos will be hard because uh, if you see that, for example, here, uh, the obvious uh, thing I want to do here, for example, is to uh, buff up with my pixie and uh, use Bulldozer's third skill. So, for example, uh, he would do a lot of damage if he had a defense buff on him. Uh, but the way the opponent can ruin my team a lot is by, for example, binding Shannon. Uh, that way, my uh, Bulldozer will not have any defense buff. That way he will do way less damage and will sort of become a useless pick as well. So I don't know what he banned here, but basically that's how you can really counter uh, your opponent's teams. It looks like he didn't ban it, but he banned my divider. So I suppose that could work. Uh, and yeah, basically after you ban uh, the opponent uh, that you wanted, or opponent's monster that you wanted, uh, you enter the very very last phase and that is uh, picking the soul link unit uh, that you wish to have There are no leader skills in here or anything like that. So you don't have to worry about those 
uh, but you will pick a soul link unit which you cannot change for the first few seconds so do pick a card uh, accordingly to how you plan on playing it for the first few moments of the fight at least uh, soul link of course refers to the uh, placement of the unit so like uh, if i pick shannon as my soul link unit the two other ones will uh, use their abilities on cooldown and the soul link unit will use their abilities with mana but you can change that a few seconds into the fight and yeah uh, you'll enter the fight uh, it will start in like five or three seconds i'm not even sure after all of the picks are, are selected and yeah uh right here uh, your goal is to basically defeat all of the monsters from the opponent and it's very similar to the uh, regular challenge arena in the sense that uh, you can yourself target any unit, but your units uh, will fight accordingly to the uh, type that they are. So, for example, support units will usually uh, go next to the ones that receive damage. Uh, archer units will shoot everyone from range and will start to uh, sort of run away from them if uh, an enemy gets too close. And yeah, uh, you just have to time how those units will interact in the pick phase because you will not have any control over how they work uh, later on. And yeah, if you kill the summoner, uh, the other three units will still be fighting. However, all three of them will become a uh, regular, how should I say, regular uh, skill using monsters and none of your units will have the ability to use skills with mana. Uh, that means that killing the summoner is uh, very beneficial in ending the fight however there is a chance that if you blow a lot of resources on killing the summoner and for example like two of your units dies there is a good chance that those uh, three remaining units will be able to finish you off actually so even if you have the summoner uh, do be careful and plan how you attack accordingly and yeah after this i uh, lost desperately probably i don't know because i was going with very weak units here uh, looks like a win and after the win uh, you will see the victory battle screen so basically this is how the ranking that you got from the fight and uh, this will be the reward so uh, this uh, currency will be used in the bro shop and these are the victory points that you use in the uh, when fulfilling the arena pass for uh, the rewards from there and usually the arena pass is very easy to fill even without the pass the, the premium pass i think you're done with like uh, the whole the world list in like a week or two uh some of your pass does take a bit longer compared to the arena pass so definitely don't worry even if you don't do brawl arena you'll be able to easily uh, complete it fully and yeah i think that's about it for the brawl arena as far as fight goes i'll quickly jump into the shop now uh to cover one last thing and as the uh, arena shop and what are the items i recommend buying from it uh, so there are two different shops right now and for the challenge shop uh the main item you want to be buying is the five star devil mod uh after that uh there are several different choices that you can do and that will depend on the amount of uh, points that you found per, uh, per day per week and stuff like that uh, i'm personally able to buy five of these uh, items every week or every month however often they show up and i still have a uh, enough points to slowly move towards uh the uh what's it called outfits and yeah so the main thing you want to buy is the devil mon this is by far the most important item after that it's completely up to you uh these devil mons will work on four star units uh they're not necessarily very late in the game but for now i do still collect them because i don't have enough pieces for some of my net force and i do plan on building some of them uh, the legendary scroll uh, has very good price for the uh, amount of rewards you can get here uh, the next closest thing to that is the mystical scroll but as you can see it only it, it costs like 30 percent of leg legendary's uh, rate but it has like 10 times worse uh, lightning and five star summon rates compared to it so the legendary scroll is the better uh, option by far and I personally don't buy the mystical scrolls until I am done with the outfits at least. And then uh, these uh, pieces, so monster pieces for both uh, the water pirate captain and the water griffon, I buy both of them. Uh, this uh, pirate captain is an amazing unit in my opinion and it will be an amazing addition to your uh, regular challenge arena shop. 
not not chop uh, challenge arena team because uh, he has a three mana setup for your damage dealers so he buffs attack and defense breaks all enemies and that just gives you an amazing advantage when fighting in the arena uh, for the water griffon i only do it because it's a four star and i do plan on building another griffon soon but uh, after that i might stop buying the pieces uh, later on and uh, the rest of the items are really nothing special uh, emojis again i don't really chat in the uh, global chat that much so i really don't care about these emojis uh, these are the rides i'm not sure of the speed of them uh, but if you need a fast ride you should buy it from the ascension shop because it's way way cheaper instead of spending uh 22 000, like I, I never even had that amount of tokens at once so i can't imagine spending it on a ride rainbow ones i would say five star uh please don't buy this uh, this is a decent purchase if you're looking to build some four stars because the price isn't too bad uh but for the five stars i don't recommend buying it this never touch this ever please don't uh, and uh, the outfits are something I would recommend focusing after you get uh, all five of these. And uh, the outfit will, of course, once fully completed, will allow your archer type uh, monsters to have uh, some extra HP. And yeah, now jumping into the brawl shop, it of course has a different currency and very much uh, different uh, items to buy. So, first of all, uh, just like the previous shop, 5 star Devilmon, this time it's not once a week but 2 per month, uh, you grab these at uh, the moment uh, the, uh, what's it called, the month changes, because this is by far the most exclusive defaults uh, you will need from this shop. Uh, I do like to grab the 4 star Devilmons, but that will also depend on the progress you currently have, and after that, I personally uh, am saving for the outfits, I'm not sure what I'll do after the outfits, I'll probably go for the Light and Dark Scrolls, although even then I feel like... Uh, in my opinion, first of all, Light and Dark Scrolls are a bit overrated because uh, they're really just glorified mystical scrolls and regular net fives are usually uh, on the same strength as the Light and Dark net fives in this game, so uh, if you do prefer to uh, get that gambling rush uh, from summoning more premium scrolls, you can go for it. Uh, I personally uh, am not buying it until I am done with the uh, outfit crafting. And for the other items, uh, this one you do not touch ever. Uh, Galaxy Stones you can buy, especially the higher tiers. For the lower tiers, like the green and uh, white ones, I wouldn't recommend buying because those are very easy to craft. Uh, but if you're looking to upgrade some weapons, uh, these are okay purchases, uh, but then again be mindful of your points because uh, you do get a very limited amount of them and if you do not have the arena pass you will not have a lot of uh, disposable income for it, but once you're done with the devil mods, once you're done with the outfits uh, and buying the legendary scroll, or not the legendary, the light and dark scroll, which is I think is a better purchase than any of these, uh, you can uh, consider spending some of them for these uh, galaxy stones. So yeah, overall uh, that addresses everything to do with the arenas and now uh, we'll move on to the other content. Right, so the next thing uh, we will be talking about is the expedition which you can find right here next to the battle boat and party dungeon. Uh, this content is quite important, however, you will find it challenging in the beginning because, uh, well, you won't find level 1 challenging for each content, but uh, level 2 and above will be quite difficult because starting at level 2, uh, each boss will have a unique condition, very similar to the uh, Spire of Ascension ones. Uh, I don't know if I will put Spire of Ascension guys uh, before or after this, but you can also skip to that to get the idea of how it works. Uh, basically, uh, each dungeon will have a specific requirement. I can only cover Fire Taladis today because other ones are closed. And first of all, uh, quickly explaining on how many entries you get at first. Uh, so there will be, you will see six uh, maps in total, or rather six areas in total. And yes, uh, these two are completely the same and the conditions will be the same as well. So uh, this is the special expedition. Uh, it is uh, different from the other five and I'll get to that in the second. Uh, the first more important thing are these uh, five expeditions. They cycle daily. Uh, so basically in a week, 
uh, one of them will be open every day and there will be two days where uh, there will be three basic element ones open so fire collide water roads and wind arachne all of them will be open in one day and another day uh, there will be the light sharecki and dark borbo open at once so five days of one each uh, one day of uh, the three elemental ones and one day of these two and you get two daily entries uh, regardless which one you enter so if you enter the fire colliders but water roados is open as well you do not get two additional entries for the roados you can only do uh, two in total and the good thing about it is uh, that the rewards uh, when comparing level 1 to level 4 don't scale that much uh, the main thing you get are the side stones, the pieces of luck, pieces of magic and elixir slogs and they really don't make much difference regarding which level you farm as you can see the average skystone drop is only like 20% better so if you cannot do level 4 uh, just go for level 3 if you cannot do level 3 just go for level 2 you're definitely not missing too much uh, however it's not the case for the special activation which we'll talk about in a second uh, it's only the case for this so if you enter level 1 uh, you will see that you can pick any unit that you wish and this will make the dungeon super easy because the dungeon itself only has 170k power and you should be able to hit that right after leaving the story but uh, if you check level 2 or above uh, each dungeon will have a specific uh, condition that's required and yeah uh, a little, a little uh, short on breath from all the talking so basically uh, each dungeon will have a different uh, condition and you can see it right here so for this one uh, the condition is to place at least one water support monster and exclude any fire units this means that you can pretty much accomplish this by just putting a water support unit and as you can see if i select bastet the condition is already met and since i cannot use any fire units uh, the best thing to use in here would be water units because the boss itself is a fire element so for that uh let's say i will put up you in you in and some kind of a damage dealer perhaps to deal uh, with the boss a little faster uh let's say we'll pick uh, the dark house i want to say she's good here but i really don't have uh, i really don't want to overthink this so i'll just pick her and yeah if we enter iran you will see that i think i should be able to use something it would be embarrassing if i didn't do it um, a showcase right from a player who's like uh twice the power of the requirement just make sure that the correct settings are on and yeah it, as you notice uh the units here are actually very similar to the uh the path of growth units except they have different elements and yes uh, that is correct uh these are the same unit and they have the same skills however their elements vary slightly and as you can see i just beat oh i don't know why i beat level two i should have went for level four but yeah you get the point uh the expedition will allow you to do two daily runs and will around you uh, reward you from around uh five to seven thousand sky stones if you do both entries you can refresh them for i think 200 crystals uh, for the first one and the later one gets a bit more expensive so yeah these ones are pretty simple uh, i do not recommend doing the paid entries because they cost a lot and they don't really pay back uh, enough resources to be worth it only do the uh, ones that are marked with the today tab and do the two paid ones uh, after that you can refresh but even then uh, you should decide whether it's worth the cost because uh, previously i did refresh but now that the skystone price drop i uh, usually don't sell them and in my opinion the guys want to get from here are not worth the 200 crystals that it costs to refresh and uh quickly jumping over to the special expedition now so uh this is the wind arachne and she stays uh the same element in the same unit always and you can do this dungeon 20 times you can also refresh it three times uh the first one being 200 crystals the second one being 300 and the fourth one or the third refresh being i believe either 400 or 450 and the reward you can get are seen here do keep in mind that all everything you see is not 100 percent drop rate and in fact it's quite low uh in 20 runs i think on average you can expect like 
uh, I would say 10 research log pieces maybe uh, an occasional uh, research logo too uh, you could get like two I would say one to three is a safe bet but on average you will get around two wounds for all 20 runs and you will get um, oh, for this I'm not sure I think it's like four to five uh, energy pieces per 20 runs not uh, four to five of each but four to five in total and they are completely random you also get these materials but i don't quite remember the exact drop rates i think it's like one to two of each as well and the gold is guaranteed of course but you do not get uh, the exact amount of 1470 you get around like one two what is it, like 1400 maybe 1300 it's sort of rng and fluctuates in that range but yeah for this dungeon same thing with level one you do not have any condition to clear it so if you can clear level one i do recommend doing all of them uh, however the best the worst start at level four and if you can only do level three but cannot do level four i do recommend pushing for level four because the rewards change drastically i would say uh, as drastic as doubling because uh first of all uh the research log pieces are double in the level 4 compared to level 3 as well as level 4 has the chance to drop a full research lock so you will get quite a few uh skill points more compared to level 3 and skill points is pretty much the main thing you do special expedition for uh, this is probably the main source of skill logs and it contributes to around i would say 80 to 90 percent of all skill uh, research that you get in this game of all contents and uh, for the special expedition, there are quite a few teams that people have built and people do focus on building good teams for this because you do need to do a lot of runs for it and uh, that means you do need a very consistent team for it. The condition for it is you cannot use any wind units and you must use a fire warrior unit. Uh, you will find different opinions on what warrior units are good and as you can see I have built quite a few just to test them out. And uh, previously, I uh, saw the very popular opinion of the Lizardman, and I previously used Lizardman myself. Uh, then I saw some videos that people are starting using Bulldozer because he has uh, a lot of damage potential, and Lizardman isn't really always needed for tankiness. Uh, however, my latest discovery is uh, this unit called the Fire Harpy, and I found that it's by far the best for Cleave users because. Uh, the problem with Cleave is, for PvE purposes, uh, Kina has stuff like buffs, so she can heal up, she can attack buff, Orbia has damage as well as a defense break, so she can set up those. Unfortunately, Cleave does not have a neither the damage setup nor the buffs, so you're sort of left uh, with a little bit of a handicap and you're forced to improvise on how to uh, get all of those buffs in. So this uh, Harpy, she actually has a skill which does a multi-hit and it applies defense uh, break for each hit. She hits six times, so she has the potential to apply level six defense break from one uh, skill usage. And that's the main reason why I use her. Uh, she has the potential to permanently keep level 10 uh, defense break on the boss. And I give her a uh, runes that mostly specialize on accuracy the rest of the stats don't really matter to me uh, together with her i bring a uh, current as my main damage dealer uh, let me quickly select her yeah so her alone uh, meets the condition of fire warrior as well as food and wind uh, i also bring her a bit for damage and bastet for uh, the buffs also i switch to fire element because that will allow me to receive the least damage and Yes, this dungeon is quite difficult if you're not uh, ready for it with a special team. But uh, you bas basically have to improvise on the units that you have. Also, if you're using uh, the fire harp as me, make sure the skill uh, the skill settings are set to only use a soul link first skill because her second skill is only damage and it's not used on the boss. And as you can see, she will start farming her first skill and she has double big defense break. Level 6 defense break, level 10 defense break, and with level 10 defense break and uh, attack buff, even if there is poison applied, 
uh, you really won't uh, be dying your unit might be dying uh, you won't especially if you don't leave uh, you will receive endure and that endure when maxed can last like 10 seconds so that gives you a lot of opportunity to beat the dungeon and yeah as you can see i received some gold and a legendary rune so yeah for expedition i believe that's about all and let's move forward with the next uh, content well, now that the Trials of Ascension actually just reset, I think it's the perfect time to talk about how it works. So, Trial of Ascension uh, can be accessed through the main menu and going with the Trial of Ascension button in the left side. And essentially, this content is basically a uh, tower that consists of 200 floors. Uh, and it has two difficulty modes, so on the right side you can switch from normal mode to dark to hard mode and uh, vice versa. Basically normal mode is a, an easier mode for the same uh, dungeon and all of the units in the floors will be the same as in the hard mode. Except that in the hard mode simply the levels of the units will be higher and... I think in the normal mode, the last stage requires somewhere around 250,000 power, where in the hard mode, uh, it requires around 400,000 power. So uh, keep that in mind when planning whether to do your Tower of Ascension or not. And uh, this mode is quite simple. However, there are some things you should be aware of to not miss out on a lot of rewards. Uh, so basically, for Tower of Ascension, uh, your goal is to, uh, you will start at floor 1 for both modes, you can do whichever mode uh, you prefer first. Uh, once you are in the floor 1, uh, you enter the stage and you have two buttons on the uh, right side. So after setting up the team, uh, you have the ability to either start the battle or you can click on the uh, repeat battle. Uh, the repeat battle will, as written here, uh, allow you to climb the tower uh, going each stage at once however uh, the next stage will be started automatically after you beat the first one so uh, just to showcase on how it works as you can see this is stage one and right after we beat it the first stages are extremely easy you should be able to beat it probably seconds after starting the game but don't try to rush it too much so yeah, uh, floor 1, as you can see, it has been beaten, it has a 5 second timer, and after that timer ticks, you will go to floor 2, and in the left side, you can see the of Ascension, floor 2. So it will do this for the whole tower, if you have the repeat battle uh, selected, however, you should not be using it too much, because, uh, here's why, uh, quickly gonna jump into this thing called the special room. And uh, the special room can be accessed at the bottom uh, of the tower, as you can see right here. So uh, you will see an empty bar at first. However, uh, you will need to slowly fill that bar in order to access it. And to uh, fill that bar uh, to full, you will need to do 10 stages of any uh, Trial of Ascension stage. Or it also actually counts uh, Spire of Ascensions or uh, any of the elemental towers. So we're going to stick to TRA for now, uh, we're not going to touch Spires just yet. Uh, once the beater is filled up, you should actually not uh, continue uh, the regular Trial of Ascension stages any longer and instead go to the special room. And this is because uh, the rewards you get in the special room are insanely strong and uh, in some cases it may be this pretty much enough rewards to where they could uh, match the rewards you actually get from the tower itself. I think in one case I have received uh, a lot of rewards. I was like uh, 3 legendary scrolls, 4 light and dark scrolls, like up to 30 mystical scrolls or something like that. I'll actually link the video of uh, the reward breakdown I've done for Trial of Ascension around a month ago. So you can see the rewards uh, in more detail there. I've done 40 special rooms. so. Uh, there will be a lot of approximate data for each stage that you can get. But yeah, in the special room, uh, you will have 10 levels to choose from. Uh, level 1 being uh, the easiest and only requiring 50,000 power to get the bonus. And the level 10 being the hardest. But even then, it only requires 235,000 power to get the words. 
to get the bonus rather and uh the available awards are seen at the right side and yes uh they do seem pretty strong and they actually do have a decent drop chance so you might receive a few legendary light and dark scrolls in uh pretty much every trial of ascension rotation you will receive quite a bit of mystical scrolls i think like 15 to 20 of the full ones and then a bunch of pieces to make like 15 uh from the pieces as well and you will also be receiving a lot of monster pieces uh which are sort of comparable to like 10 scrolls as well so yes you should never miss out on doing this room and when climbing the of ascension uh your goal is to basically do 10 stages so you can do it with the repeat battle option but i'm uh, I'm gonna warn you that at least for the first two stages, if you are not alert every few minutes and looking at the game, you can easily forget uh, that the 10 stages has passed and there have been incidents where I have passed 15 stages and was lucky to stop it there. There were also uh, incidents where I have completely forgot about it and I passed like 60 stages at once and basically i missed out on a lot and i mean a lot of the awards so uh worst case uh you can do stages manually one by one that way you are sure to not miss it if you're doing order uh, i would recommend at least staying near your phone and checking every few minutes to see that you do not go over the 10 stage uh, limit and uh once in the special room i will do a quick showcase on how it works so I personally do level 10 because uh, my team is capable of clearing it fully but keep in mind that the power limit you see may misguide you a bit because even though it only shows 235,000 power uh, I would say the stage uh, is way higher than or not higher but way harder than that I would say uh, it sort of compares to the difficulty of uh, a dungeon that would have like 350 to 400,000 power and even with the current team I have at like 500,000 uh, power there are sometimes cases where I might die because uh, the units that are in the stage do counter me pretty well so for example this uh, fire ifrit uh, it can apply oblivion and completely disable my passives so uh, there are cases where i sometimes lose it happens rarely but it does happen so make sure to not fall for that and as you can see after clearing the room uh, these are the rewards i received so uh, one legendary scroll piece uh, a full mystical scroll uh, 13 pieces and since you need 30 that's basically another half of the mystical scroll and a lot of uh, monster pieces now uh let's talk about some harder stages in the trial of ascension and i won't go into too much detail other than how to counter one of the stages and how to prepare for another two so uh for the whole trial of ascension i would say there are three difficult stages that people uh usually struggle with so uh the easiest of the three is probably the floor 100 boss uh it will have a boss called uh I'm not sure, is it Baphomet? I, I won't technically look up the name, but basically uh, 100 and 200 floors uh, have uh, a special boss that is a little bit more challenging to beat than the rest of the stages. And uh, to prepare for it, uh, some life hacks, if you are playing Cliff, for example, is by using the Light Cliff. Uh, do bring a lot of sustain because uh, the boss does do defense break I believe and he does have a lot of pushback so uh, try to dodge those skills if you see that you are not able to survive try to uh, modify your team to have a little bit more survivability I found that uh, the freely obtainable unit uh, Karambit actually helped me a lot in this stage so uh, because of the attack speed and the evasion that he has he usually uh, dodges a lot of attacks and can just burst down the boss quite well uh, so yeah uh, depending on the summoner you play of course for cleave you can be a little bit more reckless because you have that uh, endure passive to fall back on for other summoners uh, i do recommend being a little bit more careful because uh, you will have a harder time beating it without any safety option uh, and uh, the last thing that is a little bit harder in Trial of Ascension is actually the Floor 90 boss. Uh, 
the reason why it's pretty hard is because it has a passive which uh, similar to cleave uh, prevents him from dying uh, however that passive lasts way longer and some people simply uh, do not survive uh, those stages when doing it especially if you're doing it on hard mode and I can see from my experience that even now uh, when I'm sitting at like 500,000 power I still sometimes struggle with that stage unless I bring a specific team to counter him so uh, keep that in mind. Uh, the boss itself will be uh, the Shurekli which can actually be found uh, in the Path of Adventure so it will be this guy. I think the element is either neutral or light I cannot actually remember it but uh, he has this nasty passive which uh, when he falls very low in HP uh, he will get immunity, he will get uh, endure which prevents him from dying and uh, he gets a lot of healing so uh, you will either need to wait it out but to wait it out you will need to uh, keep running around for like 40 seconds or something and he does attack uh, during that time and the attacks do hurt quite a bit so keep that in mind. Uh, Konamiya is a great counter to it because uh, since he does electric shock, uh, Konamiya actually with his heal uh, can cleanse that electric shock and in turn give you mana regen speed up so you can cycle those heals even faster so for normal mode uh, Kona will definitely be enough to deal with him to survive while this passive goes uh, but for hard stage uh, you will need to either have a very tanky team with Konamiya or uh, a whole different way to pass that stage. Uh, there, or not unfortunately actually, fortunately there are some ways to counter that Endure buff. So first of all uh, you can look for a skill that uh, strips uh, beneficial effects. So uh, the move beneficial effect, there we go. Uh, there are quite a lot of units that do it, uh, however keep in mind that you should only bring the unit if it's good in there, so uh, there are a lot of options, uh, some of them only strip one beneficial effect, so uh, keep that in mind when looking into choosing a monster. Uh, I personally uh, just waited out because I do not have any good strippers built, uh, nor do I have a special unit that ignores the death uh, denial effects but if you do want to pass it easier I do recommend using at least one of those. Uh, there is this effect called death, death denial and it basically goes through the endure that uh, the boss gets. Not a lot of units in this game do have that buff but uh, some easier to acquire options are the light uh, mystic witch, uh, the dark amazon and uh, the wind lich. So. Uh, these three do have an effect that denies uh, the endure that the boss has and can simply, uh, when using a skill, kill through that endure uh, like it doesn't basically exist on him. Uh, there are also two net fives that do it, so the Wind Pioneer and the Water Hell Lady. And uh, the best part is if you are playing Orbia, her Wind Element first skill, so uh, by simply switching to the Wind Element and using the first skill, uh, if you kill with the first skill, uh, that skill can go through uh, Endure and basically finish up the boss itself. So for the three harder stages, uh, these will be uh, Flog 90, Flog 100 and Flog 200. So do not be worried if you are stuck on them uh, for quite a while because uh, a lot of people are usually stuck on these three stages. Or, uh, in general, I would say if you are able to pass a uh, Flog 90, you will definitely plus uh, floor 100 because 90 is way harder than uh, 100 one. For 200 uh, you might struggle a bit and I know that even my guilds who are very good in uh, the game and usually do way more damage than me still sometimes struggle with uh, floor 200 so do not be worried just keep trying. Uh, entering Trail for Ascension is completely free so you can experiment with your teams quite a bit and yeah good luck in those. Okay, and another thing you will see in the Trial of Ascension are these uh, little uh, sort of buildings uh, going through the right side and they don't happen on every stage, they happen at like every 5 or 10 stages. Uh, some are not unlocked yet and uh, some are, so I will quickly talk on how to unlock them and what they are. So first of all, uh, before clearing the TOA they will be uh, locked and 
If you just use the same theme for the whole Twelfth Ascension Tower, uh, you may notice that you will unlock like 60% of those towers, but some will still remain locked even though you clear the stage. And this is because they have a hidden condition, uh, pretty similar to the conditions that you may see uh, when entering the stage. And I'll try to quickly show that. Uh, let's wait for the stage to load. So before attacking anyone, uh, if you check at the top left of the screen, as you can see, there is wave, a timer, and uh, there is one condition such as it uses a recovery skill. So this is not a condition you need to do. Uh, the condition of use recovery skill is only for the bonus of the uh, stage. So you could get a little bonus reward, but however, there is basically a hidden condition that you do not know and there is actually no way to find it out apart from either discovering it yourself accidentally uh, using certain teams that might meet a lot of conditions or uh, just straight up checking stuff like forums, uh, other videos and stuff like that. So uh, to unlock it, you do need to clear that hidden mission that you will need to somehow find out. Uh, however, when uh, you unlock the room, uh, you actually have the ability to click on it and you will enter this spe special stage called Hidden Room. It has like 20 to 30 levels per tower. Uh, it does not matter uh, whether you do TOA on normal or hard mode as these rooms are shared between them. So if you already do a room on normal mode, uh, it will already be completed on hard and there is no difference which mode you choose when entering the hidden room because uh, the difficulty does not change and the rewards do not change either. In this room, uh, the main materials that you will be getting are uh, just evolution materials and in that stage uh, there are two different things that you can do. So first of all, there will be some treasure chests. Uh, and as you can see, you can keep opening them. And in this treasure chest, you will be finding uh, stuff like XP potions. Uh, these can be both normal and premium. Uh, you will be finding some breath of lives. However, the amounts are very small, I would say. Uh, there is also a small chance to find an angel mon, but uh, those are pretty rare. So don't expect to get a lot of them. I think I get like two or three every every... Uh, Trial of Ascension uh, rotation, so they do drop pretty rarely, and uh, the rooms might change. Uh, some rooms will have a lot of chests like this one, uh, some rooms may only have like 3 or 5 tre chests, and in this room is, uh, you can either uh, keep opening chests like this, or uh, you can actually fight the little uh, ducks that are visible in here, and every time you hit them you will get decent chunks of gold. As you can see, the gold you get uh, depends on damage as well as uh, whether you kill them or not. So you do drop gold from just hitting them. Uh, after you kill them, you drop another big chunk of gold. And if you do manage to uh, kill all of them before the timer runs out, uh, you still have the ability to open chests if there are some unopened ones. If you have both killed and uh, opened all of the chest and the ducks, uh, the stage will end a little bit faster. But as you can see, I'll just quickly skim over the rest of the stage. As you can see, you can open the chest and at the end of the stage, you will see the final reward summary. So let's wait for the 15 seconds to tick. And yeah, the total rewards you got from this stage are 5,000 gold, 118 potions, 2 premium XP potions, 2 breath of life. And do not be scared about the low rewards because uh, they do scale up the higher uh, the room is. And at the very top floor, you can get pretty decent rewards of like 100,000 gold and quite a few uh, potions. I think I've gotten like several hundred breath of lives in some stages. So uh, the rewards do scale up quite a bit, they're just low at the very bottom stages, so uh, in some cases I would even say the uh, very few bottom ones are not worth your time if you really have limited time to play the game, as uh, you do waste 2 minutes and the rewards you get are nothing special, but the higher floors, probably starting like 100 and up, I would encourage you to do uh, each one of them because the rewards do increase quite a bit and they will be very useful in 
uh, leveling up all of your units. And now, uh, when you do the Elf Ascension, uh, each stage you will be getting an increasing amount of these uh, Night Shield tokens. Uh, when com you complete both uh, the Elf Ascension Normal and Hard, uh, from one rotation you will have around a bit over 200,000 of these tokens, I believe. And uh, you can do quite a few uh, purchases in the Ascension Shop, which you can find on the left side. From here, I'll try to explain uh, what each item is and what you should and should not buy. Uh, so first of all, uh, you can find all of the items in here. There will be some uh, miscellaneous items, uh, a few rides, some monster pieces, as well as two different outfits. So first of all, uh, let's start with what you should buy uh, every week. And this is my recommendation. Uh, because you can uh, use these pieces to exchange them for different ones so uh, you should buy the beast monk and inagami pieces every week uh, in total this will cost you 3300 per week and they're really not expensive compared to the amount of tokens you get every month uh, this will allow you to build either these units or just skill up different units or uh, exchange them for even other units in the uh, monster piece exchange so uh, yeah, and spoiler alert, uh, the Fire Beast Monk is actually pretty good in PvP because he has Silence, which is uh, an amazing skill uh, for completely disabling the other person's abilities. So uh, yeah, these two uh, are a must buy in my opinion every week. Uh, for other items that you should be buying, uh, these will not be constant items, but I do recommend uh, purchasing uh, research logs for the summoner that you are playing so uh, if you aren't uh, sure what these mean uh, element research log uh, refers to skill ups that can only be used on Orbia uh, heal research log is a skill up that can only be used on uh, Hina and protection can only be used on Cleave so for example since I play uh, Cleave as you can see, I can purchase a protection uh, skill up and it will act the same way as a regular skill up, except it will uh, only work on a specific champion. So as you can see, if I uh, go to the protection log and use it, I do get a skill point uh, for click. Okay, so uh, these two are the things that you should buy every week and you should have enough coins to buy them consistently. After that, uh, here are the purchases that I recommend doing uh, in this order. First of all, uh, you will want to buy one of these two rides. They are completely identical. The only thing that's different is the color. And uh, these are by far the cheapest rides uh, that actually increase the movement speed from the base one that you get. So uh, usually you get the Pathfinder Bear, which will have the normal movement speed. Uh, and this uh, stallion will be your access to having a ride that has a fast movement speed. Uh, a lot of events only give out normal movement speed rides, so uh, this will pretty much be the best option to get it and probably the cheapest option uh, that you can get it at first. Once you buy these, uh, uh, also I just wanted to mention that uh, movement speed is very important in some PvP content like Battlefield, so definitely invest uh, into buying a ride with a fast movement speed uh, after that uh, the items you should buy are these outfits they will take quite a few rotations to save up for especially if you are buying these uh, research logs as well as monster pieces but after a few rotations you will be able to purchase both uh, the uh, pinwheel outfit as well as the destiny scroll outfit and you can see the effects that you get at the bottom once the full set is completed. Uh, this set will give all assassin units 459 HP and uh, this set will give all mage units uh, 402 HP. So you can prioritize which one uh, you prefer, but I would uh, recommend buying both of them. And yeah, after that, uh, I would recommend saving up uh, the rest of your secret energy. Uh, Worst case, if you find out that you have purchased everything, so for example in my case, I have already bought uh, a stallion, I have bought these pieces, I have bought both outfits, and I'm pretty much starting with this rotation, I'm left with a lot of uh, disposable, uh, what they're called, uh, night shield currencies. Uh, I will start buying all, 
element research logs for, or not element research, but research logs for all three summoners. Uh, this will be the, by far the best way to spend them, and since there will be a skill point merge in the future, uh, they will be pretty useful for whichever champion you play on. And the one thing you should not be buying is, under no circumstances that you should be buying, is these secret energies. Uh, they can be acquired from the repeated quests uh, that you find here, and the price of those uh, in the Trial of Ascension shop is outrageous, and I'm not sure why they even bothered adding them there. Uh, you can get 5 of these secret energies for one repeat request, meaning that for free you get 100 each day. And uh, to buy around 100 of secret energy here, you will need to waste around 50,000 uh, Night Shield tokens, which uh, are quite a big hit and the 100 secret energy will really don't impact your game that much. So definitely do not buy the secret energy, these are complete scum for the price that they are. I probably would only consider buying them if they were like uh, probably like 10 times cheaper, maybe at like 50. I would consider them a decent purchase, but at 500 per piece, uh, it's completely ridiculous and you should not be buying. I'm not even sure why they put that limit up because no one will definitely never spend that amount on uh, the secret energy in the shop. So yeah, uh, that's about it for the shop and let's move on. Okay, and the last thing I'll talk about uh, regarding 12th Ascension are these uh, powers that you see on the left side. There are a total of four different uh, power of Ascensions. Uh, and uh, the first one, Immemorial Power, has everything to do with your summoner. Uh, the summon power will power up all of your units. Uh, the third and fourth ones uh, will buff up all of the... Uh, both units and summoners, however, they have uh, different uh, buffs. So the first one has more to do with uh, sort of supporting buffs. So uh, the cover is given, meaning that uh, the heals you do uh, will basically heal for a little bit more. Uh, the recovery received will basically the heal you get will be slightly increased. Uh, some of the recovery given uh, and yeah, stuff like that. So some of the recovery given means that uh, the recovery you're giving Witcher summoning skills, so mainly with Kina. Uh, and for monster recovering deceived, uh, that there ha has everything to do with your monsters. So uh, the heals that your monsters do and the heals that your monsters receive. And celestial power it has everything to do with elemental buffs. So for example, uh, you can buff up a single element by quite a bit. So for example, if I wanted to buff up my wind element, so I can see that. Uh, the wind summoner for example damage taken from wind will be reduced uh, uh damage taken from uh so monster damage taken from wind uh then there is summoner damage dealt and monster damage dealt uh with a single element keep in mind so uh, if you power the wind one but you end up using the water one it will not carry over and you will need to power up the water one uh separately I will not advise you on which ones to power and I'll leave that choice to you. However, if you do uh, uh, look to gain some power from these, uh, keep in mind that uh, the actual uh, team power will only be gained from the first two. Uh, since these are not uh, technically skills, no, not skills, but uh, they're not technically stats. They don't actually give any power. They only give the effect that uh, written here. Uh, for the first two, however, uh, since these are uh, actual stats, so stuff like HP, attack, and defense, they will buff up your overall power. Uh, the thing is, when you buy an upgrade, uh, you will not see the usual power uh, pop-up uh, show up. However, just to show that uh, when you power up, if you go back to the main uh, menu, you will see that your team power has increased by a quite a bit. Uh, if you are looking to gain mostly power, uh, keep in mind that the summon power will be uh, the one uh, to choose because uh, monsters usually contribute to like 70% of your total power and increasing stats of the summon power uh, will do way more benefit than increasing uh, stats of your immemorial power. Uh, however, both of them will increase the power by a little bit. So far, uh, the upgrades that I'm getting for summon power, like uh, the level 16 uh, will give me around 400 to 500 power in total. 
Uh, if I wait to power up the immemorial, so for example level 15 of life aura, it will give me around 150 or so. So the summon power will be a, a few times more impactful as far as power goes, but uh, the ones you power up uh, will depend on the exact stat that you're aiming for. I do recommend uh, powering them all equally, somewhat equally at least, uh, with a little bit of focus on the stat uh, that you are looking for, because if you level up this to for example level 18 like I have and you leave this at level 1, you'll find that the level 1 and 2s are extremely cheap. Uh, compared to the next upgrade for an expensive one. So let's say level 19 of Guard Aura costs 11,000 of these uh, Knights uh, tokens, 6,000 of the green ones and 3,000 of the yellow ones. Whereas the, for example, level 3 upgrade uh, will only cost like 300 and 100 of the green ones. So eventually you do want to branch out uh, into different powers and even in the same tree you do want to power up different stats. Uh, so yeah, as a reminder, uh, the first two will give you power. I personally recommend summoning summon, uh, focusing summoning power. Uh, after that, I do recommend focusing in the model. And uh, once you feel like uh, these are getting a bit too expensive for you, uh, do try to level up some uh, alchemy and celestial power based on the element and uh, the buffs that you're looking to get. And by the way, uh, to acquire this currency, I know that this might be a little bit confusing for some, so uh, to get Night Shields, uh, you have to do Trial of Ascension and you get an increasing amount every um, stage. Uh, for the other three, you will have to head over to the Spires of Ascension and select the Celestial Tower. Uh, once in here, uh, the base stage that you do uh, will give you the rewards shown in here, so it will not give you any... Uh, of the uh, different currencies. However, once you clear this stage, you can actually go into the same stage and when you click enter, you will actually see a uh, challenge written at the bottom. So, uh, for example, unable to place a fire monster a team. This basically means that uh, you must clear the stage without a fire unit and you can also uh, check all of these stages for all three levels uh, that will be required. So. You can only clear them in a row, so this means that to proceed to the next challenge and get the next token, you will need to clear this stage. So, for level 1, uh, it's basically beating the stage again, but this time not using a fire unit. Once you beat that, you will get 5,250 of these tokens, and these amounts will increase the further you into the tower you go. Uh, once you do that, uh, you will unlock the level 2 quest, which will give you, I believe, these... Uh, one, one of the either yellow or orange ones, I forgot the order in which they go. And after you clear level 2, you will be able to clear level 3 for the other token of these two. Uh, sorry, since I don't really remember. Maybe I can actually check right here uh, on these challenges that I've done. Okay, it looks like, so yeah, so for the second challenge, uh, you get the uh, token of guard, so the orange ones. And for the third one, you get the Rahil medal, so the uh, yellow ones. So yeah, uh, for those, uh, you can acquire them in the Trial of Ascension and Aspire for Ascension, and you spend these to uh, upgrade various buffs for uh, the tower. And sometimes you can get them in small amounts from the events, so usually when the Trial of Ascension is set, uh, you do get uh, as few of these uh, from the event by clearing up to floor 20. Uh, the amounts aren't huge, but if you are just starting out, they will be quite significant and allow you to uh, upgrade quite a few stages in the power up tree. Okay, and following Trial of Ascension, I'll quickly cover uh, Spires of Ascension, so you can find it in the left menu next to Trial of Ascension as well. Uh, the concept of the mode itself is quite similar. Uh, these are basically six towers, all you can see of them here. Uh, and they have various different challenges after them. So these powers of ascensions uh, will grant you pretty decent rewards. Uh, however, keep in mind that these rewards are a one-time thing only. And no matter which summoner you play, uh, they will not carry over. Or rather, they, the progress will carry over uh, through all the summoners. So this means that you cannot... Uh, do uh, these power of ascensions on, uh, for example, Cliff, and then do it once again on Orbia. Uh, the stages that you already completed on one summoner will remain completed on any other summoner. 
Uh, and the same thing happens for both the Celestial Power of Ascension as well as the Elemental Power of Ascensions. So first of all, I'm gonna cover the Sparse Ascension because this is sort of the main mode that you will be focusing on. Uh, Sparse Ascension is uh, mostly uh, used for uh, upgrading your uh, Power of Ascensions because uh, it is the main source to get all three of these different currencies apart from Night Shields. Uh, Night Shields, if you didn't watch uh, the segment previously, you get from Trial of Ascension. And these three you get uh, from uh, the Spires of Ascension challenges. So, uh, Spires of Ascension, uh, as I mentioned, does not reset. Uh, however, uh, the rewards you get from here increase uh, the further you go. Uh, so, first of all, on the first clear, and for example, let me see where I can find one. Yeah, so for example, uh, I'm currently completed level 66, so uh, after completing level 67, uh, first of all, you'll get the reward that is shown right here. So for me, it would be this uh, completely useless rune. Uh, also, don't overvalue the runes you get from here. They are completely useless and you can pretty much insta-sell them uh, once you uh, have the ability to gather legendary 5-star runes. Uh, so yeah, uh, after clearing it first, I would uh, receive uh, the rewards that shown here. After clearing the challenge, or after clearing the stage, uh, you will actually unlock the challenges as shown at the bottom here. And uh, we can switch to, for example, level 66, uh, where I can already see the challenges uh, unlocked. And these there are three challenges in total. Uh, the first challenge will grant you these green tokens. Uh, the second challenge will grant you these uh, orange tokens. And uh, the third challenge will grant you these uh, yellow uh, heal medals. And all three of these currencies are used uh, for upgrading higher level uh, powers in the Power of Ascension. So at first you will only need uh, Night Shields, but I think it's only for first two levels. Starting at level three, I believe you already need uh, the green ones. Yep. Uh, then the further you go, uh, you will start needing the both the orange or bronze ones as well as the gold ones. So for example, you can see that uh, for level 10, let's say, uh, you already need these orange ones. And do they start here? Okay, it looks like for level 8, you do need some bronze ones. Uh, for level 10, for example, you do need some green and orange ones. Uh, the further you go, the more they will cost. As you can see, for level 20, it already costs like 11,000 night shields, 6,000 green ones, 3,000 yellow ones. And basically... Uh, Spire's Ascension is the main uh, way to acquire these and these challenges, how they work is after you clear the stage, uh, you will need to clear the same stage, uh, however, you will need to meet the condition written at the bottom. So for example, for this stage, uh, I, am, I cannot place any windy unit, so if I used a windy unit in this stage, you will see that condition turned red and it will actually not allow me to enter the stage because I do not meet the condition for the challenge. However, if I do not have any wind units in my team or I simply just leave the slot open, as long as there is no wind unit in this team, uh, I will be able to enter the stage. And if I complete the stage, uh, it will count as a completed challenge and I will receive these tokens of test. Uh, after completing level 1 challenge, uh, level 2 will unlock. And after completing level 2, level 3 will unlock. And basically you'll have to do this... Uh, for each stage and you will see the progress by these little uh, white bars uh, in next to the floor number for each stage. So for like uh, 54, I think I completed all of the challenges. Uh, the harder ones do get a little bit difficult, especially the conditions if you haven't uh, built a lot of good units. So for example, for this one, it's quite hard for me because, well, I mean, the challenge doesn't even show up. I'm not sure why it's not showing up. Perhaps this is like a bug of some sort. Oh, for this one it does. So for example, uh, for this stage, I will need to place a water monster and I would also need a warrior monster. So I do these. Uh, the warrior, you can see uh, the type of the unit at uh, next to the monster picture in the top right corner. So I place this, a water unit, I place a night unit, and I already can enter the stage. The third unit you place doesn't matter because uh, the condition requires you to add units instead of uh, prevent some units uh, from being placed, uh, like the previous example with uh, not having any wind units. 
So uh, basically you do the base stage first, uh, you climb it however uh, far you can, then you can come back to the stage and do these challenges one by one, or you can just do stages one by one and then right after the challenge one by one, it doesn't really matter. As long as you complete it, uh, you will be good. And now the second part of Spires of Ascensions are these elemental towers, so let's quickly go over them. Uh, these will be pretty self-explanatory, so I don't... I won't keep it uh, too long of an explanation from my side. Uh, basically, uh, this is very similar to the Spire of Ascensions in the Celestial Tower, except there will be no challenges uh, to complete after you do the stage for the first time. Uh, the only challenge which eats uh, elemental uh, stage is that uh, basically uh, in the fire elemental stage for example uh, all of your elements will have to be of the element of the tower so for example for the spire of ascensions uh, tower of fire uh, all of your units will need to be of the fire element the summoner can be of any element uh, you can modify that according to the stage or just modify it after you enter the stage or if you see that one of your elements has higher power than the others uh, you can choose that but basically for each uh, tower of a center element, uh, that specific element will have to be used. So do keep in mind that you will need at least uh, three monsters of each element. However, in uh, some cases you can complete uh, the tower quite high even without any units. For example, uh, I know that for the light and dark ones I usually struggled uh, and I think I completed like 25 stages just with the summoner alone because my summoner was pretty strong and I didn't have any light units. And even to this day, uh, my light unit selection isn't really that good. As you can see, I only have two uh, six star maxed, uh, what they call light units, and the third one is only level 60. Uh, the same story for the dark ones. I pretty much didn't have any dark unit choices. I, pre uh, I have like these three. Uh, there's also Zinc who is pretty decent in it, so yeah, uh, you have to choose a certain element to do it, and the only rewards you get are the rewards shown here, there is no other hidden rewards, and the rewards here are pretty decent, except for the runes and weapons, uh, some items, stuff like spellbooks, uh, really do help out a lot, so make sure to not miss out, but uh, also do not rush, because these part of uh, towers are pretty difficult, and you will have a hard time dealing with them in the beginning. Oh, and we finally arrive at the battlefield uh, guide. I don't know if I can call this a guide because I'm firstly not that amazing in battlefield. And yeah, by far, uh, currently battlefield is extremely unbalanced. So don't get uh, enraged if you notice that you're dying in a second to people who are like tiers, like, and I mean tiers above uh, your skill level. The matchmaking is completely unbalanced, but that's partly because uh, there are not enough people uh, playing the game currently. However, if that changes and a lot of people join into the game, uh, you will see that the battlefield will definitely improve. And most likely it will improve uh, with uh, better matchmaking. So uh, similar to the Brawl Arena, uh, battlefield is currently locked to these times and these are local times once again. You'll also see that there's a second tab uh, here, which says available and unavailable. Uh, this refers to the availability of entering the game with parties. So this is sort of a first uh, first action on how the developers are trying to ba balance out the game a little bit. Balance out like the matchmaking a little bit. Uh, and this was to prevent uh, high tier parties from completely wiping the enemy team if they do get matched together. So uh, people do have an option to play at different times uh, based on uh, whether they prefer to play with parties or not. So what this refers to is for the time of this local time again. So if we are to play on the first iteration of uh, Battlefield being open today, uh, that would happen at 6 p.m. until 8 p.m. And for this period, uh, the game can only played, uh, be played on solo. And if you are in a party with uh, one or two members, you'll actually not be able to even enter uh, the game at all. And uh, 
for those uh, times where available is marked, uh, for those times you can enter both uh, either solo or uh, with a party of one and two people. And that way uh, the matchmaking is, is usually a bit more uh, team versus team because the people who play solo uh, usually want to play in those uh, non-team available modes. And for those who do want to play with teams, only pretty much have the option to play uh, when teams are enabled and that will usually there will be of course a lot of solo players still but the gameplay will be more uh, team versus team and uh, there will definitely be a lot more uh, team fights a lot more 2v2s 3v3s and stuff like that so whichever time you choose to play at is completely up to you i personally enjoy both of them because uh, the, the, the gameplay trust me the gameplay does differ uh, based on which time you're entering because uh the gameplay when parties are available is very different and more team focused than uh, in a solo mode where people are a bit more uh on the running around side i'd say uh always splitting up and i like to split up as well myself uh maybe not gathering in such large groups groups do still happen but may usually not uh not as big groups as when team modes are available so yeah just play around with both modes see which one you prefer to do and just uh, choose the one that you prefer so yeah uh, the basic idea behind a moon shadow forest is that it is a 9v9 uh, pvp area and the goal in this uh, dungeon is to collect 50,000 points up uh, first or basically before the enemy team does it or if uh, neither of the teams are able to uh, collect 50,000 points in the amount of time that the dungeon lasts, uh, the team with the highest points by the time uh, the timer ends uh, will be the winner. And uh, winning and losing still gives you rewards, but uh, the victorious team, will you'll notice that gets way better ones, so you do want to always go for the win. However, the current way... Uh, come to us balance the rewards and the ranks is in my opinion horrible and it does not encourage winning it encourages a uh, solo play uh, stealing kills uh, farming kills and even if those kills don't really contribute much towards winning yeah well that's what we have i hope that gets uh not necessarily fixed but changed uh, to focus more on winning but if you notice that whoa, uh, there's like 3,000 points we're missing and the enemy is getting close as well. And instead of that person going uh, for that additional, uh, a few bits of mining to secure the win, everyone will just go kill people because they want to uh, increase their record. Don't be surprised. And yes, that will happen. Uh, there were numerous games where we were winning like 40,000 to 10,000. And just because people weren't... Uh, playing for points and simply went for kills and some of those we, games we did lose so it will be a bit annoying if you're especially playing for the win but just be prepared for that just it's just a broken system that we have to live for for now but yeah uh, in the uh, fight I will show you an example of the fight uh, by the end as well but in that fight uh, you will see a pretty large map uh, there will be multiple spawn points for people and uh, the main way to gain points is to either kill enemies, uh, get assists by killing enemies, or uh, mining and purifying uh, the mined mana. So, uh, actually, you know what? Let's just jump into the game, and I think it will be a bit easier to explain that way. Okay, so this is a game that I recorded. I don't know when did I record it? Uh, Probably like a week ago uh, so basically you, you get mashed uh, with a set amount of people uh, and once the game starts uh, you will be spawned into the battlefield and I'll quickly explain what's happening right here so uh, first of all I want to mention that I do pick the monsters you should plan on using in the battlefield in the lobby because uh, if you don't you only have 20 seconds to all first of all prepare your weapons prepare any potions that you want buffs that you have uh, you will need to walk here you will need to be mounted uh everything will have to be ready for you and you only have 20 seconds for that so you'll usually not have enough time to ruin everything up so i do recommend having the team you plan on using uh 
already ready when you're uh, queuing up for the dungeon. And in here you will see, uh, yeah, so first of all, this is the spawn platform. And if you look at the map, you will see these little uh, platforms here. There's like five per hour or something. And each of these are possible spawn platforms. Usually you spawn uh, in groups of two or three, depending on the amount of people in the stage, in, in the game, not the stage. And uh, in this, whenever the timer ticks down, everyone who is standing in this little, uh, it's not a circle, it's like an oval shape, uh, will get teleported into the battlefield uh, right next to the uh, entrance, not the entrance, right next to the uh, spawn platforms uh, that were right here. Uh, and basically, uh, once you teleport it there, the battle starts, uh, you can see the scores at the top right here and these are the point counters uh blue is one is always yours and the red one is the enemy you can see the full map with all of the uh, map points which i will explain once uh, we move towards the middle because you will be able to see more of them uh these are the teammates uh, that you have and uh, i usually turn this off but here you can see their names uh, the summoner they're using and their summoner hp so for example if you're playing with someone in a party, uh, if you're walking together, you can always refer to this uh, little screen, this sort of a window, to know whether they need a heal, for example. If they're like sitting at 20% HP, it's better to, for you to heal if they don't have any healers. And yeah, uh, apart from that, let's just jump to the game. I think it will be a bit easier to explain. So yeah, uh, if you if you notice, this is annoying and something I recently found out. So if you do not have a horse uh, when uh, spawning, you can either walk around in circles for like 5 to 7 seconds or you can just click on this little horse icon and you will instantly be mounted. And by the time uh, the timer uh, star gets hit zero, uh, you do want to be mounted because if you're not, uh, you will miss on that early rush for uh, points or early rush for kills. And yeah, we're quickly gonna skip over this. Oh, did I expand the map? I did expand the map. That's perfect. Nice. Uh, so yeah, this is the whole map. There are 20 spawn points in total. Uh, one of the sides will be, uh, or maybe two of the sides will be reserved for your team spawns and uh, other two sides will be reserved for enemy team spawns. And this is how the map looks. Uh, essentially, uh, these four blue ones are pretty... Uh, these four blue dots are really not essential to the game. I don't know why they're even here. Uh, but they're just an in-game shop, the same shop that you can find in the, uh, where is it, in the Moon Shadow shop. Basically, it opens this shop, but you usually don't need the shop unless you are looking to buy uh, some emergency pickaxes. By the way, this is horrible value, buy them with gold. Or the covered potions, which are also horrible value, and if you need them, buy them with gold. And yeah, uh, these, uh, apart from the blue ones, next to them are these four uh, spots in each corner, I guess you can say. And uh, these are the purification areas. Uh, and purification areas are places where if you stand there for around half a minute, I think. It's a, the last, I don't really remember timing the last time, but I think it's around 30 seconds. Uh, if you stand in that circle for uh, 30 seconds, uh, the mana that you currently have in your inventory will be purified and will be added towards your points. Uh, keep in mind, you will see like a little timer, so you won't need to guess uh, how long it takes. But uh, once that mana is purified, it's added to your score and it will affect your team score as well as the rewards that you get, especially if you place in the top three or have like the highest score uh, from them. Uh, then uh, you can see these little uh, gems. So there are eight. Uh, these are not shown because I'm a bit too far to render the uh, map points. Uh, but there will be eight in total right here. And mining these uh, will give you 70 undefined mana each. So uh, the way you mine is just the same way you gather uh, regular materials from professions. And... Uh, it does depend on the pickaxe tier that you have, so uh, you do want to enter battlefield with at least purple tier or higher pickaxes. I use purple tier myself, I don't want to waste legendary ones for it because the difference isn't that huge, but the difference from the purple to blue ones is pretty huge, so I would recommend uh, going for the purple ones at least. And in these points, uh, you can mine uh, unprocessed mana and you will get 70 
uh, mana per each mining tick. So basically uh, every every 2.5 seconds, if you're using the purple one, you'll get 70 mana. Uh, that mana will be added to your inventory like three seconds after it drops on the ground. Uh, then there is this big circle in, oh, by the way, uh, these ones only have uh, 25 charges. So uh, if that specific gem has been mined 25 times, it will actually disappear and you'll have to do any of the other gems. Then there is this big gem in the middle. Uh, this one has way more uses. I think it has like a thousand uh, times that it can be mined. And mining this one will give you 100 mana for each mining uh, tick. And yeah, basically this is the main spot you go uh, when the game starts. You will see, it, probably you will see it in this game as well. And uh, yeah, so it's always, the, if you're mining, it's always best to do this. However, keep in mind that this is the very center, so it's usually the most dangerous as well. And uh, when mining, uh, keep in mind that if you do die, uh, you will lose all of your uh, mana stones that were into the find. So you have to sort of find the perfect balance between uh, mining, staying safe, and defining them at uh, decent periods of time. So, And the last thing before we jump into the game is this uh, little red boss icon. Uh, two of these are spawn in game and they usually spawn on opposite sides, but they can sometimes uh, just walk while you're in the uh, waiting lobby right here. And uh, while they could spawn like here and on the other side, they might just, one of them will walk here, the second one will walk here and they will be pretty close. But yeah, uh, these ones, uh, when killed, they will drop 1,800 uh, undefined mana to the person who damaged it first. It doesn't matter who did the most damage or anything like that. As long as you do the damage first, uh, you will be the one getting mana once he is killed and you can identify whether you are the one getting mana or not uh, by checking his name above the head. So uh, if you notice that you're hitting the boss and uh, the boss's name is written in red, uh, that means you will be the one receiving the boards. If you're hitting the boss or if, if before even hitting the boss, you can see that his name is uh, dark gray. That means you will not receive the words even if you're the one who kills him. So. Uh, usually people do like to rush it uh, at the very beginning, but if you're far away like that, it's not worth it, you're not gonna get it. Uh, for example, for this boss, I would say the people who could compete to get it in is like these people who spawn right here and the first three who spawn right here. The rest of the team uh, definitely has no chance getting it unless uh, people just simply don't know how to play it at all and don't get that boss. And yeah, uh, once the timer starts, you all start here. Uh, you'll see that we're gonna rush. This is the purification circle that I was talking about. You basically have to stand in here to purify our mana. And yeah, we're all rushing towards the middle. Uh, then there's these little things. Uh, these are like the mini bosses. And uh, instead of dropping 1,800, they drop 450 mana. So it's still good to kill them. And uh, yeah, as you can see, I was the first one to hit him. And because the aim is dead, uh, I will be the one uh, dropping mana. So they drop here. You pick up close to it and you get uh, for 50. This is how undefined, uh, oh, it's sky stops. I'm gonna call them mana because it's a bit easier to just uh, call them that way. So yeah, uh, the undefined uh, stones will be visible above your name and it will be visible not just to you, but everyone in the game. So be careful, people can hunt you if you have a high amount of stones. Then there's these little phases, uh, so each of them will drop you 400 mana as well, so do try to get them when you start the game. So I guess you can see they're one shot, so they're very easy to kill, and yeah, you'll be able to get. Basically, uh, in the beginning of the game, usually everyone rushes to the circle. Whether a fight happens or not depends on the people who play, but usually uh, people will stack up. Uh, some uh, people might want to engage in their fight, some might not. I personally play very passively, but that's because I usually do other stuff while playing and I just play on my phone and PvP on the phone is a bit difficult. So yeah, I do have an excuse there. And yeah, people just pretty much mine here. You can see uh, the total amount of stones you can mine. It looks like, oh, maybe it is 500, not 1000. And yeah, we're basically just fighting here. Uh, I didn't notice an enemy behind us, so I really screwed up in this one. So always be alert of all of the enemies, uh, either by turning around on the map or just watching the map at all times. 
So yeah, I think I died here because I just didn't notice uh, the person behind me and it just caught me off guard very badly. And yeah, as you can see, fights are just regular fights, really nothing special about them. Uh, you will see that I currently have 1670 of these mana. And while gathering mana does count towards the total score, it counts like 50 or 60% of it when you gather. Uh, it counts for another 100% when you purify. And if you die with that mana, uh, you will see that I died. I lost all of the mana and the person who killed me uh, picks up all of the mana. It picks up as unprocessed mana, so we'll, they will still need to process it to get the full amount. Uh, but from that 1600, they got like probably around 900 uh, points just from uh, picking it up. So yeah, be very careful because uh, Battlefield is pretty unbalanced and the people who are fighting can be way, way stronger than you. And yeah, the bad thing about Battlefield is that when your unit dies, uh, they die for good. And usually I recommend to just uh, swap out the monster that's alive and revive your units instead of uh, switching to different units. I don't know if I'll do it right here, I don't remember really. I think I do like, right? Yeah, I started mining here and during that time I just I bring my tea on, I just revive both of the units right here. Uh, so they are back to the fight. I think I'll heal up one more. And yeah, then we're back to fighting uh, regularly. Uh, I don't recommend mining these, only if you're doing something else during that period, like changing runes, uh, changing monsters, stuff like that. Because mining those only gives 40 mana uh, per each, uh, what you call it, per each mine, so it's definitely not worth 40 points. And yeah, uh, the rest of the game, I mean, I won't show the full thing, because really nothing special matters, uh, mostly mine. I'll see if I can find myself purifying it, so yeah, I just... Uh, at like 2.5k, I decided to go purify uh, my mana finally. I go to one of the circles uh, that is available on the map. You can go to any, it doesn't matter if it's on your side or on the enemy side. And you'll see that the timer starts. It's a bit covered here, let me wait for it to... Yeah, oh come on. Uh, yeah, you, you can see it basically. Uh, this will start ticking and once it hits uh, the very end, uh, this amount of... Uh, points will be added to the final account so yeah during this time you can do whatever i decided to heal my units a bit and once you purify let's wait for that to happen in just a second and uh okay so you can see uh the final has been completed and you obtained uh, 2.5 thousand points and yeah that th those points were added to the progress and you're back to fighting and basically you repeat all of this process uh, until one of the teams reaches either 50,000 or the timer ends and the team with the highest points wins. So yeah, uh, I forgot to mention this. Uh, when you kill a person, uh, you will receive 600 points. Uh, you will not receive any mana apart from the mana that they drop. Uh, but for a kill, you receive 600 points towards your team. Uh, for an assist, you will receive 200 points. And yeah, you can see all of the dropped mana, so he had 450, I picked it up because I killed a person who had 450. Uh, it looks like we're doing some killing, but yeah, people do like to run a lot, and I can't blame them because uh, the matchmaking is really bad, and when like 6 people gang up on you, there really isn't much you can do. Honestly, don't know if we win this game, but yeah, I'm just going to purify again. Uh, you can see assist there, uh, just to check the rewards for you. Uh... There we go. Uh, someone else killed the unit that I was damaging, so assist gives you 200 points. And yeah, it looks like we might actually be winning this. So yeah, you purify, and uh, I think the win clearly should be pretty close. We're gonna reach the 50,000 here in time. And usually you reach 50,000, I'd say uh, it's decided by the timer like once every uh, maybe five to seven games. And yeah, uh, the total rankings that you see here. Uh, there we go. No, stop it. Uh, okay, so this is how the rewards are distributed, and you can find more detailed uh, info about how the rewards work if you enter the bell field and click on this tip icon. It will show you a, def a, a very detailed breakdown of how it works. But in general, uh, everyone on the winning team uh, receives 8,000 uh, sky stones, uh, three seals, and 50,000 gold. Then, uh, based on your performance, you get additional bonuses. So, 
First of all, uh, the top three will receive additional uh, sky stones uh, for their placements. I'm not sure if they receive seals, but uh, let's check actually. Yeah, it looks like uh, rank 2 receives one extra seal, rank 2 receives uh, two extra seals and some extra sky stones. Then, uh, people who got a battlefield title will receive extra sky stones and seals based on their title. So, as you can see, rival is the first uh, rank, and it <laughs> looks like everyone in the game got a rival rank. And those will add additional uh, rewards here. You can see in the blue letters uh, or blue numbers. 500 extra sky stones and one extra seal and you can see a detail once uh, I believe you were able to see them here Yeah, there we go. Uh, the very last line 500, 500, 1000, 200. So there are four titles and the total reward will be, uh, be uh, determined on the title that you got And uh, the very last thing that bonus the, the bonuses that you get and probably the biggest impact in the whole game because as you can see uh, the person who placed 5th place got a higher reward than 4th uh, and 3rd place uh, is these uh, MVP medals and there are 3 in total I know there will be some more in the future but for now there are 3 and these mean that uh, for a certain action that player was the best at doing it so uh, as you remember each kill gives you 600 points that means I got 2 kills and I got 1200 in total each assist gives you 200, so I got one assist, and uh, this is the total mana that uh, you both mined and uh, purified. Or I uh, got from killing at least. Uh, any way that you get mana basically counts there. And uh, all of these are added together to get the total points amounts. Uh, so ranks are based on the points, and uh, the MVPs are based on the individual actions. So. Uh, this person has been the kill MVP, meaning he got the most kills uh, and each MVP rank that you get uh, will give you additional rewards. So as you can see here, uh, each MVP medal will give you 3000 sky stones, one victory seal for the winning team and a bit less for the uh, losing team. So this person got three extra, uh, 3k extra sky stones. I had uh, the most mana purified than mine, so I got 3k for uh, this medal. And uh, this guy in the first fifth place uh, got the most assists, so he got five assists, and he got three thousand uh, mana as not mana sky stones as an extra devote here. So sometimes it's even more important to get a medal than uh, to place in a higher rank. However, placing in a higher rank will also give you some extra stuff. So uh, do at least either of those if you can do both. And yeah, this pretty much. How the victory rewards are distributed? Losing the rewards work the same, it's just that the total rewards are lower. So instead of base 8000, you get 3000. Instead of uh, the rank rewards being like this, uh, they're a bit lower. MVP gets instead of 3, uh, they get 2000. And yeah, you get just gist of it. And you saw the fight. Uh, I'm not sure what else is there to go. Oh, yeah, shop, shop, of course. Cannot forget the shop. Uh, so for the shop, uh, it's a bit different because you will see that a lot of purchases are gated behind the rank that you have and the general idea behind the rank is uh, these are the rankings that you can unlock and uh, when starting you will be in the guard rank but as you get more kills you will receive uh, different titles and the top one is the war hero so if you see a war hero in your game and you are like a combat at one uh, short advice run uh, long advice, uh, run even harder. And yeah, uh, for the shop, I would say you can safely ignore uh, tools in the company tab. Uh, do not use sky stones for these, only buy all of the stuff with gold. Uh, for outfits, uh, you will eventually want to upgrade this one, but it does cost a lot. So do decide whether uh, these rewards that you get here are a bit more important to you than uh, the outfit. And for this one, uh, you will receive one devil mon uh, this is uh, a single purchase uh, this is not weekly not monthly nothing like that uh, whenever you reach a new rank you will have the ability to purchase devil mons and yes while the prices are a bit outrageous i do recommend purchasing these devil mons because devil mons in my opinion are even more rarer than getting 200,000 stones of course i'm not warrior 2 so i cannot buy it but the next one for me will be knight 3 and uh, once you reach Warrior 3 and War Hero, you actually get the ability to buy the with with victory seals. And uh, 
they will refresh every month so basically this is uh, the goal for you to reach uh, starting with water 3 you will be able to have a another permanent source of uh, devil mons for the rainbow mons uh, I would say they are decent value I personally bought I know that I bought the four star rainbow mons quite a few times from here because the one price is cheap and since I'm not reaching water 3 anytime soon I will have quite a few victory seals left so it's a decent purchase uh, these do not touch these horrible prices uh, durability stone is another decent one uh, for the price uh, it's a very good trade in my opinion uh, these ones i personally wouldn't touch they're a bit expensive uh, and first of all you will need to level up to what you want to even get the blue ones so yeah uh, a bit expensive in my opinion not worth it these uh, basically sell for a lot of gold but at the price they're sold here not worth it at all and uh, what I buy, so basically uh, you have the ability to buy 4 star devil mons uh, 3 times a month. I do buy those because I do want 4 star devil mons, you might not. And you can see these are the one time uh, devil mons that I bought uh, from my rank. And yeah, uh, I think the shop is pretty self explanatory. There really is only a few items that you can buy, so you either save for devil mons. Uh, you save for the outfits or you get some uh, extra uh, crafting materials or materials for uh, equipment and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, I think that that's all about Battlefield and we'll move on. Okay, and now let's start with uh, one of the hardest uh, PvE contents right now and it's the Galagos Ruins which you can find here uh, next to Kairos Dungeon. This is extremely uh, an extremely hard dungeon that a lot of you will have a lot of trouble completing. I personally cannot even start completing the uh, first stage of the last floor. So yeah, if you're even weaker, you will have a lot of trouble with it. However, the good thing about this is that it's pretty easy to get into at first and even if you're quite weak you will have a pretty easy time beating at least the first floor i would say and even in the first floor you can get pretty good materials for a lot of uh stages so uh first of all i'll describe what galagos ruins is in general so it is sort of a preset uh dungeon with a lot of different stages uh, some of the stages are uh regular ones and those are indicated in white color uh, however they do have uh, these certain icons and i will explain what each of them mean uh in a second uh there are these orange ones which are considered uh, to be elite battle areas or mini bosses as i like to call them and uh there is the last stage which is the final boss and that's by far the hardest uh stage of the floor which pe most people will struggle at and whenever you do a certain floor uh, in a lot of cases uh, the boss floor is the one you will probably end the run on because uh, the previous stages compared to the boss are nothing even close to how hard the boss actually is so do not be worried if you are only able to do like floor one floor two uh, I personally uh, also, Galagos Ruins is new content, so uh, we're only on the second rotation so far. For the previous one, I was not able to pass a floor 3 boss. For this one, I was able to pass it, but I am currently stuck on the very first stage and I already uh, gave up on it because I used a lot of my monsters and I simply don't have a lot of monsters built for it. So yeah, Galagos Ruins will be a bit challenging, but the rewards you get for it are, are amazing and you definitely want to uh, invest into doing them. So uh, the Galagos Ruins will have several conditions and a lot of stuff can be explained here at the uh, left side. So Galagos Shop will go over in a bit. Uh, the thing you need to know about Galagos Ruins is the magic order, which will show you the uh, various uh, conditions for the dungeon uh, these are the selected monster tabs and I will go over over them in just a second as well and uh, the research status which always shows you the current power-ups that you have uh, and these do they set uh, every every rotation each rotation is around two weeks I believe so the next one will reset in four days and 
they usually they set on Thursday. That's when uh, most of the game has uh, a lot of big updates. That's the uh, the night from Wednesday to Thursday is basically the update day for someone's World Chronicles, and all of the major updates, all of the new events, uh, the Galagos Ruins CD sets always happen on that day. So keep that in mind whenever you are planning to do uh, each of the content here. And uh, to start Galagos Ruins, you will need to first of all select uh, anywhere from 10 to 30 units uh, from your monster box. And uh, you should plan on selecting them based on the magic order that you see right here. And in a second, I'll jump into more detail about each of these things as well as various stages. So let's go over one by one and I'll explain how to do all of that in a second. Okay, so the first thing we'll talk about is the magic order. This is probably the first thing you should check whenever uh, a new Galar's Ruins season starts or you're entering the Galar's Ruins for the first time for that rotation. Uh, the magic order is sort of a, uh, what do you call it? Requirements as well as the conditions for the current season. Uh, these, All of these, uh, both buffs and conditions change every season, so... Uh, you will need to do some slight modifications to your team every time uh, the Galagos Ruins resets. And for this uh, rotation, uh, there are four of these uh, conditions that you can see. So the first one uh, will buff up your summoner. Uh, the second one will buff up your monsters. The third one uh, will show you what requirements uh, your monsters need to meet before you can even enter the dungeon. And not the dungeon, but the Galagos Ruins uh, in general. Uh, and the fourth one will show you the buffs that creatures have. Uh, so for the summoner, uh, this rotation, all of the summoner damage is increased by 100% or basically doubled. Uh, if you are using a summoner of water element, this means that uh, whenever you fight in the Galagos Ruins for this rotation, it's uh, pretty much recommended to use a water uh, element weapon for it because while you can use different elements and they might even give you better uh, buffs based on the skills that you have there uh, the water element damage is buffed uh, two times which in a lot of cases even if your weapon is for example your wa uh, water element weapon is significantly weaker than let's say the wind one uh, even then uh, that weapon will usually do more damage in the galaxy ruins for that season so uh, whenever you use skills, for example, uh, you can do something like uh, using the skills for the wing one real quickly. And when you use the skill that you needed, uh, quickly switch back to the water weapon or whichever element weapon is currently uh, buffed. And that way you can maximize on your damage from the summoner. And this will be important because uh, the general strategy for the Galar's Ruins is to actually just go solo without any units once you get a little bit stronger. Uh, because the units only have a limited amount of uses that you can do each rotation and you do want to save up on them whenever possible. Next is the buff for uh, all of the monsters and for this rotation for example all of the wind monsters damage is increased by 100% or doubled as well. So uh, basically this means that it is a good option to, for example, focus more on wind damage dealers or just bringing more wind units in general. Uh, you don't have to follow it that much. It's just a nice buff to have. I personally don't look into this much because currently I'm quite limited on the overall monsters that I can pick. So uh, it doesn't really impact me, but the more monsters you will have in the future, uh, the more you should pay attention to the monster buff that's currently uh, running in the magic order. Uh, the third thing, let's talk about the creatures. So this is of course a bad thing for you because all fire creatures uh, defense will be boosted by 50% meaning that uh, whenever you encounter uh, fire creatures in the uh, any of the floors uh, they will have higher defense and uh, basically you will need to hit them a bit more before you can kill them. This could be annoying especially if you encounter stuff like I think in this rotation there was like fire undines who have a lot of healing and that 50% uh, defense that they have definitely makes them that much more uh, harder to kill. And the fourth thing is the most important thing because if you do not meet these requirements you will not be even able to play Galagos Ruins. 
So uh, whenever you have to pick the monsters, uh, you will need to meet these three conditions. So first of all, you will need to place uh, at least three water monsters. Uh, of course, these are always change uh, every season as well. So just for this one, uh, you need to place three water monsters. Uh, you need to place two warrior monsters and you need to place at least one water archer. And the last condition is actually something I struggle with because I did not have any water archers. So... Yeah, placing three water monsters is pretty easy. I had quite a few, so that was easy to meet. Uh, for warrior monsters, it also wasn't hard because I have uh, stuff like bulldozer, lizard man, uh, the wind ifrit, and many more. Uh, the last thing was quite hard to beat because, as you can see, all of the leveled water units are either knights, or supports, and yeah, um, basically. Just to meet that condition, I had to bring uh, the water ifrit, who is a water archer type. The problem with that is it's sort of a wasted slot because I, well, the Ifrit is not leveled up, he's not skilled up at all, and he basically just takes a spot. But uh, if I didn't put him here, basically I wouldn't be able to even enter the Galar's Ruins, so uh, yeah. It will be a, sometimes a little difficult to meet the condition, but hopefully it doesn't take too many slots if you do not have the units built, and I mean, in this case it would take worst case six units so you would still have 24 units that you can pick according to your lighting so it's not too difficult but it's still annoying that it sometimes takes a slot uh, that of a unit that you do not have so yeah uh, for magic order that's it and now we'll jump into the other uh, options here okay now for the monster selection so before you can enter galgos ruins uh, you will need to pick up to 30 monsters however you must pick a minimum of 10 because if you do not pick 10 it will also not allow you to even enter the dungeon at all uh the monsters you pick will depend on your box and that's probably why i will not be advising you on specific units you can pick however i will give you the general strategy that i feel helped me and from the insight that i have after doing two of these rotations so uh, one thing I found out is you should bring uh, quite a few uh, revivers in your team. At this time I only brought a Theon, which is sort of a mistake, but luckily I actually didn't have to use him at any point because my units actually just managed to carry me through this. And I also got very lucky with the buffs from the dungeon itself, so I didn't need to rely on the reviver. The good thing about revivers is you don't even need to have them in your starting team. Uh, you can enter with your main uh, three units into the dungeon. However, if one or more of your units dies, uh, you can simply uh, take one of the monsters that are currently alive, uh, swap out your reviver. Your reviver doesn't even need to have any runes. Uh, swap in your reviver, uh, use a reviving skill, and uh, take out the reviver and swap back into uh, the main unit that you just took out. That way you can continue uh, the dungeon with the same team even if your unit dies because if your unit dies you'd have no other way to bring it back unless uh, you either revive it or restart the stage. And don't be confused by the bar here, it's not their HP bar, it's uh, their usability bar which I'll cover in just a second. Uh, another tip for uh, this dungeon is usually to try to focus more on uh, first of all damage units and second of all uh, healing units because in a lot of cases uh, especially if you're not a player who specializes in playing Kina so for Orbia and Cleave uh, healing will be a little bit difficult to come by uh, both of those champs do have self-healing but in later stages that is simply not enough and you may end up dying a lot and keep in mind that if your summoner dies uh, you will fail the whole run so it's different from just a single monster dying. Uh, so for that I do recommend bringing a lot of supports. I personally bring uh, quite a few healers so I have uh, the Water Lulu, I have the Light Howl, I have uh, Konamiya as well as Theon for healing. Uh, there is Chloe for healing, there is I think there was one more if I'm not wrong. Oh yeah, this guy, uh, the Rakunia for healing, and it's better to just have a lot of healing options because uh, you can always beat it uh, with less damage, but if you do need heals, you will not be able to beat it if you cannot heal up your units unless you stand there for like 5 minutes healing all of your units with potions, which I wouldn't recommend to do because 
you only have 10 minutes to beat each stage and after that you will automatically fail if you do not beat it in the, uh, the specified amount of time. Uh, the good thing to bring is also one or two speed buffers because there are these uh, stages called trap rooms and basically they do not have any enemies however they have very difficult sort of mazes with a lot of traps that uh, either push you, uh, burn fire on you, stuff like that and to pass them you need to strategize a lot and time your uh, walking patterns and dashing patterns pretty perfectly. For that, uh, units that buff up your movement speed will help a lot and for this I do bring two of them. Uh, I brought my Bernard as well as my Water uh, Har who both have... Uh, Bernard has level 2 speed buff and he has level 3 speed buff. Those did help uh, in some uh, trap stages for this. I didn't go specifically into trap stages but there were some trap stages which were difficult to pass without the use of these units so I did bring some of them. And they did help quite a bit. Uh, other than those, uh, do try to bring a lot of damage units because in some bosses uh, the main strategy is to actually just straight up nuke them. So uh, you can do some setups with for example the dark uh, harpy Helia who can set up a defense break as well as a branding effect on the boss. Uh, this allows you to nuke them uh, very fast. And that's actually the strategy I went for one of the bosses, I believe. Uh, where instead of just trying to out-survive the boss, because the bosses usually hit for a lot of damage and sometimes even one-shot you, uh, a good strategy is to just uh, bring some sort of a safety. For example, with uh, the uh, Fire Epicion Priest, you can make yourself invincible for like 5 seconds. In that period, you can, for example, defense break the enemy and quickly nuke it with a lot of damage dealer units. So, for me, uh, this guy held because I built him on full damage. He has the ability to ignore defense. He has the ability to uh, strip uh, beneficial effects from the enemy. And he allowed me to sort of uh, nuke a, a lot of HP. Uh, I have to give a shout out to Bulldozer as well. Because uh, he did help me in a lot of boss stages. And uh, he was actually the unit which probably used was used the most for damage for me. But... That's mostly because he's warrior type unit and I actually got very good buffs for a lot of my warrior units. So, uh, yeah, you will need to sort of uh, guess which monsters might be good. I do recommend bringing a few units of each type because uh, some of the buffs you get in the dungeon will uh, only affect a certain type of uh, unit. So, for example, it will only affect, uh, let's say, support units. Uh, it might only affect warrior units and stuff like that. So... You do need a little bit of that diversity, otherwise uh, if you get a buff that can only buff archers and you only bring uh, say like one archer like me, so I have pretty much she's the only archer in my team. Uh, there is this guy but he is not evolved so he's pretty much useless for me. So uh, I do try to avoid archer buffs as far as uh, my picking goes and I usually just focus on getting stuff like support buffs, uh, knight buffs or these are warrior not knight uh, warrior buffs or knight buffs because those are the main monsters that i have in my team but the buffs you pick uh, will of course depend on the units that you have so yeah i, I don't want to give exact units that you should pick but uh, keep in mind that you will need survivors you will need healers and you will need quite a bit of damage uh, when going in and of course don't forget a unit or two with movement speed so you can pass those trap stages if they do uh, happen to come into the way. Okay, now we'll look over the various uh, stage types and the stage type can be identified by checking the icon here or by actually just going over. No matter which stage you click, you can see uh, details about it. And uh, basically, there are several different stage types. Uh, fair warning that some of the stage types you should avoid because they simply hinder your progress. So. I will explain my opinion on which ones you should avoid. So uh, first of all, starting with these, uh, these are the elite battle areas. They are sort of mini bosses. Uh, they're not just a mini boss. Uh, there is a regular stage before it and you can see all of the monsters that will occur here. Uh, but there will be sort of a mini boss or actually several of them uh, at certain points of the stage. So usually one at the end and usually a few during the stage. For this stage, the mini bosses are the uh, 
water and dark ifrits as well as the water and dark uh, vampires. And this is the stage just I was stuck on because I did not have the ability to kill the dark uh, ifrit who actually heals like every 3 or 5 seconds up to full. So yeah, I'll have to work on uh, that team in the future. But yeah, you can identify all of the units that will be in a stage and you can check what each unit does by just going over them and reading their skills. I don't recommend going too deep into the skills because a lot of the regular units will be quite weak and you should mostly pay attention to the uh, actual units uh, available in the game because those will usually be the mini bosses. So for example, for this stage, you should look at all four of the uh, these units because they will be mini bosses in this stage. You can identify uh, which ones will be mini bosses uh, because the mini bosses are usually units that actually exist in the monster box. So uh, while these units are just uh, random fillers in a lot of the dungeon content, uh, the actual units will be a little more difficult ones and uh, those will be awakened and there will be actual real monsters that you uh, could summon but they will have more HP, they will have more attack and there is a chance that it will simply one-shot you. Uh, okay, going over the other stage types, uh, there after the elite bosses, uh, there are these normal battle areas. They are basically the same thing as the elite battle areas but they do not have uh, a certain uh, elite monster. So it will basically be just filler monsters across the whole thing. There will not be any uh, sort of elite mini boss types. So you will be able to pass them pretty easily. Uh, the third stage type is this uh, stone statue room. This is actually the easiest stage type because uh, first of all, it does not have any enemies at all. Uh, you simply enter the dungeon. You will have the ability to buff up your team for with either one, two, or three buffs. Uh, you will have you will see that when you enter, you will enter this main room, and that main room will uh, go uh, will split up into three or less rooms. So there will be three rooms at all times, but some of them will be closed depending on the stage. So for example, in floor one, you usually only have one of the rooms open. In floor two, you have two uh, rooms open. In floor three, I haven't tested, but I, I think you will technically should have three floors open. And you will be able to enter each of the uh, side rooms and pick a certain buff uh, for your team. These will either be uh, buffs for uh, the whole team, for the whole rotation. Or uh, they can be the sort of special thing which actually heals your monsters. So uh, I don't think I talked about this actually. So uh, just after the stages, I'll touch on it. Uh, there might be buff towers which will uh, simply not give you any buff. But instead uh, restore the usability meter uh, of your units. And uh, the usability meter is actually the amount of times you can use a unit. So... Once you are uh, completely drain the usability meter, that monster will not be available for this season anymore. And usually in a fight, you use like uh, 20 to 30 percent. So on average, you are able to bring the same unit into the fight for like four to five times. So uh, for easier stages, you should uh, save them up a bit, uh, not use all of the OP units at first stages because. Uh, once you go into the later stages, you will have trouble uh, beating those bosses if you only have weaker units left. So yeah, uh, with the stone statue room, you have the ability to get a lot of buffs and a lot of healing for your units, depending on which uh, buff will be available. After that, you simply go to the exit that will be in the corner and you have passed the stage. However, uh, since this stage is so easy, you actually do not get any of the in-game rewards. You only get some buffs or some healing of uh, for the current season. Uh, another room type is the Ghost Merchant Encounter. This is pretty similar to this stage, but uh, there will be no enemies at all. You will enter the same room and you will have a merchant that is available to uh, be used. And you can buy some limited quantity items from it. Spoiler alert, uh, these items he sells are usually very overpriced, so I wouldn't recommend ever picking Ghost Merchant unless he's like the only option you can do. So for example, uh, since it can, after beating uh, stage 1-1, one, one, uh, you can split into three different stages. I personally would pick the Stone Statue Room, and I'll explain why I won't pick this room in a second as well. 
uh, if you are only left with a single option, so for example, uh, if you were to be uh, stage 3-3, you only technically have an option to go to 4-2, yes, uh, you will have to enter a stage even if it's useless then, but I would recommend avoiding this stage at all costs. Uh, another type is the Ancient Galagos, Galagon, I guess, world. Uh, this is uh, similar to the Ghost Merchant, it does not have any enemies and it also uh, should be avoided at all times because I've entered it twice and the loot you get from these chests are extremely bad. I would say they're sort of comparable to the regular treasure chest that you find uh, all across the map and it's just a waste of uh, using an entry in Galagos. So definitely don't go into these. There is a chance that the rewards will be a little better in the later floors, but I think I entered them in like floor 1 and the rewards were abysmal, so I wouldn't recommend picking Ancient Galagon, however you can experiment entering it once at a later floor, so like floor 2 or floor 3, even floor 4 if you manage to reach it, and uh, see the rewards that are available there, but if you do not want to test it out, I do recommend going for the, for example in this case you would uh, probably best to be picked uh, on the stone statue room because it actually provides buffs for uh, the rotation compared to these two who do not and simply act as a reward uh, for in-game entering. Also, uh, to not pick the stone statue room, I also recommend picking uh, regular rooms if they are available even over the stone statue room. Uh, because the regular rooms will actually give you the rewards that can be used in the uh, Galagos shop and it's, in my opinion, the better uh, option even over any of these regular uh, special rooms. So, uh, the battle room, uh, I wouldn't comp compare to other ones because the battle room is probably one of the best options apart from elite and boss battles. So, since it does give you the rewards, it gives less but it gives you the rewards. And after each of the regular battle stages, you will also get one buff. Uh, so it will be usually less buffs than the stone statue that you would get from. But uh, you will still get a buff on top of all of the rewards. And the main reason you're playing this content is for uh, these tokens as well as these refined stones. So try to focus on stages uh, that do give uh, these rewards. Another type of stage is the unknown sector. Uh, you cannot check any info about it, but it's usually uh, very similar to a normal battle area where you will enter and you will fight either regular monsters or in some cases even some uh, mini bosses and you will get the rewards at the end. However, uh, you will not be able to plan it uh, because you simply do not see any uh, enemies right off the bat. There is a sort of a cheat code which you can do with these stages is by simply entering the stage with your summon and only. Uh, that way you can just uh, dash through the stages and check what monsters are in the stage and plan according to that. And not only this stage, you can actually do it for all stages because uh, when you use your summoner only you don't lose any HP and you are able to just check all of the stages uh, that will be happening in the future and that's the way I do it as well. Before doing a regular run, I just uh, take my cleave, I put up some potions, I put up some self-healing and just try to dash through the whole stage to see what's in front. And based on that information, I can later on uh, build a team around it. And uh, what other stages are there? Oh, the trap sector. This is the one I talked where you will need uh, movement speed units in most cases. Uh, there are no enemies in this room, however, there will be a lot of annoying traps and some of those traps do do a lot of damage, so uh, I would recommend bringing both a movement speed buff as well as a healer, if you are not able to pass it without them. Uh, there will be various different traps, so there first of all will be spikes that you do some damage, uh, there will be these fire pits that will shoot fire and do quite a big amount of damage. Uh, there will be these extremely annoying wind turbines which will push you like halfway across the map so those will be super annoying to deal with. Uh, some of the stuff that isn't shown in the picture there will also be these uh, falling icicles which will uh, first of all give you slowness and uh, keep constantly pushing you into the center of the 
storm, meaning that the only way to get out is to be either super fast or just dash out of it. So always have at least one dash saved. There will also be some falling rocks, uh, which will just uh, do a lot of damage and give you slowness. So yeah, uh, whenever doing the trap stage, I do also recommend going in uh, without any units. See how far you can go, see where you struggle and pick your team accordingly to that. And I think as far as the regular stages, that's about it. Uh, the last one will be the main boss battle. And uh, usually these do not have any monsters before the fight. Uh, you go straight up into the boss room and uh, you will have to deal with several bosses. I'm not sure what the bosses are in floor 4, but for floor T, for example, also don't be mistaken because even if you see two monsters or for floor 3, there were three monsters. I think there was like... Uh, the light spider, uh, this guy, and another unit. However, in total there were actually four bosses in the fight because uh, after killing one of the bosses, for example, uh, if there were three bosses here, let's say, uh, after killing this boss, uh, the third boss spawned in his place. And after killing the second boss, another third boss uh, spawned in his place. So. There may be more bosses than are uh, shown here and to discover the exact amount of bosses you will need to actually fight uh, before you can uh, enter uh, or not enter but complete the stage. Uh, another self-promotion tip is I do Galagos videos uh, every rotation so if you want to check these stages uh, before entering them yourself uh, you can subscribe and make sure to follow those videos as I usually upload at least the early stage uh, pretty early on into the rotation. Uh, so you can follow along and uh, see what units will be available and strategize based on that because uh, the stages uh, will actually be the same for everyone. Uh, they will not differ and uh, for example this rotation I know that a lot of people are struggling with floor 3 bosses because first of all uh, the boss is pretty hard and second of all the boss is actually bugged. So a lot of people are actually complaining on the forums and I'm not sure if Comptos is even taking the time to fix it, but hopefully they do. Or at least give some sort of a compensation if they do not manage to fix it in time. But yeah, uh, that's another way how you can uh, quickly go over what uh, stages are there and plan accordingly. And uh, let's jump into the next uh, segment. Okay, uh, now let's talk about the research status and the buffs that you can get from completing stages. So after doing 3 floors, I currently have 21 active effects and you can either check all of them uh, one by one here or you can just open up the full research effect uh, menu and see all of the buffs that you have here. You will receive these buffs after every uh, stage, well almost every other stage. You will receive them after regular stages, you will receive them after uh, elite battle stages, after boss stages, and you will receive multiple ones in the stone statue rooms as long as you're not doing the statue room in floor 1. You will not receive them after the shop and I believe you do not receive them after the walls, so that's another reason why I don't recommend entering them. I don't quite remember if you receive them from the unknown one, but I'm pretty sure you do. So yeah, I, the, you do come across a lot of them uh, pretty often, so in total I was able to get 21 out of like a total of 30 stages or something. Uh, the current buffs I have, I actually got very lucky with the buffs this rotation because it allowed me to easily complete floor 3 boss. Uh, because of one of the, uh, I think yeah, the moves damage over time applies level 2 attack speed up, crit rate up. Uh, when receiving a damage over time effect and the whole strategy behind that boss is that they apply a lot of damage over time effect. So basically I was immune to that. That's what allowed me to complete uh, the dungeon very easily. But uh, the buffs can uh, be several types. So first of all, you can either buff uh, the summoner or a, a monster. Meaning for the summoner, you will only buff your summoner. For the monster, you will only buff all three of your monsters that are in the field. Uh, you can also get a buffs for a specific type of monster, so all warrior monsters, all support monsters and stuff like that. Uh, one more tip I want to mention is, actually I'm not, I think this is a bug currently, but some of these summoners actually have uh, types attached to it as well. So 
For example, Cliff is actually considered a knight type monster, meaning that uh, whenever you get a buff or a knight type monster, uh, it will actually also work for a summoner. So uh, you can try, sort of try to use it uh, whenever you see that uh, the buff will be of a knight type unit, for example. I think Orbia is considered uh, a mage, if I'm not wrong, and uh, Kina is considered support. Although I'm not quite sure about Orbia and Kina, so I do recommend uh, checking those two out with the community. And uh, second of all, keep in mind that this bug might be fixed, uh, so it might not even work in the future. Uh, of course, I do not have the ability to predict whether that will happen or when it happens. So, for if you're watching this uh, video recently after uploading it, uh, it will most likely still work, but if you're watching it several months from now, uh, keep in mind that that might no longer be the case. And yeah, uh, for buffs, yeah, you can either buff summoner monsters or a specific monster type. Uh, as you can see, I usually I do recommend uh, prioritizing buffs for monsters over summoners because monsters do uh, pretty much carry the fight uh, a lot of the time unless you are an Orbia user in which case uh, Orbia is sort of a very good damage dealer so she might even do more damage than all of your monsters combined in that case you can prioritize your summoner but as a cliff user I prioritize my monsters because I'm just a basically manually walking tank so uh, I'm there to absorb damage and I'm there for my units to let them do damage so for me, I focus on monsters and uh, for you, of course, designed on the team and uh, the current buffs that you have. And uh, the way buffs look, I'll actually show you in one of my uh, videos. So uh, if you notice here, after a stage, you will be presented with three options and you can only pick one of the buffs. Uh, so in this one, I think this was quite early. This is like floor one. So the floor one buffs will be pretty low tier there are different tiers for them so there will be magic so i think that's the one of the lowest there will be the blue one uh the purple one and the orange one being the strongest so basically the same way our uh, rune tiers work or the summoner equipment works basically uh white being uh, the weakest then the green one blue one purple one and orange one i don't really remember the how they are called like the magic grade legendary tier is orange ones i think uh, but yeah, uh, the buffs will get better uh, the later you go into the uh, floors and I think at like floor 3 most of them were either purple or a legendary tier so uh, they will get better trust me and the first ones will usually also seems to be focused more on summoners because uh, I don't know why but maybe that was just RNG for me but I saw a lot of summoner buffs and pretty much no monster buffs. So for this rotation, for example, after completing a stage, I got either 50% uh, crit damage boost for my summoner, uh, 27,000 HP boost for my summoner, and 50,000 HP boost for my uh, monsters. As I usually prioritize monsters, I think I picked this one. However, I won't, uh, I won't quote myself on that. I can actually check which one. Because oh, it looks like I picked 3 damage, okay? Maybe I had a different strategy in mind. I think... Because uh, for the first two floors, I usually try to go uh, solo or only with a one unit. I think I went with a one unit here, but that was like my very first experience with Galgos Ruin, so I didn't know how to even play it yet. But for this rotation, I went floor one and floor two with only my summoner and managed to actually beat it that way. Uh, this way you do not waste any uh, HP bar on your units and can use a lot of them for higher floors like floor three. So yeah, uh, that's about it for power-ups. You will get the, uh, the feeling on how they work uh, when you start the dungeon because uh, I don't think the buffs are the same for everyone. So uh, I'm not gonna quote which buffs like are best to pick and stuff uh, as those will depend on your box, will depend on your summoner you use and the general strategy that you're going behind. So yeah. That's about it for the power-ups and the last thing we'll jump into is the shop. Okay, and the Galagos shop now. So uh, you can get these uh, Galagos coins from doing uh, regular and elite uh, stages. 
regular ones will give you less and you will get more the higher the floor uh, your bidding is so for floor two for rather floor four uh regular stage will give you 3.3k elite bosses will give you 5k and the boss will give you 13k however uh yeah i, I was not able to beat any floor fours uh and from this rotation i think i got like 50 to 60 thousand coins or something like that uh, there are a lot of good items to buy here but personally i only recommend uh buying the devilmon uh, as your main purchase after that i like to buy four star devilmons but that's mostly because i uh test a lot of uh, various net force uh, you might not need to buy it so uh feel free to skip that one just make sure to buy the five star devilmon uh, there are some scrolls, uh, some galaxy stone boxes, uh, which are basically craftable items uh, for uh, your runes, I believe. Uh, and there are these Galaga's treasure chest. Not recommend buying them because even if you get 500,000 gold from it, uh, gold is very easily obtainable and uh, you should not waste uh, such a premium currency on them. Uh, this don't... Uh, I don't think I need to explain why, but if you saw the how you get Breath of Lives from various different ways like uh, secret dungeons and uh, monster exchange pieces, uh, just don't don't even click on this button so you don't buy anything by accident. Uh, outfits are good, uh, however they are quite expensive, so if you're interested in getting a buff for support type units uh, to get a little bit of HP, uh, do consider saving for it. I know that I'm personally saving for it because I am a big fan of using support type units and multiple ones in a single team. So uh, that purchase will be important for me. After that, uh, you can spend it accordingly. Uh, these ones I wouldn't recommend buying because uh, all of four of these you can actually just straight up craft from the alchemy section. And uh, although they look pretty expensive, they really are aren't that bad uh, all three materials that you can see here can be easily mined apart from this one i think but this one is uh, you get quite a lot of from various like boxes you can also buy it not for too expensive so i wouldn't recommend uh buying materials uh, looks like you can even use the borbos magma which you can get from path of growth to make it even cheaper so yeah i don't recommend uh, buying these because they're pretty easy to craft uh, what I do recommend buying personally, of course, uh, I know that this game, uh, what they call it, uh, not a sprint but a marathon. I am not a fan of buying uh, light and dark scrolls from the Galaga shop or just any other shop in general because, first of all, uh, you do have the ability to get light and dark units from regular scrolls. Second of all, uh, I've looked over light and dark units and in this game, uh, they're really nothing special compared to the regular net fives. And yeah, I personally don't think that having a single uh, light and dark unit will give you that much progress into the game. And since uh, the rates to get them are pretty good and we do get a lot of uh, light and dark scrolls in general, I personally am not a fan of buying those. So yeah, first of all, make sure to buy the Devilmon. After that, uh, invest into the outfit if you feel like it. And the rest of the coins you can either save up for the upcoming items or invest how you feel fit. Now we're quickly gonna go over events and what type of events uh, you can find. So first of all, uh, I will mostly be covering uh, the events that are always present in the game. Uh, I will not be focusing too much on the limited time events. So, for example, uh, events such as, uh, they're usually under the season event tab, uh, so stuff like uh, that lasts only a certain amount of times, as you can see, this one lasts 23 days, because these will change a lot, and uh, yeah, since they change a lot, they will not be relevant like a month from now, and there might be a better or a worse event uh, later on, so right now I will be only covering the events that are always happening. Uh, they either are constant or they happen every few days, stuff like that. So first of all, uh, the main view to enter your event page is by clicking on that uh, little box, little gift box at the uh, top right, uh, top left actually corner. 
Once here you will see a lot of events, you might be overwhelmed at first. I even went on my alt account just to show you that uh, all of these events because on my main account I actually don't have quite a few of these because they were already completed and simply disappeared. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna start first uh, with the uh, playtime reward event. This is an event that uh, resets every day and you basically get a chance to receive all of these rewards if you stay in the game for 4 hours or more. Uh, do not worry as the progress can carry over for one day, uh, meaning that as you can see here, uh, the progress I made here was probably like a week ago and I haven't claimed my last reward yet. And if the progress carries over, uh, once you claim the last reward, uh, the event will actually reset and account for the amount of time you played after it. Uh, so basically, even if you miss a day, uh, you can just finish up the next day and uh, start gathering the current day uh, later on. And the rewards you get here are really nothing special. The main stuff, the, I'd say the most important stuff is the account badges and the uh, heal order. All the other stuff is really just fill filler stuff and really not too impactful for the progress. So yeah, whenever you play, make sure to check this reward once a day. I usually check it towards the evening, by then it's already marked out and I can just uh, click claim all and receive all of the rewards. The second similar event is the monthly check-in. It lasts for 4 weeks and uh, each box ticks uh, whenever uh, you log in once. Uh, unlike Summer for Sky Arena, if you play that, it is different from that because it does not reset monthly actually. It resets whenever you uh, max out all of the rewards, so do not be worried about logging in every day as the progress will be kept. So for the week 1, uh, the main reward will be 5 mystical scrolls, for day 2 light and dark, uh, 10 mystical for the 3rd week and a legendary scroll for the 4th. And once you reach the last uh, reward, uh, the next day after receiving the last reward, uh, the event will reset back to week 1 and it's the same thing all over again. Uh, then there are some special events, uh, so Plate of Mystical Summons is actually a limited event, but uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, you just summon Mystical Scrolls and receive a little bit of them back, uh, but I uh, will mostly be covering these two, because these two, uh, while they are limited, at least the 7-day uh, one, uh, it does appear for everyone at the beginning of the game, and uh, in this event, you complete the tasks uh, written in the uh, fields here, as you can see, I already completed quite a few. And on the last day, you actually receive a Nat 5 unit uh, Magic Knight. Uh, I'm not gonna be receiving it because I don't play on this account, it just was made for the story mode. Uh, but basically, if you complete all of the missions for the uh, previous 6 days, as well as the few that are visible in the 7th day, you will receive the uh, Nat 5 completely for free. Uh, now the Devil Mon, it does not have a time limit, but uh, this is one of the main events to receive a lot of skill ups. So I think there are a total of 7 Devil Mons available every second day, starting from day 2. So like day 2, day 4, day 6, uh, day 8, 10, uh, 12 and 14 will have Devil Mons available as a world, I think. And they will unlock uh, one, mi one day missions each day and will stay until they are fully completed. So. There is no rush to do them, but these missions aren't too hard either, and you, if you really wanted to, you could complete them uh, within the first 14 days of gameplay. Uh, I'm not gonna be covering seasonal events because these are limited, now I'll jump over to the achievement events. And the first one, uh, because it's way different from the rest of the events, I'll cover the wanted boss subjugation one. Uh, this is sort of... I'm not sure why they lumped it toward the achievement event, but uh, these, basically you get a mystical scroll once you complete uh, 4 raids in Taladias or Farfalla, and these raids are super easy, uh, you should be able to complete them as soon as you unlock them, and if you do not have the enough power, uh, trust me, the whoever enters to help you, if they are like level 60 or above, will completely wipe that dungeon, so uh, just enter and hope for the best. If something happens just to re-enter and you will be able to complete it successfully and every four uh, days you will uh, be able to claim a mystical form from this dungeon do, do not forget to uh, claim it because it it's quite hard to uh, or rather quite easy to miss uh, you can actually just see uh, the event uh, through the dungeon because once you have uh, the four runs completed uh, this little uh, 
gift box that you see on the right side uh, will have a little uh, check mark showing you that uh, you are able to claim the mystical skull and once claimed uh, these will reset and you can uh, claim a mystical skull from each dungeon every four days and now for other events uh, these are basically achievement events and uh, they will only last once so meaning uh, they do give a lot of decent rewards, uh, but once completed, they will not reset, and these are a one-time deal. For Galagos Ruins, since there are four floors, uh, once you complete floor 1, you will unlock an event for floor 2, uh, and all the way to floor 4, but for others, it's just a one-time deal. So, uh, this is, I believe, for Guild Wars, so once you participate 10 times, uh, you do this mission, it's completed, and it will disappear the next day. Uh, the same thing for a lot of raids, so this is the Kalia raid, uh, the Naraka raid, uh, these two are for the Spire of Ascension and Attribute Dungeons, so pretty self-exploratory stuff, just complete the uh, requirements that are shown in each uh, point and receive the mission reward for it. Uh, Great Path of Adventure, this has to do with uh, your account level, so it maxes out at level 40, which you will be able to reach very, very uh, soon. Uh, I haven't really pushed my account level, and I'm already sitting at level 32. But to raise your account level, you simply level up your monsters, and that's it. Uh, Tenacious Summoner's Way, this will uh, have to do with the total amount of levels on each summoner. So, each summoner has a maximum level of 70 once transcended, but without transcension, uh, you can reach level 60 and to max out this event you will need level 180 in total meaning that you need either level 60 on all summoners or uh, you can rise one summoner higher this means that you will need lower levels on other summoners basically the combination of levels just have to be uh, have to reach 180 uh, you can only see uh, 60 at the moment but uh, once you complete this uh, for the level 60, the new e page it will unlock and you will be uh, able to complete uh, the world up to level 120. And once you complete that, the third page will unlock and in the total you will have to reach 100, yeah, level 180. And you can actually buy summoner pass, so right now we can buy e event pass 1, or is it account level pass 1? No, it is It is the event pass 1. Uh, once this is completed, you will get the event pass 2 and event pass 3 as well. So yeah, uh, for the events, is that it? Yeah, for the uh, ones that stay all the times, so that's it. Uh, the rest of the events are limited, so like stuff like this is limited. At the bottom, it's more of those uh, sort of less limited events. Like they're limited, but they're not even that good as well, so don't be scared if you miss some. Uh, but yeah, uh, as far as events go, uh, that's about it. There are some rare exceptions where an event will only be visible in the forums. So for that, uh, you will need to click the megaphone tab right next uh, to the uh, gift bag. And for example, there is right now an event running that's only for forum users. So this is the Raising Rainbow Man. And in those cases, you will need to claim the rewards through the forum page. I'm not sure why they're splitting this up as it's completely confusing. But yeah, in here, as you can see, I claimed the first three already, but basically you get points, uh, you click on the box, and you will receive the rewards. So yeah, I think that's about it for the event page. And another thing we're gonna be covering is the field events tab. So these are sort of global events. Uh, they happen according to the server time, however, the events that you see uh, here will be shown in your uh, local time. This means that while the server time is like 9 or 10 a.m. right now, I'm not even sure. Uh, for me, it shows my current time, so it's like uh, 16 uh, 47. And you will see this uh, 24 hour clock where each event that will happen can be found. Uh, you can check this, and I believe you can check other days as well. No, this one just switches. Uh, you can check other days through the schedule tab, but we'll jump into that in just a second. So for the events, uh, they usually follow the same uh, sort of pattern. So uh, the gathering slash mining events will usually be on the same hour. Uh, the bosses will pretty much be always on the same hour. So you, you will sort of uh, get used to it if you are participating in a certain event. And 
uh, kind of get accustomed to the time when it happens because uh, for example the uh, boss hunting events uh, will happen at the same time every day and uh, that won't change i think you will basically see the same clock uh, however it might be pushed uh further clockwise or counterclockwise based on your local time so like uh, if you're living in somewhere like united kingdom uh this will be pushed further by two hours because no wait actually it will be pushed uh, back by two hours because uh while my time zone it's like 5 p.m for uh, london it will be like 3 p.m so basically this will show you by your local clock and you can check details about each uh field event uh, by clicking on it you will see the rewards uh, you will see the event info as well as the find button which will basically when clicked walk you towards uh, that area uh, it's not happening now so i'm not gonna walk to it but it will uh, walk right to the exact area where the event is happening so it's a very convenient option to do a few minutes before the event if you want to get prepared uh, the event info uh, can be found here, so it will show you uh, first the location, but location really doesn't matter since you can just find it right here. Uh, it will show you the start time in local time, uh, it will show you how long it will last, so 10 minutes uh, for this event. Usually most gathering events last 10 minutes, uh, the boss hunting event will last until the boss is killed. And uh, these uh, community events, or cooperation events I suppose they're called, it says uh, they last for 10 minutes, but keep in mind that they usually get completed very fast. So at more popular times, they may last like a minute or less. So you do have to be prepared early on. Uh, in more or less popular times, so for example, for Europe, they might not be able to attend stuff like this, which happens 6 a.m. for me. Imagine that happens at uh, 4 a.m. for Western Europe. So those more or less popular times will last quite a long time, but uh, the more popular times will definitely be completed within several minutes. Uh, they usually never last the full 10. And uh, for this, uh, you basically just need to do a specified action. So for how to make friends, uh, you need to do a dance. Uh, for uh, gratitude, you need to pay respects. And I know people get confused by this a lot. And how you do those is you click this little emoji icon or you can either go to the chat and click the emoji icon from there basically for how to make friends you go to the emotion tab and you choose any of the dances uh, that are available here once you dance in the circle that you were uh, walked to uh, you will see that uh, the progress for the event uh, shows as completed and as soon as 100 people do the same action uh, you will all receive the reward for it uh, keep in mind that you only receive the reward if you have done the action so if you arrived a minute late and the event ended already uh well you missed out you should have been prepared earlier and you will not get any rewards however i heard rumors that the way these events are performed will change soon so keep that in mind for uh gratitude you have to do the pay respects emoji so it will be this one and once you do it, similar to the dancing one, uh, you will have uh, the quest completed. Uh, then for gathering events, uh, these are a little more difficult and a little bit more competitive. Not as competitive as the hunting ones, but uh, this one basically, there are several different uh, gathering events. Uh, you can either do gathering or mining. And for this one, it looks like it's tempered metals for both cases. So. Uh, for this one, uh, you will have to mine uh, tempered platinum materials and the way you get from them is you just simply mine platinum materials during the event time. Uh, and yeah, I think you can see all of the uh, materials from this tab. So like for gathering, yeah, field event materials. So uh, there are double pulled mangoes and uh, sunshine chamomiles. And for mining, there will be hardened iron and the one uh, that's available today so tempered platinum and you mine them from the uh, pretty much the second word that's visible in the name so harder iron you mine from iron uh harder uh what is it tempered platinum you mine from regular platinum you can always find the resource uh, on where to mine it by entering the info tab and clicking the rotation 
Oh, actually, no, it just brings you to the event. So yeah, uh, for platinum, temporary platinum, you will need to pretty much uh, find the platinum mineral. And the way you do that is go to the collection book, or go to the mining tab, locate platinum, it's right here. And if you click, yeah, there we go. Uh, you switch to the mining tab and it will show you all of the spots that are available. You click move and you'll automatically be walked towards it. So yeah, for platinum, you mine platinum, for iron, you mine iron, for uh, double pop mango, you just gather mangoes, and for sunshine chamomiles, you, well, pretty self explanatory you just gather chamomiles, and there is a slight chance, well, it's not slight, I think it's like, uh, from my experience, it's like 50 to 60% chance to get uh, the special material from the regular material, so, and uh, the person with the highest amount will be the winner, and basically, uh, the less you get, uh, the lower the spot will be. You can see the rewards for it here. So rank 1 will get 3 mystical scrolls, 50 obsidian. Uh, rank 2 will get lower, lower. And basically good rewards uh, go up until rank 50. And uh, below rank 50 you will only get participation rewards. Most of the time you will get mystical scroll boxes. Uh, also don't overrate these. You will pretty much never get any legendary scrolls, any mysticals, anything like that. Usually you will get like two unknown scrolls and one mystical scroll piece or something like that. So yeah, these, these are pretty useless. If you're looking to participate for uh, these boxes, don't because they're completely trash. I don't think I ever got a single mystical scroll from it and I've opened like several hundred of them. Uh, these stingers are also super rare. Uh, they drop, I would say, like one in every 10, maybe one in every 20 events. I've done like 100 events and I only got like, I would say like seven, maybe eight of these stingers. So they are pretty rare. And yeah, uh, you can find other events that are happening in the future. So stuff like mining events. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, tempered materials for here, you will... Have to does it say what you have to do oh i think no wait that one is visible on the screen so uh the sunlight help so i think this will be one of the gathering events but basically you will see which event you need to do on that day uh on the clock so whenever you feel like participating in an event uh check on the field event tab you will see the event clock and you will see which information or rather which materials you need and now uh, for the hunting competition, this is by far the most popular one, but also by far the most simple one, I feel like. Uh, you basically, everyone meets up in a single area and a huge uh, boss spawns in it. Uh, by now, uh, people are able to kill it within a few minutes. Previously, we had trouble killing it in a half an hour even. But of course, if you are playing on a new server, it will be a bit more difficult, but... Uh, if you're playing on an older server with stronger people, people will get uh, people will nuke it pretty fast. I would say in a few minutes, and you're done. Uh, you will of course receive these boxes, which are pretty useless. Uh, you will receive these ones quite often, I'd say every maybe second, third run or something like that. Stingers also they're insanely there, uh, and you will see the top 50 rewards that you can get from here. I, I personally don't do well in these events. I always end up like somewhere between rank 30 to 50 so i really don't get much from these events and i a lot of times i don't even participate in them uh, but for this event you are basically just looking to bring uh, a little bit of buffs and a lot of damage so go for like attack buff crit buff and maybe two or three damage dealers if you can afford those slots and just try to do the most damage possible and yeah i think that covers uh the field events there will be one field event uh, which is required for one of the missions and i know that's like uh one of the most hunted ones i think it's like pago of canyon or something uh it looks like it doesn't happen anytime soon i think that event if i'm not wrong it happens on either tuesday or wednesday so you will need to uh check up on the schedule uh, i mean i would love to tell you when it happens but sort of just don't remember because i've done it so long ago i'll see if i can quickly uh locate it right here yeah i don't think i will be able to right now yeah these are expeditions uh kingdom patrol perhaps that's it yeah there you go uh defeat pago of rudling grassland so you will need this one for one of the missions i think it spawns 
Tuesday. However, don't quote me on that. It might be like Wednesday or somewhere around there. I just know that it's not on on the weekend, so you will need to make sure to make some time for that. And yeah, uh, I think that's about it for the field events and we'll move on to the next topic. And let's quickly talk about achievements because uh, this is something you shouldn't really overthink a lot. Uh, you can find achievements here next to the rankings and below the guild tab. And basically these are just uh, a way to claim uh, some extra rewards after you do certain tasks. So you can check uh, the tasks as well as the rewards that you get uh, by clicking on each of these, uh, I guess, uh, sort of zones. Uh, I don't even know what to call them. Uh, but my advice on the achievement tab is to don't, um, don't try to do them too much by reading on what you have to do because uh, the rewards you get for the difficulty of the task are usually not worth it. Uh, the only thing I recommend paying uh, attention to achievements to is uh, when you're first leveling up your units or rather awakening your units because each uh, new level of uh, hole of a certain element you complete you will actually get uh, 10 essences from that uh, achievement tab. So if you do uh, the first four levels for the first time, you will be able to claim 40 essences of that element. And that will help you out with the first few levels of awakening. But after that, uh, simply play the game. Don't pay attention to the achievement tab. Uh, check it once or twice a day and just collect all of the rewards from it. Uh, apart from that, uh, forget that it exists. Whenever you find that uh, an achievement is completed, you will see this little rewarded bar light up next to the achievement tab. And uh, that way you can claim the uh, rewards. But the further you go, uh, the worse the rewards will get because it will take an insane amount of uh, effort to do a certain task. And the reward you get from that task will be very, very low. So uh, pay attention when uh, doing those first uh Hall of Magic or Hall of Element runs. Apart from that, uh, ignore that it exists and go on with your day. Okay, now we'll quickly go over this uh, ranking option. Uh, there really isn't much to talk about it, but I still want to uh, touch upon it because it is sometimes fun to compete in uh, the rankings, especially if you plan on competing in them. Uh, so first of all, there is this Hall of Fame uh, and usually just marks achievement of the first ever completion of a certain content. So for example, uh, some of the content you will not uh, be able to no longer acquire in the uh, what is called Hall of Fame because uh, the first time it happens, that's pretty much the, f the only time that you can get the first place. And even if you complete it after, uh, there's no way for you to uh, get a spot in the Hall of Fame. and uh, the only time you can pretty much get a spot in the Hall of Fame is when the new content comes out and you complete it pretty much within the first few minutes. Uh, if you're not online the moment the update drops, uh, you will pretty much lose the spot in the Hall of Fame. But yeah, you can see uh, basically an achievement that someone achieved, uh, the person who achieved the achievement. So for example, uh, the first person who completed the story in our server is Sonic. Uh, he did this on... Uh, 11th of November last year and you can see all of this. I think the Trial of Ascension actually resets every month so you can sort of compete for that uh, but I wouldn't recommend the rushing Trial of Ascension because you do need to do those special rooms uh, to get the maximum rewards. And yeah, other ones are pretty much um, usually don't reset. I think the yeah, Arena uh, should reset and this counts not uh, a weekly one but for this season, so this means every 28 days you have a chance to compete for this uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, same with Brawl Arena because it's very similar to the Challenge Arena and the seasons reset every 28 days as well. Uh, first Master, that's already passed. Uh, the first person to clear certain dungeons, that's already not possible to acquire anymore because uh, those do not reset. So. There are some content that resets, so Trial of Ascension and Arena, so you can compete in those uh, to get a spot for uh, the next month or so. And then there are the leaderboards here. Uh, all of these, uh, they set every week, meaning that uh, if you've pushed uh, for a certain milestone in one of the weeks, uh, the next week you will no longer have it. However, uh, the top uh, spots in each leaderboard will actually get... Uh, 
a sort of a title of uh, for example, for Challenge Arena, you get a title Challenge Finisher. For Brawl Arena, you will get a title of Brawl Overlord. And these titles are basically just uh, tags above your name. I currently have them turned off, but you can access them through the Summoner menu and enter the Titles menu. And here you can find uh, the titles as well as the decoration effect, meaning this is the color and it's sort of uh, the way uh, item related to work. So, like, uh, white has the lowest tier green one, then blue one, a uh, purple one, and legendary one. So you can acquire those titles and uh, you will see them uh, both on your summoner as well as on other summoners. However, I uh, currently have all names turned off to not distract me, so you cannot see them here, but if you don't have them turned off, you will see uh, the title above each summoner. And yeah, you can compete for these pots pretty easily. And yeah, the way to get placed on these leaderboards, I'll quickly explain for each uh, of these uh, methods. So here you can see the ranks that I'm currently at uh, in this week. So keep in mind it only will show you the top rank, especially if there are multiple uh, categories for it. So it will only show you the rank that you're highest at. For example, uh, my Hall of Light has a rank 30 run in this week, so it will only show you rank 30 here. And uh, the way you get these for summoner power, it's pretty self-explanatory, it just shows you the highest summoner power uh, people uh, of this week. And it only counts the actual summoner power, it does not include any of your monsters, so you can see the true summoner power either by taking all of your units out, and uh, checking his, or uh, you can go to the summoner menu and just check the power uh, right here. Now for the monster power, this is uh, the reverse thing, and you actually, uh, instead of counting your summoner power, it will only count your three monsters, meaning that uh, it takes your total power, uh, so if I put all these three, it shows 497, and if you take away the summoner power, uh, 160, and it will show you the highest power of those three units. And you will see that uh, currently I have lower power uh, than the one shown here, and that's because it takes uh, the highest power that was uh, ever recorded that week, meaning that you can uh, switch some runes that would give you higher power. So for example, I have 99k here, and it will register 99k until uh, you switch to a set that will give you higher power, so you can do something like this, and now my current bit has 108,000 power, and uh, if the total uh, amount of power from all these three units was higher with a certain set, it will record that in the monster power uh, box, uh, but once you switch back, the highest recorded power will stay. So you can sort of cheat your way into the leader boss that way. Uh, then for the Kairos, uh, this is pretty self-exploratory. It will take uh, the highest level you can do, and if the level is the same uh, with all people, it will tell. Uh, it will take the fastest run of the dungeon. So for Hall of Magic, as you can see, uh, level 10 is the highest, and uh, the fastest person completed it in a little bit over 6 seconds. I completed it on almost 10, and I'm at around rank 280. The same thing for all of the other Hall of uh, Elements. So uh, usually the Light and Dark ones are really not done that often, so you will place a little higher if you do those. Uh, for these ones, it will be a bit more competitive, because these units are usually like the units of fire, water, and wind element are more common, so people need more essences for them and they farm it more often. Uh, for dungeons, uh, these include all of the raids as well as the seal dungeons, the rupture dungeons, so uh, you can see all of the elite raids like uh, for the prison, white shadow castle, boiling waterfall, and twisted marsh. Uh, you can see both of the ruptures, so sunken ruins and destroyed island, and uh, the seal dungeon, the ruined temple, which I haven't done this week yet. And uh, the highest rank you get in any of those will also show up right here. For the guild, uh, it takes uh, into account your weekly contribution. So uh, it will reset every week and you can see your weekly contribution, I think, in the uh, guild ranking screen. Yeah, you can see weekly contribution as well and it will show you how much uh, points you contributed uh, through here. So you can see daily contribution here as well. 
and you can see how you can get the contribution in total uh, one person per day can get 4300 maximum contribution so uh, usually you don't need all of that uh, in most cases by just doing regular activities you will reach like 2000 and that's perfectly fine uh, the contribution only matters as long as you can uh, collect uh, all of the maximum contribution awards and after that is just for uh, competition in the rankings uh, 12 ascensions uh, for the regular and hard modes uh, it will take the hard, uh, highest stage you can do and for the highest stage uh, it will take the fastest time so uh, people complete uh, the 12 ascension pretty easily so most of these will be the maximum floor for spiral of ascensions is pretty similar uh, however this is sort of uh, it moves a bit uh, less because uh, this content doesn't reset and uh, the people who completed floor 120 usually don't want to complete it again so the fastest times usually will stay and as you can see uh, there are only a few uh, floor 120 completions meaning that even if you have an extremely slow time with uh, 120 if the next person has only 119 you will be above them even with a slower time and yeah there's like uh, what like uh, 12 people 13 people no 14 people who completed 120 and now uh, the rankings will start dropping based on the floor that's completed uh, the same with spiral of attentions for each element so you can see uh, 90 floors are currently the maximum and it will take uh, into account the floor that is and uh, after that it will start dropping based on the floors and the uh, amount of time taken for that floor uh, then profession this one is a little bit more different uh, so there are a lot of very weird material so uh, you can compete in fishing and uh, this is very rng it's sort of just determined based on what you catch uh, but there are different criteria so uh, you can either go for the uh, maximum size fish or the minimum size fish so the minimum size is three centimeters and people usually catch that a lot the maximum is 150 centimeters and this one will be a little uh, sort of easier to get as long as you get closer to the limit and as you can see no one caught 150 this week but uh, there were weeks where people caught 150 pretty easily and as long as you catch somewhere close to this number you will be in the top spot uh, for gathering, mining, and cooking, uh, this most no, actually, uh, gathering and mining will be separate from cooking. Uh, for gathering and mining, uh, it will count uh, the total amount of times you've done a certain profession in that week. So, for example, in this week, uh, I think I particip participated in a few mining events, meaning that I've done uh, a mining profession 633 times and you can see the top person done it uh, 14,000 times uh, what participating in a gathering mining uh, means is uh, whenever you come across a certain plant or a certain ore uh, each ore that you mine will count as uh, one uh, participation uh, and I don't mean by completely destroying the uh, gem or the plant that was here but simply gathering uh, one item will count as one uh, gathering profession score so uh, if you gathered 100 items not 100 plants or 100 ores but 100 items only uh, it will count as 100 score in each uh, profession that you used so this is how you level that one and it's actually pretty easy to get into the top spot if you feel like for example gathering as you can see top 3 is only 3000 and if people are getting 40,000 mining you can pretty easily get uh, 3000 in gathering as well it's just that mining is a bit more popular because of the uh, crafting uh, stuff that you can do with mined resources and for cooking uh, it takes into account the total amount uh, of recipes that you have done so uh, when you do any cooking right here so if I did uh, one recipe, I would get one score. If I did uh, 15 in total, I would get 15 score. And basically that's how it counts a total amount of uh, cooking that you've done in a week. So yeah, I think I covered the uh, rankings pretty much. That's about it. And we'll jump into the next one. Okay, now quick topic. I uh, will cover, since we're covering everything, I do want to address this. Uh, defense tab. This one is very self-explanatory. First of all, uh, defense list. So you, here you can see all of the people who are currently in your list. 
Uh, from here, you have several options. So you can check their uh, inventory as well as the monsters they're using. Like uh, you can check their power, stuff like that. Uh, this button will delete your friend. Uh, I think it needs confirmation. So yeah, only if you want to do that. Uh, this will allow you to uh, make a private message to them. Uh, if you are plan on party talking or stuff like that. And this will invite them to party. I don't want to disturb them. So I won't uh, click this right now. And yeah, uh, basically you can see the basic information about uh, each summoner, so their name, the guild they are in, uh, the summoner they are currently using and their online status. And yeah, you can also filter through them. So like uh, you can, uh, it looks like you can only do login time. So it will basically just show you uh, at the top, it will show you the online people. And uh, after that, it will show you the people who are well logged in recently. I don't know, honestly, I don't know how this works because this makes no sense, like login time, yeah, uh, I don't know what they're doing here, but yeah, don't use that. <laughs> uh, add friend is an option to add a summoner uh, to your friends list by their name, so they will need to be on your server, I believe. Uh, so if you're playing with a friend or something, or uh, for example, you want to join a guild and uh, the guild notice says, uh, for example, uh, DM a specific user for information. I know our guild does that. You can basically add them there, uh, cooperate, and maybe ask to join a guild or something like that. The save request will show you uh, all of the friends requests that others have sent you. So whether they added you through the friend list, uh, you can add uh, people by just seeing them on the map. I, I don't know if I'll be able to see any people right now. Yeah, that doesn't look like, but if you see a person uh, standing on the map, uh, you can simply click on them and uh, it will bring you the option to check their inventory, uh, add them to friends, invite them to party. So that's another way how you can uh, invite them. And that's especially useful if you're doing some uh, team hunting, like uh, in the hero area where monsters are a bit difficult. So you might want uh, some help from uh, the people around you. And yeah. Uh, so this is how you uh, receive the request, basically send the request, uh, the same thing as a quiz just from the other side. So basically you will see all of the uh, people you have sent the request to and you will be able to cancel those requests if you feel like you don't want to be with that summoner anymore. And uh, recent summoners, these will be the summoners that you interacted with uh, recently. So uh, maybe you have uh, done a party dungeon uh, with them just now and those people will be shown right here. Uh, maybe you have hunted monsters with them, maybe you have done PvP with them, Battlefield, uh, fought them in Arena. Basically any person that uh, you recently interacted with uh, will be shown here and you will be able to add them to the friends list from here as well. And yeah, uh, I think that's all there is really to cover about friends list. Uh, it's pretty, pretty easy topic I would say to cover and yeah, we'll jump into the next one. Yeah, I promise to keep the next topic quick uh, because I know I like to spend my uh, sweet time talking a lot, a lot of stuff. So now we're gonna quickly cover uh, the rides and the rides are pretty self-explanatory. It's basically a mount uh, that you can use uh, to go around the world a bit faster. And first of all, uh, as a free one, you will receive this Pathfinder bear and the reason why you might look into buying different mounts is because of the movements that you see on the left side. Uh, the bear has a movement speed normal. It will still be way faster than walking. However, there are better options for it. A lot of mounts you get from the game will also have, not from the game, but from events, uh, will also have only normal movement speed. So uh, you do want to acquire one mount that has a fast movement speed. And uh, by far the easiest option uh, is this uh, stallion. So you can get your stallion from uh, going to the uh, Trial of Ascension shop and you can purchase it from 100,000 of these uh, night shields. Uh, you get over 200,000 uh, of them every Trial of Ascension rotation if you do complete both the normal and hard mode. So. Uh, once you complete them, uh, the stallion should be the, thing, the first thing you pretty much buy uh, because the fast movement speed will be very important in just playing the game quicker overall. 
as well as in some content like the battlefield uh, which you can find right here uh, the movement speed you get is actually very important because you might need to either run away or chase players a bit faster and if you only have a ride with a normal movement speed uh, you will not be able to catch people who have a fast movement speed ride or uh, if you are running away you will not be able to run from them because they will simply catch up to you with a faster ride so the ride you use is completely up to you there are some uh pay to win options per se but usually the rides that you can buy uh max out at around fast so even then if you buy them from the shop i don't know if there are any available right now let's actually see uh because they are sometimes uh rides that can be acquired from the in-game shop uh, using real life cash but uh those usually happens only during updates yeah i don't think there is a ride right now at least i'm not seeing it uh let me ch oh there is there are a few i think these are not limited these are like uh always thing and yeah you can buy a ride that has a fast moving speed but uh, you can simply just uh not spend money on this if you don't feel like and just get a stallion from the trial ascension shop there's also this personal airship package i'm not sure if the description is correct but if what i'm getting is you might actually be able to travel across different continents a bit faster with it although don't quote me on that because i haven't purchased it and i'm not sure about how that exactly works but yeah you will get uh, plenty of rides from various events uh, there will be a lot of uh, rides to purchase from real life shops uh, but uh, by far the easiest to acquire option is the uh, one you can get from Trial of Ascension and you can get that uh, as soon as you complete uh, enough of Trial of Ascension so you will need to complete like I would say around 250 stages or so by clearing one tower and starting another tower by then you will have enough uh, night shield coins to purchase a ride and after buying that you are pretty much safe for the rest of the game because the fast movement speed so far as far as i know is the fastest option for a ride and the majority of players simply use that ride uh, as their main one okay and uh, the next uh, part we're gonna be talking about is this exchange piece option uh, next to the summon one uh, you can get uh, a lot of monster pieces by summoning a lot of dupes for them or by opening uh, these various boxes for uh, monster pieces that you get from various uh, different sources in the game. So this one, for example, gives you one to four star pieces. Uh, there are higher tier boxes. So this one will give you three to five star pieces. Uh, it does not get a lot. It only gives you one piece, meaning that uh, each box will only give you one piece of a random uh, element. Uh, there are higher tier boxes I currently do not have but there are 4 to 5 star boxes and there is a 5 star box as well. Uh, I think I can showcase it one of them through here if I'm not wrong. Yeah, uh, the purple one will be 5 star only so you will get one piece of any random uh, elemental 5 star unit. And uh, once you get a lot of these dupes, uh, you have the ability to exchange them for uh, various uh, different items in the shop. So I'll quickly go over the options that you have to exchange and I'll give you my opinion on what items are worth buying. So first of all, you have the ability to exchange one to five star pieces. You can see the total owned ones at the very top. So usually you will uh, like the lower star grade of a unit is uh, the more of these you will have saved up and uh, the regular trades uh, can be found at the bottom and uh, the yellow colored ones will be limited trades that uh, change every eight hours uh, you can reset these trades for uh, a certain amount of crystals but i don't recommend personally doing so because uh usually the resets are only needed for five star pieces if you're hunting a specific nat 5 but even then it's better off to just wait and as i always say this game is uh it shouldn't be rushed uh the longer you wait uh the more success in this game you will have because uh patience is sort of the key to this game and if you rush things you will 
use up a lot of uh, unnecessary resources for it and later on you might struggle with it uh, because keep in mind that uh, the uh, exchanges you see here are usually uh, more towards losing some pieces so for example uh, if I were to exchange uh, my 2 star pieces into a different 2 star as you can see to exchange one one piece uh, of a two star unit I do need to use three pieces of another two star unit uh, and this uh, works the same for all of the grades so even for net fives to get one piece of a specific unit I need to use three pieces of a different unit and if you rush that a lot uh, you might end up just using a lot of pieces that you might need in the future and you will see that uh, you may have made a mistake which apparently cannot be reversed uh, later on so from uh, regular exchanges uh, the one star pieces allow you to get normal xp potion breath of lives and three star rainbow mons of these uh, i personally only like the rainbow one option because breath of lives just have a very bad exchange rate for the one star pieces and normal xp potions are completely not worth it because you can get like 50 of them for extremely cheap from the repeat requests or by doing path of training in the path of growth uh, what's it called path of growth dungeon uh, for two star pieces uh, you get the same items however the exchange rates are three times better or in some cases even five times better uh, than the one star so the normal xp potion will be a bit cheaper breath of lives will be a bit cheaper and the other ones will be a bit cheaper uh, from two stars, I personally only buy the three star rainbow mods because uh, I feel like these are the best exchange rates. Uh, for Breath of Life, they are a bit uh, too expensive for two stars, but for rainbow mods, uh, I feel like they are the perfect use. And uh, the discount you get compared to the uh, one star pieces for rainbow mods uh, just make it worthwhile uh, to do so. For 3 star pieces, I'm not going to be covering the limited shop, uh, the limited shop will allow you to exchange either uh, the same grade pieces for 3 each or uh, a higher grade piece, so for example uh, for 3 star pieces uh, you can pay 30 pieces to receive a 4 star piece but uh, these exchange rates I usually don't like especially for 3 and 4 star pieces because First of all, 3 star pieces are still pretty difficult to obtain if you do not uh, summon a lot of skulls and keep in mind that if you wish to skill up a unit, uh, you will need around 100, what like 50, maybe 170 pieces to fully skill up a unit. So if you use those up, uh, you might end up without uh, the required skill ups if you do eventually want to build that unit. So be careful and not overspend on the 3 star pieces and above for 3 star pieces you have the ability to buy uh, either 3 or 4 star rainbow mods or the breath of lives and uh, for 3 star pieces I usually uh, only trade them for breath of lives this is by far the best exchange rate I feel uh, it goes one for one and I usually when I need breath of lives I just go to the maximum I select a few monster pieces, I try to leave around 100 to 150 of each monster piece and keep in mind you can mix these so for example I select uh, enough so that there is like 100 to 150 of a specific piece left so I could skill up a unit in case it was needed and yeah once you select all of the required pieces as you can see you can click the exchange option and you will receive uh, the amount that you wanted uh, for the selected monster pieces for four star pieces this is where you actually get the ability to uh, acquire five star pieces and by far these are the best uh, thing to buy usually i personally because i'm still working on leveling up a lot of my units i do not buy four star uh, rather five star pieces with four star uh, pieces that I own because four star pieces keep in mind that first of all you also need to skill up uh, your units in case you plan on using them and that will require like 150 plus uh, skill ups second of all four star pieces also require 50 pieces to max out so uh, if you do not have like 200 pieces of each monster, I wouldn't recommend spending them. Because uh, again, uh, in case a unit gets buffed or something like that and you are left without pieces, 
you might be hunting for a long time for a specific unit to build and may miss out on the golden pace of a unit being buffed. So for four star pieces, I usually don't spend them, but if I do, I would buy the Breath of Lives as well because I still think that Breath of Lives are a very scarce resource in this game and you do need a lot of it for evolving, awakening, uh, leveling up all of your units and we simply don't get enough from the current sources that we have. So for 4 stars, my preferred choice would be Breath of Lies as well. You get 5 Breath of Lies for 1 piece. And I think that is a decent exchange rate as well. For 5 star pieces, uh, you should definitely not be spending them on Rainbow Moon. And uh, the only option you should be spending your 5 star pieces is either saving them for the unit itself. Or if you feel like the unit uh, that you have a lot of pieces for will be extremely useless and uh, you do not plan on using them at all or simply do not like the kid spoiler alert i wouldn't have this mindset on any of the units because uh, in this game buffs and nerfs constantly happen and even as much as i wanted to use up like uh, these 100 fire uh, mermaid pieces because fire mermaid currently is pretty weak i do know that uh, in this game uh, Buffs do happen and significant buffs do happen and at any time a Defire Mermaid might become a top tier unit and if I have spent her pieces on a different unit I might regret it later on so if you are really really hunting on a specific unit uh, do consider spending them uh, through the limited uh, time deals here. And the units that you spend I would recommend spending uh, monster pieces of those units that you can easily acquire back so uh stuff like the fire uh, beast monk the wind uh bomber you can do the light uh what's it called hulk magician uh that way uh even if you spend them and the unit becomes strong later on you still have the option to get a lot of pieces and that's because uh, for the light uh hulk magician you can easily get her from the guild rate and you can have her in decent amounts uh, for the uh, fire beast monk or the wind uh, bomber you can get them from arena shop, guild shop, uh, trial ascension shop basically any of the units or the monster pieces that you can get from these shops uh, you should spend those in case you spend, uh, plan on spending them do not spend uh, the pieces that are not available easily another option is to spend uh, monster pieces that you got a lot from events so uh, if you see that you have like 300 monster pieces skilled, uh, saved up and you went hard on a specific event, you can perhaps use like uh, 100 of those pieces uh, to buy other different units, but I uh, would not recommend going below, for net fires, not recommend going below uh, 100 in the worst case, because that will allow you to awaken a unit to level 15. But if you uh, do plan on using that unit, you will need like a, what is it, like 1700 on 8, not 70, I mean 170 or 180 of these pieces on skill ups as well. So definitely don't overspend it and only spend them if you have the option to get them back or if you have an uh, insane amount of uh, monster pieces saved up, uh, even if you decide to later on awaken and fully skill up a unit so yeah for skill pieces that's i think i've covered all i gave both my opinion of what you can buy and uh, how they work in general so we'll move on to the next topic all right so now let's look a bit into the exchange center and this is uh especially if you're uh, more on the free to play side this will be an important uh thing to do and to use because uh, this is actually one of the best sources for uh, these red crystals that you can get even without uh, spending any money. So in the exchange center it's basically sort of an open market uh, for a lot of items that are available in the game. Uh, however once you get uh, the currency from selling this, uh, these in-game items you can actually uh, acquire even gold or crystals with them so i will explain on how that works uh, how items uh, like buying and selling works uh, stuff like taxes and so on and so on so 
first of all, uh, I will quickly exchange or rather explain the currencies. Uh, so the main currency in the uh, exchange office is uh, these Rahild. Uh, you get them from either uh, selling items. So you can go to the sell tab, uh, check which items you have and sell them accordingly. So for example, if I wanted to sell uh, 100 of these items, I can list them for any price I want. There are some limits. So like for this one, uh, the minimum is 200. I'm not even sure what the maximum is. Uh, the maximum is 20,000. And you can list up to 10 stacks at once. I uh, mean that uh, 10 stacks of 100 that uh, I would list a uh, 1,000 uh, of these, uh, what are they called, rune enhancement stones uh, for a price of, this shows uh, not a total price, but a price for one of these stacks. So the total price you would be getting if you sold uh, is shown here, but even the shown price right here is not the final one because there are still uh, exchange taxes, which will uh, lower the amount a bit. And uh, with this current, oh, also, uh, you can sometimes get some currency from uh, field events, uh, stuff like uh, how to make friends, you will also get uh, 1000 of these, uh, but this is not a huge source compared to how much you can make when selling, so uh, keep that in mind. And uh, with these, uh, you, oh, uh, another thing before I talk about selling them, uh, you can buy them directly with crystals, uh, however, Buying them with crystals is a little bit more complicated and you can usually only do a very limited amount of buying with them. I'll explain in a second why. So uh, the regular exchange rate, uh, this one comes directly from the market. Uh, so you can buy 10,000 of these for 150 crystals. However, uh, whenever players list their heals for crystals, you can actually buy those uh, for a little bit cheaper. So uh, the highest price that players can list their uh, heal for is 140 crystals and that's usually the price that's listed you can list it lower you can list it anywhere from 60 to 140 and uh, basically when uh, someone lists those crystals you can actually buy a uh, rahil uh, for a little bit of a cheaper price uh, one thing i want to mention is that try to not abuse this system uh, with alt accounts because uh, the developers do actively monitor uh, the exchanges and there has already been a big bomb wave uh, that suspended uh, a lot of accounts and some of the suspensions were temporary but uh, there were a few that were permanent as well so uh, if you do uh, abuse the market you there is a good chance that you will be banned because they will simply be able to check up on all of your exchanges they will see that uh, there is some fishy stuff happening with uh, some prices being extremely low and some prices being extremely high and they will probably after some investigation catch you and ban you so consider trying to play it fairly and yeah uh, you can buy these uh, Rahil with crystals however there are different uh, crystals uh, when it comes to exchange market uh, you can see that I have a total of 66,000 crystals uh, but when you click this arrow, you will see that I have 65,000 uh, locked crystals and uh, 900 unlocked crystals. This means that uh, you can only buy a hild uh, with crystals that are not locked. And uh, the difference between locked crystals and not crystals is uh, you get locked crystals for various in-game activities. So... Uh, whenever you sell crystals, whenever you get them from events, uh, from trial for search and stuff like that, uh, those will be locked crystals. Uh, unlocked crystals you can only get from in-game purchases with real money. So for example, uh, if you bought a pack right here, uh, that pack has 8,000 crystals. Those crystals will be unlocked and uh, those crystals can be spent on buying a hill. So as you can see, I currently have only 900 crystals that are unlocked. Uh, this means that I could only purchase a maximum of six packs of 150 each. Uh, when I go above that, uh, I go over the amount of crystals, unlocked crystals that I have, and I no longer have the option to purchase them. So uh, keep in mind that if you do not spend any money, you will probably not have any ability to buy a heal with crystals. And uh, that's a little bit of a limitation to it. 
Uh, another thing is how you exchange the Rahil for uh, various other materials. So uh, what you can do with Rahil is first of all buy different items. So you can buy various weapons, you can buy various weapons. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, another thing is you can sell them and you can sell them either for crystals or uh, for gold. Uh, spoiler alert, the exchange rate for gold is uh, very very horrible. So please never do this. This is not worth it under any circumstance. Uh, for crystals, however, uh, you can exchange uh, up to 10 stacks and the maximum price you can set is up to 140. This means that uh, you will be looking at getting around 1,400 because there is a um, selling tax still applied to them and you can see it right here. Exchange commission, 10% uh, of the selling price. So if you were to sell uh, 10 or rather 100,000 Rahil for 1,400 crystals, which I'll actually do, maybe they will go through and we can actually check it real quick. Uh, you will only get uh, 1,260 crystals back because 10% of that is taken as uh, exchange center tax. And yeah. Uh, next, I uh, will uh, touch up on buying and selling items. So for buying items, uh, there are a lot of uh, various uh, categories to choose from. So weapons, uh, sub weapons and accessories are basically items that uh, can be equipped on your summoner. Uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory as far as uh, the general item that is here. So. Uh, the weapons will be uh, five of the elemental weapons uh, from this screen, basically. Uh, the sub weapon will be uh, the weapon that's equipped in the top right slot. So for Cliff, it will be shield. For other summoners, it will be this sort of a different item, like a trinket or something like that. And accessories are these four: so the earrings. Uh, then there is the uh, what's it called? A necklace, a ring, no, a bracelet and a ring. So yeah, these three items can be accessed through here and uh, for weapons, it's pretty self-explanatory. You see uh, the type of a weapon and the element of a weapon. Uh, so you can find full stock here. Uh, for sub-weapons, it's actually similar as well. Uh, you just see which uh, of the weapons it is. Uh, you can see the start here, uh, the starting stats and the price of the gun. For accessories, it's a bit different because uh, some accessories have uh, different main stats. So uh, for earrings, it's the same because all earrings have a flat defense as their main stat, so they're all grouped together. Uh, but for necklace, uh, bracelet and things, as you can see, there is this uh, text that says multiple properties exist. So once you open it, you will see the full selection of the main stats. And some of the stats are more valued than others, and it will also depend on both your build as well as the summary that you use. So for example, if you want a necklace, a dragon rat necklace that has HP as its main stat, you will select HP and it will give you all necklaces that have HP as the main stat. Uh, and you will notice that sometimes uh, some of these accessories will be more expensive than the others. So for example, HP and defense will be a little cheaper, crit damage is a more... Uh, desired stats so those usually will be a little higher i'm not sure about quick rate but yeah crit rate isn't too desired as well and yeah uh, the same happens for uh, all of the other items other accessories except uh, the earrings so yeah you can see if you do not see a certain stat uh, this does not mean that it doesn't exist it simply means that there is no stock for it so as you can see uh there is HP, Defense, Resistance, Accuracy, and here it's only HP, Resistance, Accuracy, Defense is missing. That doesn't mean that you cannot get Defense on the last screen thing. It simply means that uh, there are no rings with the Defense main sub in the market currently. Uh, then the Material tab, uh, this will have anything to do with uh, upgrading materials for runes and equipment. So uh, rune enhancement stones, enhancement shards, uh, which are used well, rune enhancement stones are used for equip uh, upgrading runes. Enhancement shards are used for upgrading equipment, I believe. And uh, sky stones are used for upgrading both. So both the uh, equipment as well as uh, runes. And various other materials like uh, restoring durability. I'm not sure what other, like crafting. Some crafting recipes require a decent amount of sky stones. So it's a pretty... Uh, 
what's it called, pretty, pretty premium resource. And when you switch to the craft tab, this will show you all of the crafting items that are uh, available from the uh, crafting side of the screen. Some of the items are not sellable. So for example, stuff like uh, the rune and gravestones, and you can sell, see which items uh, can be changed on the market by checking this. So uh, the, red, uh, the red button with an unexchangeable means uh, that this cannot be sold on the market in any way. Uh, the blue button will show you that it is exchangeable and it, you quickly can uh, check the prices for it by just clicking on here. So if you click on here, you will bring up all of the young balls and you can quickly check on the prices for all tiers of the young balls. So you will be able to access it here. Uh, the consumable tabs are the first to all of the food that you can drink. So anything that can be equipped in here uh, will be sold under the consumables tab. And uh, yeah, so there is a lot of various uh, foods that have different stats. So like this one, legendary tier, uh, which gives uh, 365 attack for 30 minutes and yeah, stuff like that. I won't go over all of them. You can uh, enter any item and check what it does through here. Uh, the same for potions. Uh, potions are usually installed in bigger stacks, but you can still see what they do here. A lot of these potions you can either craft or just buy from the general merchant, so also don't overpay a lot for them. And favorites is of course uh, stuff that you favorite by clicking this little pin button. So uh, for any items that are pinned, they will show up in the favorite tab for you for easier uh, like selling, buying and just managing basically. And the same for selling, uh, I won't go too much into the deal, but uh, stuff that you can sell will be uh, shown in the these parentheses. So uh, as you can see, I don't have any button, any any weapons, any sub weapons, any accesses that I can sell. Uh, but uh, for example, I can let's say cancel this, and it should show up in the sub weapon. You can see I have a Kina weapon that I can sell, and once I list it, I will list it for the lowest price because it's already at the lowest price. It, there are. 26 items at that lowest price because this item is simply not desirable so you just listed some of the items you will have a very hard trouble selling so keep that in mind and you can sell a total of 20 items at once and uh, for items that you cannot sell you will notice that uh, the text will turn red because uh, you simply do not have enough of a certain item to sell uh, because some items are sold uh, one by one uh, and some items are sold in stacks of like 20, 100, sometimes even a thousand. And if you do not have the item, it will simply tell you that you do not have enough uh, to sell it. And there is also the food and potions which you can sell. So pay self explanatory there. Now the last thing is the items listed ad. You will see all of the listed items in here. So. For me, I currently only have weapons and these are uh, potions and you can see the amount of uh, stuff that is sold, uh, how long it will last for and the price that it's being sold at. And uh, usually a trade will last for two days, at which point uh, if they weren't sold, uh, they will have this expire tab. And when you click the expire tab, you'll either have the option to uh, get the item back to your inventory by clicking cancel or uh, you have the ambition uh, the option to list the item once again for a price of your choice. You will see the current prices for that item and you can just quickly delist it. And uh, speaking of uh, the taxes, we can actually see the uh, them in action. I can see that 100,000 of my Rahilds sold for 1,400 crystals. And uh, once I claim it, I will be deduced, the, the total amount will be reduced by 10% and I will only receive 1,260 crystals. And the crystals you get, as you can see, they are locked. This means that I cannot use these crystals to exchange uh, for uh, Rahils again. So those crystals will have to be spent in the game on either uh, refreshing uh, dungeon entries, uh, buying items, uh, even summoning in some cases, although I don't recommend that. So yeah, as far as the exchange market, I think I uh, covered the majority of it, or maybe even all of it, and we'll move on to the further areas. Right, so now we're gonna cover uh, everything about guilds, and while previously guilds weren't that important, at least uh, being in a good guild wasn't that important, right now after the recent update, 
uh, with the introduction of guild raids, uh, finding a gold guild is really important because uh, first of all, the guild raid itself uh, will provide a lot of rewards and even if you're like uh, in the top 50 only, uh, you can see that the rewards you get every week from the uh, guild raids is quite significant. There's like 5 pieces of a light hack magician, 2000 coins which is an insane amount actually. You probably need a few days to earn that amount uh, by playing solo and 600 crystals. And of course you get some extra rewards if you're uh, top 3 in your guild uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, so for the guild, uh, we'll be covering every topic uh, that's that I could think of even. So stuff like joining guilds, what sort of guilds are okay to join, how to join, how to do guild raids, uh, how to do the quests, and basically maximize uh, the reward gain that you can get uh, from every guild content that there is. Okay, so I'm gonna start uh, with a topic about joining guilds and uh, sort of, uh, first of all, how to join a guild, uh, second of all, what kind of a guild to choose, uh, how to find a guild that it's easy to join. So uh, first of all, to join a guild, you will first uh, need to not be a part of any guild and luckily that happens when uh, you are just starting the game or uh, haven't joined a guild previously, you will see that uh, you will be in this sort of thing called a Rahil Academy, but it's not a guild, it's just a name for uh, you being able to uh, sort of do, still do guild requests, but not being a part of any guild. Actually, I'm not sure if you even get to do the quests. I uh, think, I know that you can just uh, spin the wheel, that I can uh, guarantee, but as far as the quest goes, I'm actually not even sure. Uh, so, uh, for joining guilds, you will need to uh, go to the guild search and from here you can either search by name if you have been referred to by a friend or something. Uh, if not, uh, you can simply search uh, without entering anything and it will give you uh, a lot of uh, guilds that you can join. Uh, check on the number of members because uh, if you see a very low amount of numbers, there's a good chance that guild is completely inactive because even uh, for guilds with like uh, 36 players per se, uh, if the guild is a bit inactive, you might find like 5 people online only and yeah, it will be a bit difficult to do all of this stuff then. Uh, second of all, check on the uh, status of the guild and this is basically the uh, status of the method of joining the guild. So. Uh, there are three different statuses, so uh, there is closed, meaning that uh, you don't have a, an ability to join at all and this is usually either set by the guild uh, leaders or it happens when the guild is actually full. So as you can see, uh, one of the guilds has been closed here and the second has been closed because uh, it's simply full. Uh, the second and probably the most common across uh, stronger level guilds is the ability to join via a request. Uh, a request uh, join method is usually placed on guilds so that guild leaders could check who is joining and uh, manage uh, the members that way. Perhaps uh, do some like a background check, see how strong their units are, see how, how long have been playing for, uh, just so that uh, they make sure that they get uh, strong players who will be actively participating in the game. And the third and unfortunately most popular, well actually no, not unfortunately, it's just that uh, it's the easiest way, uh, is the instant join. Uh, with the instant join method, uh, you do not need to even apply. Uh, whichever guild you find has an instant join button, uh, you can uh, click on the instant join and you will immediately be part of the guild. Uh, the problem with these parts of guilds is uh, they're a, a decent uh, option when you're starting out because uh, with a very weak web profile, you will probably not be able to join a very active guild. Uh, but uh, as time goes on, uh, you will uh, simply get stronger and can compete uh, for a spot in uh, more stronger guilds. Uh, the problem with instant join is that, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, the people will usually be a little weaker. There will usually be less organization and uh, there's a good chance that you will not even be able to participate in guild raids with a team because uh, for guilds that have instant join buttons, uh, they are usually uh, either on the less active side 
uh, less organization is easier because uh, if you naturally if you let anyone join uh, your guild that means you're not even checking their profile uh, you don't care if people are joining at like level one and stuff so uh, it will be easier or rather it will be harder to organize stuff uh, with such guilds so uh, do join uh, an insta join guild in the first few days however i do recommend uh starting to look for a decent guild uh probably a few days in once you got a little bit stronger and understand a little bit of the game so yeah uh, as far as joining guilds that's about it and we'll move on into some more actual guild content okay so now i'm gonna quickly cover uh the stats of a guild and what you need to know about uh, various uh, contributions and how they work uh, just so you could uh, make sure that you secure a spot because uh, usually uh, if you do not contribute certain points to the guild uh, the guild leaders will take a second look at your uh, participation and con may consider uh, kicking you from the guild so uh, to make sure that you do not get kicked uh, follow along the information that I'll show you here so uh, when you enter the guild uh, there is some basic guild info so you will see your name uh, your guild level the maximum level is 20 I believe as of now so we're almost there you will see your leader uh, the amount of members there are and the weekly contribution and this weekly contribution is basically uh, the main indicator in which guilds are ranked so if you check the rankings you can see we are ranked 6 and uh, we are ranked based on the guild contribution and it resets weekly so uh, this contribution is important but don't overrate it and don't overspend too much time just to max out your contribution because it's definitely not needed to reach uh, all of the rewards uh, yeah so uh, you can see uh, the rankings there and uh, the contribution itself uh, will be visible in the contribution tab uh, the main goal of the contribution is first of all to level up your guild uh, that won't matter of course if you are already maxed level 20 because each level will allow you uh, your guild to add an additional member to it uh, the second most important part of guild contribution is actually filling up this meter and uh, to fill the meter you need a total of 33,600 contributions so uh, you can imagine that uh, for a more active guild so for example we have 48 members and most of them are quite active uh, we fill this meter pretty fast I would say uh, the second I wake up in the morning uh, the server had like three or four hours uh, passed uh, after uh, the day reset and we usually already have uh, a full meter filled uh, but basically uh, the more of this meter you fill uh, the more rewards you can get and these rewards reset daily uh, so your goal uh, in finding a guild is to I would say find a guild that can at least uh, fill the meter up until this Rahil order uh, while the legend is called piece is nice uh, keep in mind that it's only one piece and you need 30 of them to uh, fill up a full scroll so uh, the amount of scrolls you get uh, basically to get the le full legendary scroll you need uh, a whole month of gameplay and uh, the amount of points it takes to go from uh, the fourth uh, spot to the fifth one here is quite a bit so i would say at least try to go for the uh a guild that can uh reach the fourth spot in the contribution right here so 21,840 because uh, their heal orders are a bit more important like the five heal orders are a bit more of an important award than the legend scroll uh, you do really want to reach uh, the coin part these two bottom awards are really nothing special uh, the main thing is the Rahil orders and the uh, guild coins that you get from it and right here you can check uh, the contribution that everyone does uh, if you just play regularly and don't try to uh, intentionally max out your contribution you will be able to reach like 1.5 to 2000 uh, contribution if you farm a bit more afk you will probably go to like 2.5k uh, but a total you can reach per day is 4300 as of now and you can check details on how you can reach it uh, right here so yeah by afk farming uh, just by defeating creatures you can earn one point per creature and that maxes out on 1600 i can do some profession stuff which will give you additional 300 uh, summon or enhance equipment and runes another 300 
uh, and uh, there is guild requests uh, which will max out at a thousand however if you only do guild requests for the wards uh, the max you can get is 360 but you can still do additional uh, guild requests if you feel like maxing out your contribution and then there is the cooperation tab so uh, here the stuff that you have to do and all of the things in the cooperation tab ex except uh, the uh, guild check-in has to do with another member from the guild so uh, that member has to be in your party and you have to do the tasks uh, that are written here with at least one member so uh, defeat the field boss that happens and the field boss is the uh, field event that happens several times a day so uh, you have to party up and beat either this one this one or this one and you will get uh, the additional was it like 100 or 200 points let me check right here 200 points uh, do some party dungeons so uh, if you do two dungeons you will get uh, the maximum 300 right here and creature hunting similar to the uh, first one you get 1600 if you hunt solo and you can get additional 500 for uh, hunting with a party member from your guild so yeah uh, basically your goal is to uh, max out as much as you uh, can however I don't recommend going intentionally for very high contribution unless you're really really pushing uh, the rank of the guild I know some of our members in my guild like to uh, compete sort of for the top spot and max out their contribution but it's really not required uh, and yeah, uh, then we'll jump on to the uh, request offices and wheel for a fortune. Oh yeah, and by the way, uh, before I jump into that, uh, if you really want to see uh, the most active members of the guild, you can go to the members guild tab and uh, sort by weekly contribution. This will show you uh, the best contributing members to the guild. So the first uh, score will be the contribution uh, this week and uh, the score in the parentheses will show you their total contribution uh, over the whole period they've been in the guild so for example uh zoe here uh did 28 000 uh, score this week and uh has done a total of 1000 1, over uh the whole uh, time she was in the guild and basically you can see that some older members have way higher uh, scores i personally I, I stayed in the group for quite a bit but i never really maxed my weekly contribution so i'm sitting pretty low but my total overall is also here and yeah you can just uh, sort your members by any way so by grade means uh, that you will sort uh, people by their guild ranks so uh, first of all guild leader then uh, co-leaders and uh, after that regular members uh, you can also do by members so this will sort everyone by levels uh, by greetings, yeah, you can sort by greetings and you can check by online stats. So yeah, uh, jumping over to the request office, uh, this is one of the most important parts of the guild because uh, first of all, this is an amazing source of these guild coins. And second of all, uh, they will allow you first of all to complete several events because guild uh, request events do happen quite often. Uh, and uh, you will be able to fill up this eight levels of uh, contribution which will grant you even more rewards so uh, most of the important rewards here are the thousand coins you get from here and uh, these two boxes are found right here so uh, the way guild requests work is uh, you get three guild requests per day you can complete more than three however you will only get rewards for the first three you complete so do choose uh, a bit higher ranked uh, quests for the first three and then if you feel like completing additional ones uh, you can complete the lower ranked ones uh, of course now uh, i'll try to talk about some of the rewards and quests so uh, first of all what you need to know about uh, the ranks is that uh, the s rank is being the hardest quest uh, then there will be a b c and i'm not sure if there is a d but yeah i think c is the uh, lowest uh, rank quest and the rewards do scale uh, with the quest at least the guild coins are uh, scale consistently the rest of the rewards will scale but uh, they will scale a bit less so uh, it's also hard to compare because the rewards are very different as you can see uh, you get uh, either gold you can get crafting items you can get uh, boxes with uh, various materials sky stones uh, uh, rune enhancement stones what else what else some specific materials and yeah you can also get a uh, spell book chests uh, so like a thing gem books checks if i'm not wrong essences 
so yeah there's a lot of different awards but i would recommend uh, choosing the battles not based on the divorce but based on the quest itself because uh, some of the quests are very popular and as you can see by far the most popular quest is the dispatch monsters one because uh, it's the most popular, yeah, you can see pretty much everyone has either dispatch uh, monsters or hunting creatures uh, because first of all it's extremely easy to do, all you have to do is, uh, this sort of works like an expedition from the expedition lizard, I don't know if I already covered or I will cover it in a next segment. Uh, but yeah, uh, as expeditions, these are basically, you have to send three units who are three stars or higher and if their power uh, together uh, goes over the required power, so meaning for uh, this quest I would need to send three units uh, who have a total power of 45,600 or more. And spoiler alert, these are really easy to do because for me I, I think I sent units who have like 250,000 powers, like four or five times more than the required one. And after a certain amount of time uh, they will simply come back and you will be able to claim the request. And the time that it takes them to come back is very different so for c rank it takes 5 minutes for b rank 15 uh, for a 30 minutes and for s rank a quest it will take one hour for them to come back and once they are back you will be able to claim the rewards and yeah you receive them there uh, the rewards of guild coins will not be shown right here but you can see the full reward uh, right here so s rank will uh, grant you 220 coins a rank will give you 170, uh, B will give you 126 if I'm not wrong, and C, let's see, uh, C will give you 100. So even if you do C rank quests, uh, you still get a decent chunk of guild coins, so make sure to do those quests every day. And uh, my personal recommendations is either to go for the dispatch monsters, so these quests, uh, or uh, the defeat uh defeat a certain element, a certain monster in a specific continent, uh, check whichever uh, quest has the best reward and choose accordingly. And you can uh, hunt super weak creatures by just going to the map, choosing the uh, required element. For example, if you need to beat fire monsters, you can go to Tesca or Arukarangma and beat them pretty easily. So yeah, uh, other the quests are a bit harder or require a bit more manual play, so there are quests where you can uh, simply deliver a specific item that you have, but keep in mind that this will take the item from your inventory. However, if you do have a lot of spare items, I'll do this for example, uh, you need to deliver a legendary tier bracelet, I know I have a few uh, leftovers, so I will do that. I'll choose uh, whichever has a work style. For example, I don't need attack, so I can deliver that and it will be easy to complete. As you can see, uh, I completed my third quest today and I can no longer get any rewards. I can still do quests. As you can see, I can still accept them and I can give them up at any time, uh, but I will not get any rewards. So I will get, uh, the only thing I will get is basically the contribution points for doing the request. And yeah, uh, for other quests, uh, some of them will be way harder to complete, so stuff like uh, crafting stuff is relatively difficult, I would say. Uh, you can do uh, processing, so yeah, processing, blacksmithing, this is mostly crafting. Uh, there is also stuff by delivering uh, certain items, so for example, you can deliver one of the items, not only summoner items, but uh, materials, so for this, you can see I need to deliver three kiwis, I have a bunch, so I'll just do it for the example. And yeah, you deliver those items, you instantly complete the quest. And uh, as you complete those quests, uh, you will see that this is this is not daily, this is weekly. Uh, you will start filling up this bar and your goal is to reach uh, the eighth checkpoint where you will receive the maximum announced rewards. Uh, so yeah, as mentioned, uh, the most important ones are the 1000 coins here. Uh, the boxes uh, that can be found at checkpoint 5 and 6 because these contain a lot of crafting items and they will allow you to uh, level up the book of all those items quite fast and of course the mystical scroll if you uh, manage to make it to it. Now one of the last things about the uh, guilds are the wheel of fortune so First of all, uh, the first time you enter the guild menu, uh, you will receive uh, the rewards uh, for a guild. After that, uh, this is pretty much the thing, 
first thing you should go and do is uh, spill in this wheel. The votes here aren't that special, I would say, well, as I say that, I get one of the best votes. So yeah, uh, the, the votes to look uh, out for are the Mystical Scrolls uh, and uh, the Rahil Orders right here. Because of those Rahil Orders, as I really like to save up tickets, I actually do all three of my refreshes. And you can refresh the spinning wheel for 100 gold coins uh, every day for three times in total. So you will spend 300 uh, coins if you spin it three times. And my goal is really to get uh, some Rahil Orders. Uh, they're pretty rare. I get them like once every two or three days. Uh, but that alone is more than enough for me. So here uh, I'll quickly just finish up gathering these events. Uh, so yeah, uh, the Wheel of Fortune, you get one spin for free and you get three spins for uh, 300 coins in total. Uh, you don't have to do them, uh, if, especially if you're really not aiming to do a lot of event awards. But if you do like maximizing those events, uh, spinning three times for a heal orders will help you out because uh, they do drop somewhere for like 5 to 25 of these heal orders. So they can contribute quite a bit to the... Uh, overall our uh, heal orders uh, that you get daily and yeah now we'll jump uh, into the most important part and that is the guild raid okay okay guild raids so you can access the guild raids from the main uh, guild menu and once you enter here you will be a little confused if you're seeing this for the first time but if you listen carefully you will quickly understand how guild raids work and so first of all, I will explain all about guild wars, not guild wars, uh, guild raids. And uh, after all of that, uh, before the segment closes, I will showcase a fight and the general strategy behind the fight, as well as some of the strategies uh, behind the bosses attacks and how to dodge them. So uh, the guild raids are basically a PvE boss that you and all of your guildies are trying to beat. Uh, there are a total of five levels of the boss and uh, yeah you can see the hp of each level right here so the first level we have close to 12 mil uh 29 mil for the second one 62 mil uh 100 close to 119 million and the last one we have 208 million unfortunately we weren't able to beat level 5 just yet but we're working on it uh the rewards you get uh can be seen here it's a little bit hard to see but for level one you get two uh light uh, light Hulk Magician pieces, another 2 level 2, level 3 gives 4, level 4 gives 6, and you also get some legend room boxes, so for level 1, uh, level 2, level 3, I believe these are not guaranteed, so uh, it is RNG, uh, some more guaranteed awards though are the gold, so 41k here, uh, what's that, is that 61, I think that's 61k, uh, and that's 93 if I'm not wrong. It's very hard to see through that. This one is around 170k and the last one is 740k. And these boxes, but as, as previously covered, uh, these mystical boxes are really trash. They usually just give uh, one piece or like an unknown scroll, so eh, not a big fan of those. Uh, but yeah, uh, the way guild rate works is that you and up to 23 other members can enter the guild raid at once. Uh, once the uh, amount of people in the battle hits 24, you will not be able to enter until someone uh, leaves. So uh, if you're planning to raid as a full guild of 50 people, uh, you will have to split up into two groups as uh, not all of you will be able to fit into the guild raid at once. And uh, you get two entries per day for, uh, not per day, uh, per week for each level. So uh, you can beat uh, the levels at any order. Uh, at first, uh, all of the levels will be unlocked and you will need to unlock it first. So uh, you can only do level one. Once you beat level one, you will unlock level two and so on and so on until the last level. Uh, but starting with the second week, uh, you will be able to do any of them in any order. And you get two entries per week. Uh, this means that uh, each member gets two entries per week and you can enter at any time. Uh, quickly before we do that, I'll just want to participate in the event since I was already here. And yeah, uh, so for the uh, guild raid, basically uh, your goal is to kill this boss uh, down to zero HP. 
Uh, once it's killed, uh, you will be able to click uh, the claim reward button right here and you will get uh, most of these rewards. You will get uh, guaranteed gold and pieces. Uh, some rune boxes are RNG and this one I believe might be RNG as well. Uh, and you can do so uh, for the level 1, level 2, level 3 and so on and so on. And you can attempt each level two times. So uh, for level one, you should really not face any difficulties. After that, you will need some people. Uh, of course, usually you will not be able to beat uh, these raids alone. So you will have to sort of cooperate. Uh, the good thing about guild raids is that even if you do not go in as a team, uh, the damage you do persists. So as you can see, uh, we were able to be these four, but uh, we did two runs of level five, and I personally only did one because it was quite late. But uh, we did uh, group runs, and whatever damage we did, it actually stays until the end of the uh, week. Uh, that means that even if one group enters, uh, the second group can later finish off the remaining HP and still uh, be delayed. So you do not have to. Uh, all be uh, active at once or miss out on the rewards in any way and i believe even if you do not do a uh, delay itself you will probably be able to claim the rewards or don't quote me on that because i didn't participate in all of the raids so it's hard to say uh and yeah uh basically try to uh, just do a lot of damage in those raids and uh, once you beat them uh, you will be able to claim the rewards this is also the main part why you should uh, consider joining a very active guild because uh, trust me on this uh, the guilds that are usually on insta join uh, will have trouble beating even level one so yeah uh, you will need a decent guild for it and now i'm gonna address some other stuff about the guild raids yeah, so I'm gonna jump into the rankings right now. Uh, the way rankings work here is uh, basically, first of all, it rates you on the level you beat. So if you beat uh, the maximum level 5, uh, all of the level 5, uh, all of the guilds that beat level 5 uh, will then be ranked on the amount of time it took them to beat the level 5. So as you can see here, uh, the first place has a level 5 cleared and it did it in 2 minutes 39 seconds and that way uh, all of the other kills, uh, guilds follow. The amount of time it takes is uh, calculated by the total amount someone was in a battle. So if you do notice that uh, a person has entered solo and took the whole 5 minutes, keep in mind that uh, if even if you beat the raid with your group in one minute uh, your time will be a total of six minutes because you beat it in a minute but that person uh, took another five minutes and that's sort of why you want uh, your guild to act, uh, attack at once because uh, if you do let those uh, several stranglers attack before uh, the whole party clears it uh, your skull could go down and uh, you may end up with insane uh, insanely long times stuff like 53 minutes as you can see i'm sure that uh, people clear that level 2 pretty easily as a group but just because uh, people can take uh those solo battles those duo battles and they will uh, drag your time down a lot so yeah uh try to be the highest level and if you cannot be the certain level try to at least be the fastest time for that level as you can see we managed to beat level 4 in a single battle of close to five minutes and uh, we managed to beat this guild by several seconds. If we had a, s a person who entered before us, uh, something like solo, our drive would drop a lot and it will basically ruin your placement quite a bit. And you can see the rewards are not the rewards, but the ratings for this season and for the previous week uh, by going to the previous season tab. And yeah, uh, the rank you place at will matter and uh, that will uh, directly affect the rewards that you get. So you can find all of the rewards uh, for the guild rates right here. So uh, the rank 1 guilds uh, that had the fastest time and the highest level uh, will receive these rewards. And then uh, as ranks go down, uh, the rewards will get lower gradually. Uh, currently, we are usually receiving the fourth one, so like rank 4 to 10. And even if you're not rank 1, even at like top 50, the rewards are still decent, you're still getting 2000 guild coins, you're still getting 600 crystals, so uh, do not worry about being into an, uh, in an insanely OP guild, as long as you're in a guild that can uh, kill at least a level or two, 
you will be placed in usually top 50 and will not have no problem uh, keeping that spot. Uh, then there is the member rankings tab and this will show uh, the damage of the last level, usually the last level, and uh, the top three people uh, in your guild who did the most damage will actually receive additional rewards which can be found in the members award tab and this, these will be uh, distributed uh, once the week ends so uh, the rank one will receive another three pieces 400 uh, 120 crystals so there is incentive to do uh, the top damage as well because uh, you are potentially a candidate for doing a little bit uh, or rather getting a little bit more rewards on top of the regular weekly rewards as well as the rewards from beating the guild boss. So yeah, uh, I think the technical stuff uh, has been covered and now I'll jump into a fight that we have recently did. Okay, so this is a recording of the guild raid. I believe it was level 4 that we have done. And yeah, uh, a bunch of us grouped up. Of course, not all of us could make it, but yeah, it's hard to... A group of 50 people at once you know so uh this is the guild boss uh basically uh some basics about the guild boss is that it has two phases it has the light phase and the dark phase currently it's in light phase and uh, when it's night phase you will uh, clearly notice because the whole arena will turn to night and yeah uh then uh there are these objects so first of all this is uh these towers are the obelix and you will need some dedicated players uh, to hit those obelisks uh, very often. Uh, and next to the obelisks are these knights. Uh, basically, the knights are sort of protectors of a certain obelisk, meaning that uh, when it's time to hit the obelisk, and, and I'll explain when it's time to hit it uh, in more detail in a bit, when it's time to hit the obelisk, uh, these knights uh, will become alive and you will not be able to hit the obelisk before the knight is killed, meaning that uh, you should always uh, be prepared to go for them. And I know I did a bad example, I probably didn't attack them because I was a bit busy uh, recording the video. So yeah, basically the main uh, thing to know about the guild raid is first of all this basic attack will uh, cover pretty much the whole arena and everyone caught in it will not take damage but they will be rooted, meaning that they, you cannot move when being caught, as you can see some of people got caught. So uh, the basic idea about this uh, guild rate is that uh, your goal is to get the boss down to 0 HP as fast as possible, you have 2 attempts per level for everyone. And uh, just going on with the fight, uh, you can see first of all uh, that the phase, currently it's light phase, and in the light phase uh, the phase that it's currently in, uh, that color will slowly start pushing the other color away, so for example it's light phase now, uh, meaning that uh, the, uh, the little light meter here will start pushing towards the dark side a little bit, and as you can see uh, the dark knight arose, uh, the reason why he arose is because he was protecting the obelisks and uh, to push back that uh, light phase you will need to be hitting the obelisks eventually. Uh, the goal of the uh, raid overall to have a successful run is to balance this out somewhere around the middle. Uh, you have to uh, not overdo the obelisks. Every, basically, uh, every time you hit the obelisk, uh, so if you hit the dark obelisk, uh, the dark side will push a little towards uh, the left. And if you do the light obelisk, uh, the light side will push towards the right. So uh, in this phase, uh, since the boss is light, uh, the color will slowly be creeping uh, towards the dark side, uh, meaning that the light will be pushing out uh, towards the dark, and uh, you will need to balance out the dark side back to around the middle, and once you uh, beat the knight, you will have the ability to kill these obelisks, so as you can see, as time goes on, uh, the light pushes uh, towards uh, sort of uh, towards the light side, I guess, or towards the dark side. And uh, basically this means that, as you can see, Obelisk is now opened. And uh, I do recommend having a dedicated person towards the Obelisk because it will be hard to move. And the way you damage the Obelisk is actually by uh, hits rather than damage, meaning that it doesn't matter how much damage you do with a certain unit or a certain summoner, uh, the Obelisks uh, count uh, hits 
meaning that units that do multi-hills or units that are on very high attack speed, for example, will be better for obelisks. And uh, usually that means that you will most likely require a dedicated person with a specific team for those obelisks uh, to counter it. So there are monsters that do multiple hits. Uh, there are monsters uh, that do uh, very high attack speed hits, so you can pretty much build any monster on high attack speed as long as they have some sort of scaling that will help. You can also hit it with summoners, so I can see we have one person who's hitting the obelisk right now. And uh, as you can see, when the obelisk gets hit, uh, it should happen shortly. Yeah, the dark uh, side pushed the light one away a little bit, and you can hit the dark obelisk right away, so... Uh, the goal is to basically balance out uh, the energies right there and you can see uh, we are hitting them again because we need to balance uh, the dark side a little bit again and uh, basically uh, your goal is to not let uh, one of the colors to go uh, too far into another side because when that happens uh, the boss will use an ultimate ability uh, i'm not sure if it will showcase right here but it will basically cover the whole arena and if it happens you will have to hide behind one of these two towers Otherwise, you will be getting hit and receive a lot of damage. And uh, the boss will get a permanent buff uh, that will both reduce the damage he takes as well as increase the damage he deals. So pretty much if uh, you get to a phase where the boss enhances himself at even to level 1, uh, you can count on that run being pretty much a failed one. You will most likely be able to clear it if it's not level 5, but if it's level 5, uh, it could mean that it's game over for that specific raid. So yeah, we'll see how the raid goes on. Uh, these attacks mostly you will need to dodge. I would say uh, the rest of the attacks aren't too scary. Uh, the scariest attack is the one that uh, sh shoots out like uh, eight different spikes or whatever. I'm not even sure how to call it, but if it happens, I'll uh, make sure to mention it. And yeah, overall, you're just trying to stack buffs, stack debuffs on the uh, boss. Uh, trying to do as much damage as possible and yeah we'll see what happens as you can see the obelisk got hit and the uh, balance got once again like restored and yeah we're just continuing hitting it i'll try to do a full run this one you can easily dodge not even by standing here but by moving along uh, the way uh, the attack moves because it does not shoot instantly it goes like like this and you can just dodge along the way. The boss will uh, sometimes steal a beneficial effect from one of you, so you do need quite a few strippers uh, to make sure that those bosses are still, because if you're not, uh, there is a good chance that you will simply not do damage because uh, the boss will have plenty of shields, plenty of defense buffs, anti-credits, stuff like that, so uh, it's easier to just steal. And yeah, you can see now, uh, the boss converted to the dark energy, meaning that the dark energy will start slowly creeping up into the left side. And uh, you will need to counter it by uh, hitting the light obelisk right now. So you can see the light uh, guard has been awoken. Uh, your goal is to kill that guard. And once you kill the guard, you will be able to hit the obelisk. As you can see, dark energy is getting filled pretty fast. And we need to balance it pretty quickly. So now the light obelisk opened, uh, the person dedicated to it is hitting the obelisk and uh, once the obelisk is hit, uh, the light energy gets pushed back a little bit. And in this case, we'll probably need the light energy to be pushed back once again. And yeah, we're just continuing the fight, stacking the debuffs. Uh, once again, the obelisk bot pushed a bit. Do, uh, of course, uh, bring some cleansers into the fight because uh, the boss does have uh, a lot of debuffs and one of the debuffs he gives is a very nasty one uh, and that's uh, decreased mana regeneration, meaning that you'll pretty much not be able to use well, this one, this attack, uh, this is the attack I was talking about. Uh, you have to dodge, one sec. And like this, yeah, this one. Uh, so like where eight spikes come out. I have to dodge this attack because uh, for damage dealers, they will most likely not be able to survive it. It does a uh, very huge damage. I'm not even sure if mine survived. Yeah, as you can see, both my damage dealers died because I didn't dodge. So yeah, make sure to not get hit by that attack. Other attacks, you can probably survive without too much issues. 
so I just uh, picked whatever left overs there are and yeah uh, you can see the dark energy is getting creeped up a bit too much I'm not sure if we even have anyone that's balancing it and yeah it looks like we failed so it will be the perfect opportunity to show you uh, and this is her ultimate it covers the whole arena but you will see that there are two safe spots uh, behind this tower and behind the tower on the left which we cannot see so if you manage to hide in time uh, you will not get hit but if you do get hit you will see that the boss deals a lot of damage uh, gives a lot of debuffs and actually permanently destroys your hp until the next run and after this of course the boss becomes enhanced meaning that he takes less damage and he deals way more damage uh, meaning that if this was a level 5 run we'd pretty much have no chance at all at this point but because this is just level 4 or even level 3 i'm not even sure uh we were able to beat it and yeah you can see that uh, once the light boss is back uh the dark knight arises once again and once the dark knight is killed uh the light obelisk or rather the dark obelisk can be hit but yeah basically this is how the guild raids work it's sort of a very very quick guide and yeah you will see the top damage here top three people who do the most damage will receive some additional rewards and yeah basically just as a reminder uh so all of the tips are uh, always hit the knight even if you don't need to hit the obelisk because if you don't kill the knight and you need the obelisk uh, immediately that might prove that uh, some troublesome uh, hit obelisk but never hit it above 50 percent because in that case uh, when the boss converts uh, he might stack the energy very quickly and you will simply not have enough time to balance out from the other side uh, don't let the meter fill uh, fully into either side because the boss will do an ultimate and it will also get enhanced permanently. Uh, also for obelisks, uh, multi-hits matter, not damage. So bring units with high attack speed, bring units with multiple hits on the skills, stuff like uh, I know the fire harpy does 6 hits, I believe the wind harpy does a very similar attack to that. Uh, and uh, you get the wards as long as you hit at least a single level in uh, either of the five guild raids. So yeah, uh, that's about it for the raids and let's move on. Okay, now let's talk all about professions. I know that this will be sort of a, a very difficult topic to understand at first. And also apologies for the background sound if you hear any. Uh, yeah, for this, uh, I will explain the basics about professions. Uh, I will explain basically what each profession does. Uh, I will recommend, I'll give you my recommendations of which professions you first of all have to level up and after leveling, which items you should focus on. So uh, let's jump into it first of all. And right now you can see that there are a total of four different professions. And this consists of uh, processing, alchemy, cooking, and blacksmithing. And all four of them uh, have very different purposes, so how sometimes they do tie in together. There's also this thing called the master profession, but it's not, it's sort of not a different profession, but an extra level to each profession because it will basically unlock a few extra items, as you can see on the very right side. So each profession level will unlock certain items, and the master profession will unlock basically the highest tier items, but it's not a different profession per se. And yeah, uh, these professions, first of all, uh, to unlock most of the items, you will have to level them. Uh, mine are already level 7 at max. I'm only missing the profession, but before they are max, you will see a button uh, of uh, alchemy request, uh, blacksmithing request, similar to the one you see with the master request here. And when clicking that button, you will see uh, the items that I required uh, to level up that profession. So for example, for me, uh, to level up the master promotion, I would need all of these items. And yes, you're looking at them correctly. This profession, like the master request, is pretty much insanely difficult and it will take you months and months uh, to gather the materials and gold for it. But trust me, the other ones are way, way easier. I think people say that the master request alone is sort of similar price to what it takes to level up all four of them uh, from level one to level seven so yeah uh, don't be scared it's definitely not that expensive as you see in the master promotion and uh, for now i'll cover what each profession does and 
if I remember correctly what items are needed for the promotion. Okay, so quickly going over each promotion. Uh, for processing, it doesn't really have any important items. It's mostly just the raw items uh, being converted to process ones. Uh, and those process ones will usually be used in different profession crafting recipes. So uh, processing is basically uh, the iron you gather, uh, turning it into ingots and stuff like that. Uh, there is some processing that is important and uh, those you can see at the very bottom, so the last two rows, you might find some use for them. Uh, the essence row is basically just crafting regular essence into different element essence. I personally never used it, but uh, you might find some use, especially if you're mostly just farming the regular magic essence. Uh, the second thing is these, at the very bottom row, you can see these props for sale. And what these props for sale are is basically uh, items that after crafting uh, you can sell for a very high price uh, to most NPCs. So for example, these first items, they're not too expensive to craft, but they will also not sell for a lot. But the later items, for example, the one you can see in the master, uh, what you call master profession, uh, for example, this bear, can be sold for, I believe, half a million gold. Uh, this one, for example, if I'm not wrong, will be uh, sold for like 250,000. So yeah, some of these items are worth crafting if you feel like uh, doing so, and usually will turn into profit compared to the materials needed uh, to gather tools for that profession. And yeah, that's about it for processing. Uh, I'm not really gonna go too much into detail about it because it's just, uh, the base skill for a lot of material crafting. Uh, the next one will be the... Yeah, the next one I'll cover will be cooking, and this one will also be sort of a short uh, breakdown. Oh, before I go to cooking, I will mention that to level up processing, you will basically need uh, to craft a lot of uh, raw materials into process materials, and uh, after submitting those materials, you will level up, so uh, leveling it up is super simple, but uh, just the amount of time it takes for to gather you the materials for that level up will be a little annoying, and there is a good chance that you will need to gather those materials manually, which is a bit of a shame. But yeah, that's that's just what the profession is about. Uh, then the next profession is cooking, and. Cooking profession is probably the one that you will be using the least, uh, but it does require a uh, cooking profession for some recipes as well as usually is required uh, for some challenges to get their rewards. Uh, cooking is all about crafting food that you can consume and uh, you will basically be able to get short temporary buffs or certain buffs like healing or uh, mana boost and stuff like that. No wait, not, not mana boost, uh, healing for monsters I believe you get from there. And yeah, uh, this profession will be important, but I'll cover which professions are, uh, or not are, uh, should be leveled up first. Uh, but I'll do that after covering what each profession does in general. So yeah, for cooking it's basically uh, another way to craft essences as well, and uh, these will mostly be used for food. And we'll go over to the next one. Okay, these next two professions will be the ones uh, you will need the most, and they will uh, give you the most benefit at least uh, towards your progress. So first of all, it's uh, alchemy. Uh, this one, to level it up, uh, it will probably be the hardest to level up because First of all, you will need a lot of raw items to gather, and second of all, those raw items will need a lot of crafting, and because you need a lot of crafting, you will also in turn need a lot of gold for that crafting, so don't be stressed if your alchemy is uh, the lowest leveled one, because it's by far the hardest to level, for sure, trust me, uh, as I've done this progress already. And yeah, uh, when you level it, uh, you slowly unlock uh, higher tier gems, uh, higher tier effect stones, higher tier rune books. Uh, basically, uh, you don't unlock new items per se, but you unlock higher tierities of them. 
and while you may not need most of them uh, one of them you will need for sure so i do recommend uh, going for high level ones uh, first of all uh, you can see that you get uh, gems that you can use on your equipment you get these uh, sunstones two of them will be used on your equipment and two of these will be used on runes so gems will be used on uh, your equipment uh, stone stones will be used on your weapons as well and the uh, what they're called uh, moonstones no not moonstones it's, i think it's galaxy stones yeah and uh, these books will be used on your runes you can check where you use each of them by uh, just going into the description as you can see you use this one on runes use this book on runes and just to be sure uh, you use moonstones oh you use them on accessories okay so yeah uh, several items for summoner items and several ones for uh, runes then if you go to the bottom this will also be important uh, you can see a lot of rune crafting recipes and these will basically be available when you complete hero area most of these uh, rune recipes require these uh, magical rune pieces which you can only get from the hero area you can either get them from completing quests or just hunting regular monsters there and you for some of them you will need uh, these uh, engraved stones however uh, if you prefer to just craft whatever runes you won't need them and you can craft this random one here and yeah uh, let's check at the bottom uh, oh yeah and apart from that uh, you will need these uh, energy of a certain element so energy of chaos energy of transcendence this will be used uh, to level up your summoner from level 60 to level 70 so yeah I'll cover on which uh, professions are important to level uh, as a reminder I'll do that after covering all four of them and now let's go towards the last profession uh, the blacksmithing for this uh, blacksmithing basically allows you to access high tier summoner items so you have the ability to craft various weapons uh, various uh, secondary weapons or so-called sub weapons I prefer to just call them shields because for my cleave that sub weapon is a shield and all four accessory types so I think these necklaces bracelets rings and stuff like that and for these uh, to craft high level items you will need level seven but there is really no need to rush I'll give you my opinion on the order of which you should level up these professions and what items you should focus on crafting first uh, to level up this profession you will need to craft a lot of weapons of different tiers but uh, luckily the weapons you need will be very easily acquired uh, you will need to do a little bit of crafting with them but most of the weapons you get uh, will be used uh, or will be acquired from the subjugation dungeon as long as you do level five uh, not level five uh, you get uh, the five star weapons uh, you will need mostly these uh, purple ones however you may need some four star purple ones uh, you may need some uh, three star purple ones so yeah uh, that's the most stuff and yeah this is why uh, I would recommend that if you do plan on leveling your uh, crafting uh, or not crafting but professions uh, you should save uh, most of the purple weapons that you get from this somewhere you can do it in the inventory if you feel like you don't have any more space in the inventory I do recommend going to the uh, NPC that has the storage so you can go to any region and in the village you will see this storage guard where you can store all of your uh, summoner items there and they will be proved use proven useful until like level 6 or level 7 uh, crafting and I think you even need them for the master profession so yeah uh, do save those weapons however save them if they're not powered up because I'm not sure if you can use the powered up ones worst case you will be able to buy all of the weapons with a uh, subjugation token so also save those as soon as you're done uh, building like the main build for your summoner uh, do consider saving all of them and yeah uh, for professions I will give you now a list of which professions and which levels you should craft for them okay so, so to make significant progress in the game uh, there are two professions that you will need to focus on and that will be alchemy and blacksmithing uh, first of all I would oh uh, before that uh, to level up these professions uh, you may need to level up uh, processing just to get the raw materials from there unless you of course buy all of them 
So uh, do keep in mind that I'm not mentioning uh, leveling uh, processing, but uh, you will, as a factor of crafting those higher tier items, will need uh, processing to be leveled as well. So first of all, uh, the first procession uh, you will need to focus on mostly is uh, the alchemy one. And you need this for several items. So first of all, uh, you will really need to rush uh, the first six, uh, first six levels of alchemy. And here are the items that you actually unlock. So as you can see, these energy uh, transcendence pieces, I guess you can call them energy of harmony, uh, level one, two, and three will unlock each, uh, each of these essences. And, not essences, energies. And these energies are used for summoner transcendence, which you can use in you can find in the summoner uh, basically overview. And these can be crafted with uh, these little uh, harmony pieces, like transcendence pieces, chaos pieces. And once you craft them, you can use them for uh, summoner transcendence. And transcendence will allow your summoner to achieve much higher stats than they would at level 60. Mine is already maxed, but on average you will need like around 100 of each of these energies. I think maybe like a little more, something like 110. And once you have enough, you simply unlock the transcendence level and it will be unlocked for each summoner uh, that you have. Uh, next up, uh, you will also need alchemy for powering up different materials in your inventory. Yeah, uh, these... Uh power up materials will be used on both your summoner items as well as runes so uh these items are gems uh then sunstones uh, galaxy stones and uh spell books so spell books and uh, these uh, galaxy stones are used on runes and uh, these uh, moonstones are used on accessories and uh, sunstones are used on weapons and sub-weapons and gems are used on weapons and sub-weapons as well. So there are five different uh, ones and uh, the ones I recommend uh, focusing first on uh, are these gems. So for gems, I recommend crafting the highest tier that you uh, are able to uh, unlocked so for example if you only unlock level 3 i do recommend crafting the blue ones if you manage to unlock level 5 6 or 7 uh, craft the highest tier of the gem that you have available for the other materials i would say uh, don't rush them too fast at least the uh, higher tier ones i would say if you're just beginning the game uh you are more than uh it will be more than enough to craft uh, these uh white tier ones for both not both, but for all other uh, power of materials that are gems, uh, the reason why is because uh, you can uh, use gems on uh, different items once you feel like it. Uh, but unfortunately, you cannot remove uh, uh, any of the other materials as far as right now. I know that will be uh, a feature in the future for some of these materials, but for now, you cannot remove them. So. Uh, in the very early beginning, uh, you craft these white tier ones, uh, and you can uh, focus on a few green or blue tier ones, but I will keep in mind that even the blue ones, for me, uh, are personally a bit too expensive, because you need a lot of them, and uh, second of all, uh, the few that you get, you will usually get a stuff that you do not need, so keep that into account, because uh, you will probably, for each uh, gem that you plan on using, you will need to craft like 7 or 8, of them to get the required start first of all so yeah i personally stick to the green ones and for some uh that i need in mass i actually just stick to the white ones still and yeah uh these you will use on whichever uh runes your uh monster uh not monster your summoner uh, equipment and yeah for gems i go for the max ones for these ones go for either blue or green tier and if you are really into uh maximizing your progress you can go for the blue ones uh then the last thing you need uh, alchemy for and why i'm saying you need alchemy level six are these uh skill books so you need these uh research lock pieces uh, and you need five of them to craft a single skill book and each skill book will actually allow you to level up one point into your skills so in the skill menu uh, you will see that uh, at level 
70, I think you get like 350 skill points or something like that. Uh, but additional skill points will be needed uh, to be acquired by these books. So currently on fleet I have close to 1500 of these uh, skill points and that allowed me to fully max this tree, this tree, uh, this tree is one away from maxing out but they do get quite expensive as you can see the last upgrade cost 78 for me uh, this one uh, costs 60 but that's because uh, one of my weapons is powering up and it, it would be level 8 or 7 without my weapon and uh, also these are left but these also get quite expensive as well as you can see uh, levels 8 to 10 cost in 177 in total so you do need like a good 2.5 maybe 3000 skill points to fully max them and I know that there are uh, additional skills coming in the future so uh, those skill points will be needed so yeah uh, to craft those there are two different ways to craft uh, skill these skill books but uh, this is by far the cheaper way uh, there's also a way uh, through cooking however I do not recommend doing that uh, I think I don't know if it will show me right here it looks like it doesn't show me but there is a way to craft them through cooking as well maybe you have noticed when I was scrolling uh, you, it also requires only level 4 but by far it's way more expensive because first of all you need one of the uh, research piece also it, all, it requires these eternal leaves and the enhancement shard and both of these are pretty valuable so don't waste them and don't craft books in cooking if you cannot craft uh, skill books and you cannot unlock alchemy, just save those skill points because trust me, uh, you will be losing out on a lot if you're crafting it via cooking. Uh, so yeah, as soon as you unlock this, craft all of your uh, research pieces into these books and use them on your main summoner. And yeah, so for level 6, uh, you craft gems. The reason I'm not recommending level 7 is because the red and blue gems uh, will be way more important than the green ones. For green ones, it's usually uh, those very uh, miscellaneous stats like accuracy, uh, precision, resistance, stuff like that. I personally uh, only find one of the uh, green gems valuable and that's attack speed. And attack speed is added to all of my weapons and uh, shield. I personally think if you are going for a lot of damage, attack speed will pretty much be the only uh, stat that you want from the green one. Uh, the red ones will be offensive stats, so stuff like uh, attack, damage, crit rate. Uh, blue ones will be defensive stats, so HP and defense, and green ones will be those miscellaneous stats and attack speed. I won't advise which one to craft because that will depend on the current stats of your monster. Keep in mind, gems do not affect your summoner, they affect your monsters. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, alchemy, you will go for level 6. And uh, the next important profession will be blacksmithing level 7. Uh, because at level 7, you unlock weapons that are 6 stars. And uh, these 6 star weapons will pretty much be your endgame weapons for quite a long time. Uh, a lot of 6 star weapons you can buy, but those that you can buy will usually be at 0 awakening and you do want to upgrade them to awakening level 2 eventually. And there are several different ones. Uh, each elite dungeon has uh, a 6 star weapon of uh, that type. So you can see this is a foggy prison weapon, uh, this is a white shadow castle weapon, a uh, boiling waterfall weapon, and yeah, some of these you can buy uh, 6 stars already. So, I think uh, the Boiling Waterfall ones you can buy uh, at 6 stars, yeah. Boiling Waterfall can be bought at 6 stars. And uh, the Seal ones can be bought at 6 star uh, 1 Awakening. But to max them out to 6 star 2 Awakening, you will need Blacksmithing. And this is where you get all of your weapons, basically. Because the weapons that drop from the dungeons uh, have a max power-up of five stars uh, for awakening and that is nowhere near enough to maximize their power and a lot of them have uh, either no uh, special powers or weaker powers as you can see this one does not have any powers uh, or rather this one uh, yeah increases a uh, skill of run oh, it looks like it does i'm not sure if it's stronger here yeah it is stronger so uh, the five star weapon will increase skill level of a random active skill by one and once it's 6 star, it will increase it by 2, so it's a big upgrade, it's actually like, if you're 
if you maxed the element uh, upgrades quite a bit that's like 50 or 60 skill points worth of upgrades so yeah uh, crafting these weapons are extremely important and you will want to unlock blacksmithing level 7 uh, right after you uh, reach alchemy level 6 and after that uh, the way you uh, prioritize your uh, profession unlocking is up to you uh, keep in mind that cooking uh, it may seem difficult when you click on the profession uh, promotion tab because there will be a lot of uh, foods that you need to craft and in decently huge amounts but uh, there's also a life hack for cooking and it's that you can actually level it up from 0 to level 7 without crafting a single food item and you can do that by going to the guild tab uh, accessing the guild shop and you can see there is a normal there and then there is the ingredients uh, each of these boxes uh, will contain the exact amount of items needed for the promotion so as you can see i crafted the first one but then i found out about these boxes and yeah uh, so basically this box will allow you to level up to level 2 uh, this one will allow you to level, level 3 level 4 level 5 as you can see here on the right side level 6 and level 7 and these will contain the exact amount of items these are not random you can see you will be receiving 50 of all of these purple tier uh, foods and you can simply submit all of them uh, and level up your cooking to level 7 that way because otherwise it will be by far the most annoying profession to craft and yeah, uh, that's about it for the professions, and uh, let's move on. And now uh, to address the other two gathering options, so we talked about fish, and now we'll quickly talk about both gathering and mining. Uh, these are basically uh, two different uh, sort of, what can you call professions, uh, but they uh, perform the same way, it's just that gathering is more plant stuff, and mining is more of the ore stuff. Uh, they do use different tools, so for mining you will need a pickaxes and for gathering you will need uh, gloves. You can find 5 different tiers of these uh, items, so the highest ones you can buy with in-game currency, uh, or no, actually you can buy them, but uh, the highest ones you can uh, buy cheap for uh, only using gold is the purple ones. The legendary ones can either be acquired from the guild shop, so as you can see uh, right here. However, you can only get, is it three a week? I'm not sure, yeah, three a week. Uh, they are quite expensive here, so I wouldn't personally recommend wasting too much on gold here. Uh, the second option how you can get them is from the in-game shop. And here they will cost, I believe, is it 200 crystals? Yeah, 250 for one, and you can only get one per week. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using a legendary great tools for regular mining i would reserve them for uh, either competitions or pv so uh, where legendary tools would be useful i would say is battlefield if you are heavy into mining and another option is for field events where you are competing with other players who usually also use legendary tools and trust me that does matter because legendary tools have a 20 percent uh, faster gathering rate than uh purple tools so you do get a lot of options to uh, win those events. For this one, it looks like uh, the event is fishing, but for other events, uh, let me see if I can find some uh, yeah, like fishing contest, something else, something else, please. There we go. For example, distance sent. Uh, this is where you uh, use gathering materials. Yeah, so do distance sends. Uh, there's also times where you uh, do mining events. And for those, I do recommend going with the legendary tier tools if you're competing for the top spots. If you're just there for the event, uh, purple tools will do just fine. And yeah, you uh, purchase these tools from the general merchant. I personally like to go to Rokorangma. Uh, you find the general merchant NPC and he sells, uh, I believe, either from green tier to purple tier or from white tier to purple tier. I mean, we can just quickly go to the merchant and we'll see. And I always recommend buying the purple tier because uh, they are the most efficient as far as gold goes. So not only will they have more durability, but also more speed. So yeah, you go to the tools tab. Uh, looks like for the Rokorangma, uh, it starts with the green tiers and 
you can either get green, blue, and purple tier. Uh, purple tier I recommend for gathering, and uh, green tier you will need for exploration captain. So do stock up on like a lot of these uh, for exploration stuff. I really like to buy like I think 500 as well. And for purple ones, uh, you will mostly use them for regular mining. And yeah, for the materials themselves, uh, mining will usually be used uh, mostly for uh, blacksmithing and alchemy. So in alchemy, you will need mining for stuff like these gems. Uh, these, uh, no, you will not need them for stones, it looks like. But for, uh, yeah, I think it's just gems for now. Because, uh, yeah, you get these uh, for uh, what they're called sunstones. It looks like you need mining materials only for galaxy stones. Uh, for books, uh, it looks like you might need some plants as well. Yeah, so for books, it's a bit more plant focused. But for other uh, alchemy materials, uh, it's mostly gems. And then you also need uh, mining materials for blacksmithing. So if you're planning to craft uh, high tier weapons, as you can see, uh, you will need some uh, mining materials, but you also need some gathering materials. Mostly it's mining because well, when crafting these uh, six star tools, uh, you will mostly need uh, raid recipes. But for those higher tiers, uh, you will see that uh, you will require some more mining stuff. And yeah, for gathering, uh, gathering mostly uh, allows you to craft uh, cooking stuff as well as some alchemy stuff. So for alchemy, you will see that, for example, gems, which are like the best, uh, the best resource, not the best resource, the best uh, weapon upgrade to craft because they can be reused. Uh, and you will need gathering for crafting these. And these have a very difficult recipe. So uh, normal thing requires a lot of uh, gathering stuff. As you can see, two different gathering resources. And this normal lumber will also require you uh, to get two different types of branches. And yeah, you do need those a lot. And these are pretty expensive. So you will want to craft them. As you can see, 8,000 Rahil for a single one of these is, yeah, the price is definitely not cheap. So you will need it. Uh, if you're into gathering, uh, or not gathering, but uh, cooking food for usage, uh, you will also need a lot of gathering here because uh, you'll notice that some of the recipes require you to get uh, these gathering materials, so like kiwis, for example, if you're chopping juice. Uh, what else can we find here? Uh, a lot of these are also NPC boss, but yeah, as you can see, you need lavender, you need basil leaves. I know these will require you to get uh, yeah, lavender here. Uh, even for potions, you will require uh, it looks like a lot of uh, gathering materials. So, yeah, uh, you can gather those here. In general, uh, you can find the continents for both gathering and mining separately. So if you go to the world map, uh, there are a total of five continents currently. Uh, the first continent, so you can see uh, what you can do in that continent here. So for gathering, uh, you will find gathering materials in the first and the third continent. So or for gathering, uh, it's Rootland. And uh, you can also get gathering materials in Aya. So if you enter any region, you will find that, uh, not the feature, the region specialty will be uh, all of these gathering materials. And for mining, uh, it will have three regions. So first of all, Tesca. Uh, why do I keep using that option? Uh, yeah, Tesca, you can mine in Florence and you can mine in Koran. As you can see, each continent will have different uh, materials that you can mine. And yeah, you can find them here. If you want to easily locate a certain material where to mine, uh, you can click on it and it will show you a general area right here. And you just click on anywhere in the map in that general area. And by clicking go, uh, your character will walk in that exact spot and you will be able to find all of those materials. If you notice that when you enter an area, there are no materials, uh, keep in mind that there is most likely a possibility that it's a popular channel. I know if I did I click on the diamond crops uh, because there are some red diamond crops right here. If you find that there aren't a lot of organic materials, uh, you can go to the map and click on this channel option 
usually the channel you go into automatically will be pretty populated so if you're looking to gather uh you should switch to a channel that is empty or the least empty at least so i'll go to level uh, channel 4 and we'll see how many players channel 2 has just to see that it does put you in usually the most popular lobby and yeah, if we go back you can see channel 2 has four players not the popular the most popular but it does hinder with the mining quite a bit especially if you're trying to mine in bow and as you can see here you can also uh, just quickly mine like this another strategy if you're mining uh, materials that are a bit more clear and do not respawn in for example uh, after you do uh, one lap of the whole area uh, you can mine these materials and quickly search to uh, switch to a different channel and mine the materials in that channel however keep in mind that there is a cooldown of two minutes between switching channels so if it takes a very low amount of time to mine them you will have to simply wait a bit but yeah that's the general gist of a gathering and i think i sort of covered all of it i won't recommend a specific items because a lot of items have very different uses and you will notice that uh, the items you need uh, you will simply uh, see them by entering any crafting recipe so for example uh, my plan is to craft uh, these books for example and to craft these books i only need from the craftable stuff uh, these stuff you can acquire from all the farming this you get from a dungeon so the only thing i will need to craft in bunch is this a magic craft tool i check the recipe and i see the base uh, items that i needed so for that i'm stacking up on tough leaves uh, I will need to craft this, so I'm stacking up on uh, both of these branches. And since I will need sapphire, I'm stacking uh, a lot on the sapphire. You can just go to the sapphire, see that it's actually crafted from raw sapphire. Then you go to the raw sapphire, or uh, you go to the mining tab, and you basically can just locate uh, where to mine sapphire that way. So yeah, uh, choose whichever uh, item you need the most, or whichever item you prefer to make money with, and uh, go mining for that item if you feel like uh, doing it. I personally don't like manual mining because it takes a bit of time and I'm sort of done with heavy crafting because I already unlocked level 7 in all professions. And I'm not rushing the master profession because the price is, well, um, if you check the items, a bit too insane, but yeah. In the beginning, you'll definitely need more crafting and this is the way to do it by switching, simply checking the items you need, switching the channels and buying the purple tier pickaxes because those are by far the most obtainable ones and yeah just go at it okay and now we'll move uh, to the next uh, segment of the video okay in this segment i'm mostly gonna be going over uh, the gathering aspect of the game so uh, there are three different uh, gathering skills uh, you can find all of them in the collection book so first of all is fishing uh, it's a bit different from the other two and then there is gathering and mining which are very similar it's just that uh, they differ in the materials that you can get uh, the basic thing you need to know about these is that fishing uh, can be done completely on order without any interaction from you uh, while gathering and mining are fully manual however i heard that there will be changes of uh, the developers allowing some gathering to be on order so yeah uh, first uh, i'll quickly cover the fishing aspect so uh, fishing uh, is usually done in specific spots in each of the uh, areas and you can find those areas by uh, going to the world map basically uh, and selecting a specific area uh, in the map you can see them marked with these uh, little fishing spots i suppose you can also find those fishing spots right here so in this area there are two different fishing spots uh, however finding them this way is a little random so i would recommend uh, going through the fish uh, sort of location option and in those cases where you need a specific fish uh, for example let's go to the inventory uh, there are two different ways to find the fish so uh, you can find all of the all types of fish in the book so for example if i needed uh let's say blowfish uh there is basically an explanation on how to catch it as well as where to catch it so on how to catch it there will be several different types of bait and 
This means that a bad bait uh, increases the chance to catch a certain fish by a lot. So uh, there are cases where if you use the wrong bait or if you use no bait at all, uh, the chance can drop from like 50% to like probably 0.01% like that. So uh, if you want a specific fish, you should uh, use a specific bait that is written here. So for example, to catch this blowfish, uh, as you can see, it says I need to do it in Rokurangma continent and I need to use paste as my bait. So there are different bait options and you can uh, see all of the options right here. So uh, there is the lucky paste. I also have some lower tier items. So I have some earthworms. I have some, let me see, there is life bait. I think, I'm not sure if there's a port option actually, but uh, you can check that pretty easily. And to catch this fish, so for example, let's go back to the uh, blowfish. Yeah, so if you click this button on the uh, blue location uh, icon, here you can see every single area where you can catch it. And if you click, simply click on the move, uh, it will walk you uh, all the way to that uh, required rotation. And we can wait a bit for me to get teleported there. And once you're there, uh, basically you will be brought to a dock, on a fishing dock, where you can uh, enter the fishing, uh, what do you call, enter the fishing area, and you can fish automatically as long as you have the required bait. So yeah, I'm at the fishing dock. As you can see, if I enter fishing, uh, remember that that fish needed a paste, so I would switch all of my, uh, what they're called, all of my baits to paste and that way i will be fishing that specific fish a lot if you do not have any bait uh pretty much every fishing spot has a fishing merchant where you can buy all types of bait so if you enter this you can see the tools uh, you can buy different uh rarities of paste and different rarities increase the chance of getting a higher deer fish so uh for here you can only get blue and purple ones and for lower continents, you can get uh, the green ones and I think the uh, white ones as well. So yeah, for this one, I would need the finest paste or the lucky paste. Either paste works, it's just that the highest tier uh, will cost more, but it will also have a greater chance to get good uh, fish. And yeah, you would just buy them in bulk. I usually like to buy them in like 500 or 1000 and just so they don't end up. You will use quite a bit if you're doing uh, like heavy all the fishing keep in mind that overnight you might use like several thousand of them so do stock up because if you fall short uh, you will not be catching the fish that you really want and yeah uh, that is how you locate all of the fish and the fish will mostly be used uh, for food crafting recipes so a lot of this is found here so you can see uh, there are some recipes that require quite a bit of fish, so keep that in mind if you're planning on crafting a lot of food. I personally don't craft food, so it's not really useful for me, but if you're crafting, uh, yeah, you will need quite a bit of fish. I'm not sure if you need them for all, yeah, you don't need them for all recipes, but mostly these are main dishes that require fish, so yeah. Uh, she's used for food, uh, she's not really used for any other recipes as far as I know, so don't stress those. And if you're, if you're not really using uh, food from the heal options right here, uh, fishing will not be that useful for you. 